Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the Broccoli Fanfics, back with amazing fanfiction. This is the series of, what if Deku was extremely overpowered? Now before starting, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. City A. For the residents of City A, the day starts off nice and peaceful as the children are dropped off to school while their parents all head off to work. All seems peaceful, until a massive explosion suddenly erupts in the middle of the city, destroying many buildings and killing thousands of people in a split second. People from miles away stumble or fall to the floor as the shockwave from the explosion hits everything in the surrounding area, shaking buildings and shattering windows. Once the explosion subsides, a massive crater is all that's left to what used to be a residential area in city. A standing in the center of the crater is the source of the explosion which so happens to be a mysterious being who is a large, purple hairless humanoid with two rounded antennas on its head and has a muscular body. The mysterious being looks at his surroundings in disgust before he flies up into the air in a burst of speed. Once high in the air, the mysterious being conjures up four balls of energy before launching them throughout the city, destroying even more buildings and killing all who reside in them. Hero Association HQ Control Room Inside the control room to the Hero Association headquarters, everyone is trying to contain the situation when a nearby explosion caused by the mysterious being causes the building to shake. It's closing in, shouted a console operator. Another operator turns away from his blaring console, looking for answers. Damn, so who's available? We have confirmation that Lightning Max and Smile Man are on their way exclaimed a female console operator who inwardly hopes that the two A-class heroes can defeat the mysterious being. City I, Lightning Max and Smile Man are just two of the 31 heroes who are lying in a pile of rubble, having been effortlessly defeated by the mysterious being who continues to wreak havoc across City A. Em Mommy, Dee Daddy, cried a little girl, standing on her lonesome in the middle of the ruins that once made up a part of City A so distracted in her grief of losing both her parents that the little girl doesn't notice the mysterious being walking towards her from behind. The mysterious being looks down at the crying little girl for a moment before he stretches out his rapidly bulging arm with the intent to squish the girl like a grape. With an evil chuckle, the mysterious being clenches his large hand around the little girl, but is bewildered when he doesn't hear the human girl's bones snap or see her blood squirt out. The mysterious being opens his hand and to his surprise, he doesn't see any sign of the little girl, dead or alive. Sensing something, the mysterious being glances to his right and sees the still-living little girl with another human who had somehow managed to grab the girl and take her away in the split second that it took himself to clench his fist. You're a fast one stated the mysterious being who is aware that the human moved so fast that he didn't see them. Who are you? The little girl stops her crying as she stares up at the hero with tearful eyes wide in shock and awe. I it's you. The hero smiles down at the little girl who he lowers to the floor. Don't you fear. The hero stands up to his full height of seven fur and turns to face the mysterious bee, showcasing his costume which is made up of a full-body green jumpsuit which stretches along his muscular build. A red belt, beige gloves which covers the full length of his arms, red boots, knee pads that extend all the way down his legs and a diamond-shaped respirator which hangs by his neck. For Deku is here, declared Izuku Midoriya or rather, the S-class rank 1 hero, Deku. The mysterious being simply looks down at the hero in annoyance. Deku, as in useless. You're kidding asked the mysterious being in doubt. What kind of half-ass name is that? Mine is far superior for I am Vaccine Man, declared the mysterious being who passionately slaps himself on his own chest. The earth is a single living organism. You filthy humans are nothing but a disease-causing bacteria. Eating away at her precious life force exclaimed Vaccine Man with passion. At the same time, the mysterious being begins to transform as his muscles bulge. Spikes grow all along his body and two long, but sharp tusks stretch out from his jaw. Why do they always feel the need to tell me all about their backstory? Wondered the smiling hero, Izuku Midoriya, who watches on as Vaccine Man quickly gets taller until he gets to the point where the mysterious being is now a towering monster of muscle, spikes and sharp claws. In order to wipe out humanity and the evil civilization built on her surface, the earth in her infinite wisdom has given birth to me, declared Vaccine Man who has transformed into his true form. And I shall begin my purge of humanity by killing you. Or the transformed mysterious being who lunges at Deku with the intent to rip him apart. Unfortunately for Vaccine Man, he fails to grasp the fact that he isn't facing off against any hero like the other ones he already defeated. He is facing off against the number one hero in the entire world. If not for you causing so much death and destruction yourself, you might have had a point. Faster than the mysterious being can grasp. Deku disappears in what appears to be a bolt of green light and appears beneath Vaccine Man who is yet to realize his impending doom. Izuku rears his right arm back which is crackling with green energy which resembles lightning. Due to him flooding the limb with the power of his quirk, one for all, 
Full cowl, spark punch, in less than a second. Deku uppercuts Vaccine Man with more than enough power to rip the head off of the mysterious being. To the little girl who watches the number one hero defeat the mysterious being with ease, it looks like Deku just killed the monster with an actual punch made up of green lightning. Vaccine Man's large monstrous head is launched up into the air and disappears from sight, having flown higher than the human eye can see. Deku's punch doesn't just kill the mysterious being, but the shockwave caused by the power in his one punch causes all the rising smoke and clouds in the sky to disperse in an instant, showing nothing but clear blue skies for miles around. To the little girl, her eyes sparkle in awe as she watches the number one hero, Deku, turn towards her with the same caring smile he is famous for. The sunlight that's now shining down on the hero only makes him look more angelic in her eyes. So distracted in her awe, the little girl doesn't notice or care that the headless corpse of Vaccine Man collapses to the floor. Hero Association Headquarters, Control Room. We can't thank you enough for your help, Deku. We would have been in trouble if not for you thanked bearded worker, bowing his head in respect for the number one hero. The fact that Deku went out of his way to bring the 31 injured heroes, as well as any other survivors to the hospital for treatment, even after defeating the dragon level threat only makes him more heroic in the eyes of everyone. Most of the other S-class heroes would have just left after defeating the mysterious being he thought. Even at the age of 25 and being known across the world as the strongest hero, Izuku Midoriya can still get a bit bashful when he's given praise. It was nothing. I'm just doing my duty. That's all answered Midoriya who waves off bearded worker's praise with an embarrassed chuckle. The smiling bearded worker raises his head from his bow, elated that they have someone like Deku to protect them. Still, you have our gratitude. The console operators all show their agreement by nodding or verbally showing their support. Izuku chuckles. I guess I have no other choice, but say that you are all welcome. If that's all, I best get going. The cities won't patrol themselves he said and with a wave. The hero walks out of the control room to continue his patrol across the numerous cities. Many heroes prefer to patrol in one city, but Midoriya has always felt more comfortable, knowing that he is watching over everyone in each city. It's literally impossible for anyone to patrol in more than one city, let alone all of them. But thanks to some serious training and one for all, Deku has the necessary speed and endurance to do so without any trouble. To think that this is my life now thought Izuku Midoriya who thinks back to his life ten years ago. Ten year ago, he had been nothing more than a quirkless loser who fantasized about becoming a hero. Now, he's the current number one hero in the entire world, having held the title ever since the Hero Association established itself three years ago. For the seven years before that, he had been fighting criminals and mysterious beings as a vigilante. But unlike his original home world, vigilantism wasn't a crime. In fact, it was actually encouraged by the world government. There was only so much the police and military could do against mysterious beings who could crush tanks with their bare hands and withstand gunfire so they more than welcomed Izuku who could actually defeat the monsters by himself. Izuku is more than delighted with himself for not only making his dream come true, but for also in becoming the number one hero in the entire world, just like his former teacher, All Might. I wish All Might and Mother could have seen this he thought, missing his teacher greatly, but he especially misses his mother. Ten years is a long time to spend without the woman who had raised him all his life. Izuku steps out of the Hero Asakaan headquarters and looks up at the clear blue skies. The hero recalls the moment which had forcefully taken him from his own world and dropped him off to the one he's in now. Ten years ago, USJ, Izuku Midoriya still can't believe that they all managed to survive an actual attack from villains. The trip to the USJ facility was supposed to be a training session for Class 1 so they could learn how to rescue civilians during natural disasters, such as landslides and floods. Instead, the trip turned out to be far scarier and much more dangerous than any of them could have predicted. Villains had attacked the USJ with the task of killing the symbol of peace, All Might. However, all Might never arrived to the USJ facility like he was supposed to so instead, the group of villains attacked the students with the intention to kill them. Unfortunately, there were only two pro heroes with them and while Eraserhead had done a good job defeating many of the small-time villains, he was soon defeated by the villain leader with the severed hands attached all over his body, and the giant monster with the exposed brain. Thirteen had also been defeated by the villain with the warp quirk, leaving the class of first-year students to fend for themselves. Luckily, before anyone could get severely injured or worst, All Might arrived just in time to save the day. Whatever small-time villains that remained were soon defeated by All Might, all done in a split second. The sight of the symbol of peace defeating so many villains in so little time brought hope for all the students, including Izuku. However, the creature that the villain leader named as Namu battled All Might and not only did it manage to keep up with the number one hero but it actually managed to deal some serious damage to him. 
The villain leader had explained that Nama possesses several quirks, as hard as that is to believe, including a shock absorption quirk which explains why none of All Might's punches did any damage to the monster. All seemed lost, until All Might went plus ultra and surpassed his limit. With one powerful smash, All Might launched the Nama through the ceiling of the USJ facility, ending the fight in his victory, although it did leave him weakened at the end of it. All Might's weakened state wasn't missed by the villain leader, but before he could use his deadly decay quirk on the symbol of peace, the teachers arrived, having been informed of the villain attack by Tenya. The villain leader was shot several times by Snipe, forcing him and the warp quirk villain to flee into a portal. With the Namu and the villains finally defeated, Izuku drops down to his knees and lets out a breath of air in relief. The successor of All Might never expected to be nearly killed today, but thankfully, he managed to survive for another day. F fucking brat. Izuku turns towards the source of the voice and widens his eyes when he sees that one of the unconscious villains has woken up. The shirtless villain is lithe when compared to the rest of his comrades and from the way he's supporting his right arm, he appears to be injured. Izuku can tell that even he can defeat the injured villain by himself so he stands up to do so, but is caught off guard when the villain aims his left arm in his direction. Izuku notices how the villain's hand is now glowing red, signifying the use of a quirk. Die you little shits, roared the villain before he fires a red beam of energy, but not at Midoriya. With the villain weak and injured, his aim falters so instead of firing his energy beam at Midoriya, it instead flies towards the back of an unsuspected Tsuyasui who is too busy celebrating their victory over the villains to notice the beam of energy heading towards her. Similar to the time Kachin was taken prisoner by the sludge villain, Izuku finds himself moving without thinking. All he knows is that Tsuya is in danger and he needs to save her. Midoriya, what are you doing? She asked, turning towards Izuku who she sees running towards her. She doesn't get an answer for Izuku roughly shoves her away. What are Yotsuya started before her eyes widen in horror when she sees a red energy beam hit her classmate. She realizes then that if Midoriya didn't shove her aside, she would have been hit by the villain's quirk, instead of Midoriya who cries in agony. Our ribbit. She croaked out, watching in horror as the light from the villain's quirk washes over Midoriya's body which then starts to break down into particles of light that fades away. For ten years, Izuku Midoriya has been beaten, cut and burnt by bullies and yet, all that pain combined can't compare to having every cell in his body be torn apart by the energy of the villain's quirk. Still, seeing that Tsuya is alive and well is enough to bring a small pained smile to his face, even if he is dying. He might not have become a hero like he dreamed of, but knowing that he got to save at least one person is enough for him to die in peace. And so as he accepts his faith, Izuku Midoriya closes his eyes one last time and allows himself to succumb to darkness as the last piece of his existence fades away into particles of light. XXX. It so happens that Izuku didn't die like he had first expected, but instead, he had seemingly been transported to a different world. Deku guesses that the villain doesn't even realize that his own quirk actually teleports those who he uses it on instead of disintegrating his victims like everyone would expect. With no way to return to his own world, Izuku had to make do with the world he found himself in which is so similar to his own and yet, so different. Instead of countries, the earth he found himself in is made up of one large land mass which is filled with gigantic cities that are named after the alphabet. One of the biggest and most shocking differences to this world when compared to his own is that there is no such thing as quirks in the world, a fact that shocked the once quirkless boy. In other words, the world's population is made up of 100% quirkless people, unlike the 20% in his own world, making it completely normal to have no unique powers. What further baffled Izuku is that while nobody may possess a quirk, he has met many individuals who are as powerful, if not more so than many pro heroes in his own world and all the while, having no quirk of their own. It's actually quite humbling for Izuku who once believed that he could not become a hero without having a quirk of his own. To meet so many people without quirks and yet, have more than enough power to become heroes themselves, it's a humbling revelation. While there are large differences between the two Earths, there are still some similarities, such as criminals who can be found in every city. However, they are seen as only nuisances when compared to the mysterious beings who can cause city-wide havoc within moments. Admittedly, the first time Izuku saw a mysterious being, he had thought that it was simply a person with a mutant quirk. Mysterious beings can take all sorts of shapes and sizes, but Izuku has seen just as many weird features from people with quirks. Izuku's former classmate, Mizo Shoji being a prime example. Izuku's first few years in the new world was spent by moving from city to city, learning how to better control his quirk, one for all. Since he doesn't have Recovery Girl to heal his injuries anymore and had no ideal identification, he had to resort to using one for all as little as possible until he could better control the quirk's overwhelming power without the cost of breaking any of his limbs. Luckily, Izuku eventually created Full Cow, a technique that allows him to spread the power of one for all all across his entire body, instead of focusing it on one point like he usually did. 
At first, he couldn't implement 100% of one for all's power into full cow so he had to start low at 5%. After two years of training and fighting mysterious beings as a vigilante, he had eventually unlocked 100% of one for all to use as much as he wants. For the first seven years, Midoriya spent his time fighting criminals and mysterious beings as a vigilante, due to the police and military not being capable of fighting against the mysterious being threat, surprisingly. He wasn't named a criminal for his role as a vigilante and was actually encouraged by the government to continue his fight against mysterious beings. It was a strange, but a welcoming experience for Midoriya who had spent most of his life looked down on and berated by others. However, everything changed three years ago when Midoriya saved the grandson of the multimillionaire, Agoni, from a mysterious being named Krablante. Agoni was so moved by the act that he decided to create the Hero Association and the National Superhero Registry therefore creating an organization to directly defend humanity against the threat of mysterious beings. Obviously, Izuku joined the Hero Association under the hero name, Deku, and in his three years as an official hero, he has defeated many criminals and mysterious beings of all shapes and sizes. In time, he rose through the ranks until he eventually became the number one hero in the world. The official ceremony brought tears of joy to the once quirkless teen. But his only regret was that All Might and his mother couldn't see the hero he has become. Shaking himself out his thoughts before they get too depressing, Deku bends his knees and with a mighty leap, he jumps into the air and flies over the skyscrapers of City A. Another surprising fact that Izuku learned about One for All is that the quirk carries echoes of consciousness from the previous users. The quirk factors of the previous users have also merged with the core of One for All, providing Izuku with the quirks of his predecessors, such as Black Whip from the fifth user of One for All, Degoro Banjo. Other than Black Whip, Izuku has obtained six other quirks, including Float, the quirk of All Might's mentor, Nana Shimura. That is why Izuku isn't falling back down after jumping across the city and is instead flying across the sky like a green blur. Izuku stops in midair when an explosion occurs miles away in the direction of City D, and from the explosion stands one of the largest mysterious beings Deku has ever seen. The mysterious being resembles a man without skin and has bone-like armor. Since it has no skin, Izuku can see the giant's muscles and tendons which are visible for everyone to see. The mysterious being is also an absolute giant who is so tall that every steps it takes crushes skyscrapers like as if they're ants. Without so much as a warning, lightning covers Deku's form before he disappears in a burst of speed. Standing on the shoulder of his transformed brother, Fukegao laughs as he watches Marugori stomp on hundreds of people who are unlucky enough to be in the giant's path. Yes, this is incredible little brother. I never thought it would work so well laughed the man scientist. After years of working on his biceps brachii king steroid, he had given the drug to his little brother, Marugori who craved power so he can be the strongest man in the world. The result is Marugori turning into a mutated giant who is taller than any building and stronger than any hero. With my brains and your brawn, by combining the greatest of minds and the strongest of bodies this world has to offer, the two of us will conquer the earth and rule together as kings. We're unstoppable, declared the scientist with a mad laugh. Marugori reels his large right arm back so to blow away the nearby city, but the giant is cut off when a blur of green collides with his elbow. The impact shatters the giant's elbow, causing it to bend in an unnatural way. Fukegao grabs onto Marugori's shoulder when his brother roars and shakes in pain. Marugori, what happened? So are you the one who started all this? Fukegao turns towards the voice and is shocked to see a man floating in the air, but is then horrified when he recognizes the man to be the unstoppable hero, Deku. Marugori, it's Deku. Quick, kill him before he can stop us. While still in pain from having his right arm broken, Marugori complies with his older brother's orders. The giant lifts his left arm and throws a punch that moves far faster than a being of Marugori's size should be capable. Instead of moving away to dodge the incoming punch, Deku holds his ground and catches the gigantic fist with his own. That is enough to completely overwhelm the common sense of the two brothers. How about we all go for a little flight? Said Deku who suddenly bolts upwards while still holding onto the giant's fist. The two brothers are then forced into the air as the number one hero drags them both upwards. Be brother, do something. Yelled a terrified Fukegao who is barely holding onto the shoulder of his younger brother. I am trying. Yelled Marugori who can't pull his hand back from the hero. The hero's pull is too strong and it isn't like it can use its other arm since that's broken. Normally, Deku would smash the mysterious being into pieces and be on his way. But seeing as how the mysterious being is nearly 900 feet tall, he knows that if he kills the giant, the massive corpse will collapse onto a city, killing anyone who wasn't fast enough to evacuate. So, since he can't kill the giant on Earth, there is only one other place where he can kill it. Full cow, seismic toss. After flying upwards for nearly 50 kilometers, Deku tosses the giant over his shoulder and straight out of the stratosphere. 
The giant's screams echo for a few seconds before they fade, either because the giant has been flown too far out into the void of space or because it has already died from lack of oxygen. The same can't be said for the scientist who had fainted from a lack of oxygen and is currently falling straight back down to Earth. He would have become a splatter across the ground, if not for Deku flying down and catching him. With the unconscious scientist on hand, Deku looks back up at the sky to make sure that the giant isn't going to be making a return before he flies down towards the closest Hero Association branch building, City Z Izuku's apartment. Phew, another busy day side Deku once he enters his apartment. As the number one hero, Izuku has acquired more than a few fans over the years and while grateful, some of them can act a bit extreme at times. Many heroes have reported times when excited fans broke into their homes, which is why most heroes keep their home addresses a secret nowadays. For that same reason, Izuku has his apartment in City Z which is the less populous of all the cities, due to the high percentage of monster appearances in the city, specifically in the ghost town. The apartment also happens to be on the outskirts of the ghost town so he doesn't have to go far when he hears word of a monster sighting in the area. Midoriya's apartment is quite large for a person who lives alone as it includes a large sitting room, two bedrooms, two bathrooms and a large kitchen that also makes up as a dining room. Since he lives on his own, Izuku is caught off guard when he smells something cooking in his apartment, following the scent to the kitchen, all the while, keeping himself prepared for a possible fight. Izuku slowly opens the door to the kitchen and sees the culprit to the delicious smell of food. Welcome home. Izuku greeted Fubuki who smiles at Midoriya while a stew boils in a pot on Izuku's stove. I cooked us dinner. Izuku calms himself down when he sees that it's only Fubuki. He looks around his large kitchen and rolls his eyes at the B-class rank 1 hero. Last I checked, this is my apartment so forgive me for wondering why people are in it. Secondly, don't say you're cooking dinner when you obviously aren't exclaimed Deku while pointing an accusing finger at Fubuki who is sitting at the dining table while her subordinates, eyelashes, Lily and Mountain Ape cook up the stew. I told you he'd notice said a panicked eyelashes to Fubuki who ignores him. The B-class rank 2 hero is currently setting up the table for both Izuku and Fubuki. He's going to kill us muttered a sweating Mountain Ape who is stirring the pot of stew. Mountain Ape is confident in his own skills, as well as the skills of his fellow B-class heroes, but they just broke into the apartment of Deku himself. A man who can shatter mountains, split the seas and clear the skies, all with a single punch. The entirety of the Blizzard group could attack Deku at the exact same time and still have no hope in defeating the man who stands at the pinnacle of the Hero Association. Unlike Eyelashes and Mountain Ape, Lily doesn't show fear over breaking into the home of the S-Class Rank 1 hero as she quickly jumps in front of Deku with stars in her eyes and a notebook in her hands. Mr. Deku, could I please have the honor of getting your autograph? She asked, practically pleading. As much as he should be angry at Lily for breaking into his apartment, he can't when the young girl looks up at him with so much hope and excitement in her eyes. Not someone to let a fan down. Izuku takes the offered notebook and pen from the young woman before signing his name on one of the pages. Here you go he said, offering the notebook back with a smile. A blushing Lily takes her notebook back and looks down at it like as if it's a priceless artifact. T thank you so much, sir. She thanked, bowing low. Izuku can't help but chuckle over the girl's obvious excitement. She reminds me of myself when I first met Almighty Thought and Amusement, remembering how he had the exact same look on Lily's face all those years ago when All Might first signed his book. Ten years ago, he was a naive quirkless boy who idolized heroes to an unhealthy degree. Now, he's the number one hero who still idolizes heroes to an unhealthy degree. Fubuki uses her psychic power to pull back the chair across from her. Come and have a seat. Dinner should be ready soon. Having grown used to Fubuki talking to him like as if he's her underling, he turns and makes his way towards his bedroom. Let me change out of my costume at least. Do you want any help? Asked Fubuki with a coy smile. She giggles when Izuku slams his bedroom door closed. Ah, Izuku is shy. Why do you antagonize him so? Asked Eyelashes who is on the verge of crying. He knows that Fubuki has a crush on Deku, just like any other straight woman, but why does she always feel the need to get under his skin? Fubuki turns to her subordinate with the same coy smile. I don't know what you mean. Mountain Ape places two plates full of the stew onto the table before he and his partners line up beside one another to bow. If that will be all, ma'am, we will make our leave. Fubuki nods in agreement and waves them off. You are dismissed for the day. That's all she had to say before the three subordinates run out of Deku's apartment faster than Fubuki has ever seen them move before. The leader of the Blizzard group soon turns her attention to Izuku who walks back into the kitchen while wearing a sleeveless green shirt and black shorts. Not that Fubuki is complaining as the shirt does nothing to hide his powerful muscles, nor does the shorts which show off a lot of leg to the B-class rank 1 hero. Stu smells good complimented Izuku who takes the seat across from Fubuki before he digs in. I hope you enjoy. I made it with all my heart stated Fubuki with a gentle smile. Make sure to tell Mountain Ape that I appreciate the cooking answered Izuku. 
although Fubuki either doesn't hear him or she simply ignores him. So I see you broke into my apartment again. Breaking in sounds like such a dirty word answered Fubuki, waving off his question. Breaking in sounds like an accurate description to what you did stated Izuku, pointing his fork in an accusing manner at Hell's Blizzard. You can't just enter someone's home without permission. Just after Izuku says that, a green glow covers his kitchen window before it telekinetically opens and a small, lithe figure lets herself into the apartment. Izuku, I came to see if you wanted to have Dines class rank 2 hero. Tatsumaki and older sister to Fubuki stops when she notices that Deku and her sister are having dinner together in his apartment. What is this? She demanded, folding her arms together while glaring down at the two. Izuku notices a few objects in his kitchen begin to levitate. Thanks to Tatsumaki's rising telekinetic power which is fluctuating in response to her rising anger. Katsu, calm down. We're just having dinner. And if dinner is as good as this, I can't wait for dessert teased Fubuki, uncaring to the rising pressure of her older sister's power. She knows that Tatsumaki wouldn't actually hurt her so she's in no danger of suffering Tatsumaki's rage. The same can't be said for the apartment complex which begins to shake from Tatsumaki's power. Not wanting to have his apartment collapse on top of him, Izuku slams his fist down on his dining table. Enough. Izuku's authoritative shout snaps Tatsumaki out of her anger where she then looked down at the floor in embarrassment, looking more like a child who has been scolded. Tatsu, I've told you this before a thousand times. You can't let yourself lose control over your powers when you get angry. Last thing we want is for a whole city to collapse. Just because you got emotional said Izuku, hating how he has to scold Tatsumaki. But if he doesn't then nobody else will. The only person Tatsumaki allows to talk back to her is Deku himself. Anyone else would find themselves a hundred feet underground and that's if she's feeling merciful. I'm sorry muttered Tatsumaki, refusing to look at Izuku's disappointed eyes. Good, now come down and take a seat while I prepare you some stew smiled Izuku who stands up to get a plate of stew for his fellow class S hero. I made it myself stated Fubuki with a smug grin while a glaring Tatsumaki lowers herself down to the chair beside Izuku's. She had her subordinates make it revealed Izuku, causing Fubuki to lose her smug grin and for Tatsumaki to start chuckling. And please stop teasing your sister, Fubuki. Izuku places the stew in front of Tatsumaki, either not noticing or ignoring the electricity that seems to spark between the two glaring sisters. Sitting back down to continue his meal, Izuku recalls how he was introduced to the psychic sisters. Izuku had actually saved Tatsumaki ten years ago, just a few weeks after being teleported to the world. Tatsumaki, who was 18 years old at the time, had been kept captive and experimented on by scientists who were interested in studying her asper abilities. At a certain point in time, a monster outbreak within the facility had left Tatsumaki on her own to fend off the monster after it killed all the scientists. At the time, she was afraid to use her powers and would have likely died, if not for Izuku who ended up killing the monster. It was not only a lesson for Tatsumaki who realized that she needs to overcome her fear over using her powers, but Izuku also came to the conclusion that mysterious beings need to be permanently put down not beaten like what the heroes of his own world do to villains. Mysterious beings are not human and they do not show mercy to others so they need to be killed, especially since none of the cities have a prison that can actually hold powerful mysterious beings. A few years later, Izuku was then introduced to Tatsumaki's younger sister, Fubuki who is also an Asper, just not as powerful as her older sister. The two were quick to become friends. But Izuku had noticed a tension between the sisters, most notably Tatsumaki's overprotectiveness over Fubuki. After a talk between the psychic sisters, he had managed to convince Tatsumaki to give Fubuki some space to grow as her own person. While it did improve the relationship between the sisters, they still refused to see eye to eye about how to view true strength. Tatsumaki believes that true power comes from fighting alone while Fubuki believes that strength comes from fighting in a group. In Izuku's own opinion, he believes them both to be right. Tatsumaki is right that when fighting powerful opponents, one should be able to rely on themselves. But Fubuki is also right in that a group offers better chances in victory as well as offer the important skill of teamwork. Although, Izuku never does get a chance to voice his own opinion, since he can never get his voice heard while the two are arguing about whose ideology is correct. I saw you on the news again today. You defeated a dragon-class monster in City, and then a giant in City D said Fubuki, wanting to make conversation. Most impressive. Tatsumaki folds her arms across her chest and nods. That's to be expected from the number one hero. I bet he didn't break a sweat she stated, proudly. Izuku quirks a brow at the S-class rank 2 hero and wonders why it sounds like she's taking credit for his victory. It's our jobs to protect humanity from the threat of monsters. I couldn't stand by as they caused chaos and mayhem. Simple as that. Simple my ass thought Fubuki with a twitching brow. 
She could have her entire Blizzard group face off against either one of those two monsters and they'd stand no chance, even with her help. The same can't be said for her sister who could have killed the two monsters as easily as Deku did, if not more so. We should go out on a job together someday. Why you know, if you want. Not like I care if we did or anything said Tatsumaki who quickly reverts to her tsunder mode, much to Fubuki's ire. Her older sister's attraction to Deku is notable to anyone with eyes and for Fubuki who hopes to one day confess her own feelings to him, she doesn't like having to compete against her sister, but she will do so and win, whenever she gathers up the courage to confess her feelings to him anyway. For now, she will bide her time and wait for the right moment to strike. City I Hero Academy Within the confines of City Eye, there's an institute that is renowned for being the only place in the world where young men and women can go to train and study on how to be the next generation of heroes. Every year, hundreds to thousands of young teens apply to the academy so they can spend the next three years of their lives learning how to become the best heroes they can be. Since the academy was only constructed three years ago, the current third-year students will be the very first class to graduate from the academy. The academy is famously known as Hero Academy, built and funded by the Hero Association. Hero Academy's main purpose is to train and guide students into becoming the next generation of heroes to defend humanity from both criminals and mysterious beings. While anyone can still become a hero by passing the Hero Certification Exam, Hero Academy offers its students the chance to become strong before they enter the dangerous world of heroes. Another upside to joining Hero Academy is that once the students graduate after their three years of training and study, they automatically earn their C-Class Hero ranking so they don't need to pass the Hero Certification Exam. Therefore, it only makes sense that every teacher in Hero Academy is an official hero, even for non-heroic subjects like math and geography. Even the principal of Hero Academy is an official hero, although he isn't just any hero. The principal of Hero Academy so happens to be the current S-Class Rank 1 hero, Izuku Midoriya or Deku as he's more widely known. Right now, Izuku Midoriya can be found sitting in his office which is both large and simple in taste. Izuku is sitting on a comfy office chair from behind his desk, signing documents that help keep the school running without any trouble. On the opposite side of his desk, there are two comfy green chairs for anyone to sit on who so happens to visit his office, either they be professors or students. To the left of Izuku's desk is a bookshelf filled with books that range in everything from science textbooks to hero biography. To the right of Izuku's desk are three chairs surrounding a coffee table and overhead them is a flat-screen television which he has on, but with the volume low so to not distract him from signing his paperwork. Izuku nearly groans in frustration while signing another document. For the last ten years, he has defeated various criminal organizations and mysterious beings that could destroy whole cities and yet for some reason, signing form after form is enough to tire out even his near-infinite stamina and patience. Whose stupid idea was it to make the Hero Academy? groaned Izuku, ignoring the several voices in the back of his head that reminds him that it was actually his idea. The idea had actually came to him just a few months after the Hero Association was formed. While the world was lucky to have men and women of various strength and skill join up with the Hero Association when it first formed, there was only so much of them to patrol every city. Even then, most of the heroes weren't capable of dealing with dragon-level threats like Vaccine Man or Mosquito Girl. At the moment, only the S-Class heroes can actually handle the dragon-level threats alone and right now, there are only 16 of them. That's why Izuku proposed the Hero Academy plan to the Hero Association. Just like with Yue, Hero Academy is to train their students to not only become heroes, but to be the best heroes that they can possibly be. While the training can be grueling and not everyone can keep up, those who do have shown that they will be great heroes when they graduate and get some experience on the field. From what Izuku can tell, the current third years who are the first students to enter Hero Academy have grown to the point where they can defeat most C-class heroes and even a few low-rank B-class. Since he's the one who gave the idea, the Hero Association nominated Deku to become the principal to the school. The number one hero accepted with the only exception being that he runs the school how he sees fit. The last thing he wants is for the Hero Association to poke their noses where they don't belong. Admittedly, Izuku did use some of his knowledge and experience from attending UA to help create the school. But he also implemented his own important features that Yue was obviously missing. One such feature is that Hero Academy accepts any number of students, as long as they manage to pass the entrance exam. That means that unlike Yue who only accept 40 students and splits them into two classes, Hero Academy accepts dozens and splits them into several different classes. While Izuku has no regrets in making the Hero Academy, the stack of paperwork that he needs to finish by the end of each day is starting to make Izuku regret accepting the position as principal. I see there is no time to rest when you're the number one hero said a kindly voice from the doorway. Izuku looks up from his desk and smiles when he sees Bang standing by the door. Silver Fang, it's good to see you. How are your classes going? 
he asked, waving a hand towards a seat in front of his desk. Accepting the offer, the S-Class Rank 3 hero takes a seat across from Izuku. Those youngsters have too much energy for an old man like me. They're not perfect, but they're getting there. I'd say any of them could beat Chiranko at this point chuckled Silver Fang. The martial arts master happens to be a teacher for Hero Academy who teaches martial arts to the first, second and third years. Accepting the teaching role has also helped Bang find students other than Chiranko to join his dojo as several students have joined up for further training, filling the dojo again ever since the incident. Silver Fang isn't the only S-Class hero who works at Hero Academy as the S-Class Rank 11 hero. Super Alloy Darkshine teaches physical education to the students whenever he isn't busy with his hero work. That's good to hear. Hopefully the next generation will be prepared for when we leave the world to them sighed Izuku, feeling far too old for someone who's only 25. Bang smiles, encouragingly. They'll be ready. The third years I believe are more than ready to join C-Class and even B-Class once they gain some experience. Izuku smiles, but stops when he sees the news channel on his television, turning up the volume with the remote. Izuku listens as the newscaster speaks. We interrupt this program with a breaking news bulletin. A large swarm of mosquitoes has been sighted in City Z. Mummified remains of attacked farm animals have also been found. If you encounter a large swarm of mosquitoes, it is strongly suggested that you flee immediately. City Z again. That city can't seem to take a break said Silver Fang who turns back to see Deku getting up from his desk. You're going to check it out. It's obviously the work of a mysterious being. You think a regular swarm of mosquitoes could do that? Asked the number one hero while pointing to his television which shows an image of dead cows which were attacked by the swarm of mosquitoes. The mosquitoes sucked out every last drop of blood from the farm animals, leaving them as dried up husks made up of only skin and bone. Deku turns and opens the window behind his desk before stepping out, standing in midair thanks to his quirk, float. I need to handle this swarm before it can do any more damage. And it's a good enough excuse for you to ignore your paperwork deadpan silver fang who glances at the stack of paperwork on Deku's desk. Sorry, can't hear you. Off to save the day, shouted Deku who immediately takes flight up into the air so to avoid Silver Fang's accusing glare. Said Z. With the swarm of mosquitoes attacking anyone and anything with blood, a warning has been sent out by the Hero Association, requesting all the residents of City Z to evacuate the city at once. Most residents have already evacuated to safety, although some have decided to use the crisis to benefit themselves by looting the now empty city. Haha. <laughs> Thanks to that warning, they're all empty laughed a thief who walks out of a house he just robbed. Like someone's going to die from a mosquito bite he smirked to himself before turning to his large bag of loot. What's losing a little blood if I can walk away with all of this? A sudden gust of wind surprises the thief as his hat is blown right off his head and flies high into the air. Was that the wind? Wondered the confused thief while looking back to see his hat being blown high into the air. With his back turned, the thief doesn't see the swarm of mosquitoes flying towards him until they're already upon him. W what the, cried the thief as thousands of mosquitoes swarm him. The thief panics and tries to bat away the mosquitoes with his crowbar, but it does nothing as the mosquitoes quickly begin sucking the blood out of him. The thief can only cry out in the middle of the deserted city while thousands of mosquitoes suck up his precious blood. Within seconds, the blood-filled mosquitoes fly off, leaving the now-dead thief as a dried-up corpse. The swarm flies back to their queen and transfers the blood they sucked up into her. The queen of the mosquitoes, mosquito girl, sighs in disappointment. Come on, that wasn't nearly enough blood to satisfy my needs she moaned before addressing her mosquito servants. Now go get some more for me. Target has been acquired. Without warning, a stream of flames fires up at the flying mosquito girl who bats it aside and studies the one responsible for the attack. The one responsible is the cyborg, Genos who is a handsome young man with spiky blonde hair and pierced ears. The cyborg's most noticeable features are his eyes which have black sclears and yellow irises. I see. You make the mosquitoes suck the blood and then take it all for yourself. You must be controlling each one by using some sort of signal. That would explain the mysterious behavior. So if I were to get rid of you, their leader, would the swarm disperse as well? Wondered Genos while glancing at the billions of mosquitoes who are all swarming behind the mysterious being. Mosquito girl smirks down at Genos. Our next meal is here. Go drain that full dry said the mysterious being who orders her mosquitoes to attack. Millions of mosquitoes quickly converge on the cyborg who remains calm. Despite the circumstance, incinerate. To Mosquito Girl's surprise, the millions of mosquitoes surrounding the cyborg suddenly combust into flames, courtesy of Genos who now has his right arm raised, showing that he used the incineration cannon in his palm to kill the swarm of mosquitoes. I will eliminate you. Stay right where you are. While surprised by the fact her mosquitoes didn't kill the man, Mosquito Girl's arrogance quickly returns. You believe you can eliminate me? Giggled the monster before her expression becomes manic. Then go on and try. 
Genos responds by running up the wall of a nearby building and jumps at Mosquito Girl who dodges the cyborg's thrown punch and hits him with her claw, failing to do any vital damage to his metal body. The mysterious being swings her other claw, but Genos blocks the attack with his right arm. The cyborg and monster try to overpower the other but they remain at a stalemate. Seeing as he isn't making any progress, Genos detonates an explosion of heat from a port on his arm which propels him away from the mysterious being. The cyborg backflips in midair and once he lands on the side of a building, he jumps off towards Mosquito Girl and throws a punch. Instead of dodging like last time, Mosquito Girl throws her own punch which nullifies Genos's own attack. The mysterious being then uses her free arm to smack the cyborg down to the ground. But Genos uses his thrusters to land safely on the floor. Once he safely lands, he aims his right incineration cannon at Mosquito Girl. Incinerate said the cyborg before firing a blast of flames at the monster. The stream of flames looks like it's gonna hit the monster, but Mosquito Girl dodges it in a burst of speed. While surprised, Genos continues firing blast after blast of fire at the monster who keeps dodging while getting ever so closer to the cyborg. Like a blur, Mosquito Girl flies past the cyborg and rips off Genos's right arm by piercing it with her enlarged horn. The monster looks back at the cyborg with a smug expression on her face. Maybe a leg next time giggled Mosquito Girl who then realizes that something feels off about herself. What the? What happened to my legs? Wondered the mysterious being who sees that she's now missing both of her legs. Genos throws away Mosquito Girl's legs, having ripped them off of the monster at the same time she took his arm. Realizing that the cyborg is tougher than she thought, Mosquito Girl attempts to flee. Genos aims his remaining incineration cannon at the fleeing monster and fires a concentrated ball of fire, only for a wall of mosquitoes to form up and block the attack at the cost of their own lives. He won't escape declared Genos who gives chase after the monster. What the hell is that guy? He'll get me if I don't come up with something said Mosquito Girl before licking her lips. The townspeople may be hiding, but there are plenty of animals around to feed on said the mysterious being. Having sent out more of her mosquitoes to feed on the animals in the surrounding forests, the monster flies high into the air while ordering her blood-filled mosquitoes to return to her. That's it. Come here little ones. Empty all of the delicious juices you carry into me, exclaimed Mosquito Girl before being surrounded in a massive dome made up of trillions of her mosquitoes that all transfer the blood they gathered into her. So many. If she has been collecting blood from the whole town, as well as the surrounding area, then it may be more than a simple food source for her thought Genos as he powers up his incinerator cannon. I shall put an end to this as soon as I can. Putting all the power he can muster into his incinerator cannon, the cyborg fires a powerful concentrated blast of fire at the massive swarm of mosquitoes, causing them all to combust in a massive explosion that brightens the sky for miles around. Once the explosion dies down, Genos tries to scan for the monster in case it managed to survive his attack. Looking for me, asked a malicious voice from behind the cyborg. Surprised that the monster managed to get behind him without his sensors picking up her signature, Genos jumps away to a safe distance and eyes the mosquito girl who has most definitely changed. Her once black and white skin color has changed into blood red, likely due to the huge amount of blood she absorbed from her mosquitoes. Her white hair has also turned pinkish red in color and is flowing in the wind. She even has a new pair of legs, having regenerated them while going through her transformation. You idiot, I no longer need my tiny little helpers. I mean, stated the transformed mosquito girl, dismissing the loss of her mosquitoes. The monster turns to the building on her right and with a single swing of her claw, she destroys it, as well as the buildings behind it. Just look at how strong I've become. She laughed before focusing her attention back on the shocked cyborg. Faster than Genos can react, Mosquito Girl appears behind him in a burst of speed and cleaves through his left side with a casual swing of her claw. Gritting his teeth, Genos turns to throw a punch at the monster, but Mosquito Girl bats him up into the air with no effort. Laughing, Mosquito Girl flies up after him and as Genos's body hovers in the air, the monster blurs across the air, hitting the cyborg every time she gets near him. Can't your macho punches kill a little mosquito? Mocked Mosquito Girl who laughs while cutting up the cyborg's body even more. What a weakling she scoffed while stopping her attacks so to lazily hover in the air. With Mosquito Girl no longer hitting him about in the air, gravity regains control and Genos's body begins to drop back down. I get it now. The more blood she is able to consume, the more powerful she becomes thought Genos in realization. Not that it matters. His mechanical body is severely damaged and even if he was in pristine condition and with both arms, he would still lose to the transformed monster. She's far too fast and powerful for him to beat. Mosquito Girl hums to herself before she targets Genos's falling body. I think I'll have your head next, shouted the mysterious being in sadistic glee as she rears her right arm back to cleave off Genos's head. I let my guard down. I have no chance at winning thought Genos as he initiates his self-destruct sequence so he can at least take the monster out with him. All I can do is self-destruct. 
Forgive me, doctor. Just as Mosquito Girl is about to kill Genos, a blow to her side has the monster shriek in pain while she's being launched into a nearby building that collapses down on top of her, burying her in a pile of rubble. Genos is quick to stop his self-destruct sequence and gasps at seeing the powerful monster knocked aside so easily. Are you alright? The injured, but still alive cyborg turns to look at his savior with his one good eye. The man who saved him is obviously a hero as he adorns a mostly green costume which is tight on his muscles, showcasing the raw power that hides within them. Genos then sees that it isn't just the costume that's green, but the hero's eyes and hair are also a brilliant shade of green, practically emerald. For some reason, the man's most striking feature is his wide smile. W who are you? Deku actually blinks, failing to hide his surprise over the cyborg's question. You don't know me? He asked, not insulted like how some prouder heroes would be. Izuku became a hero to save lives, not for the popularity, but as the number one hero. Practically everyone knows about him, either from his daily heroics or from seeing one of the TV commercials he starred in. All of a sudden, the pile of rubble that buried Mosquito Girl explodes outwards, revealing the monster herself who flies in the air so she can glare down at the man who punched her into the building. A large and noticeable bruise can be seen from the side that Deku had punched. You bastard. Just for that, I'm going to gut you slowly and feed you your own entrails. She threatened, not that it affects Deku. You're alive. I'm surprised remarked Izuku, having only hit the mysterious being with around 2% of one for all's power. From looking at Mosquito Girl's fragile body, he didn't expect her to survive his surprise attack, but she's tougher than she looks. He'll just have to hit her a little harder. Angry over both the throbbing pain in her side and the annoying hero who doesn't appear to see her as a threat, Mosquito Girl scoffs before moving so fast that it appears like she just teleported in front of Deku. Die, she roared, swinging her claws to gut the hero wide open. Full cow, spark punch. Mosquito Girl may have gotten a lot faster after transforming, but even she couldn't comprehend the speed of Deku's attack. One moment, she's about to rip apart the hero who got a lucky hit on her and the next, she's a bloody smear along the destroyed road. Even as the shockwave of the hero's punch blows Genos's mangled body back several feet, he can't help but be amazed by the overwhelming power the man possesses. After transforming, the mysterious being toyed with Genos in their fight and would have killed him if not for the hero saving him. The same hero who just splattered the monster along the road as if she was just a tiny mosquito, not a demon or even dragon-level threat. Once the mysterious being has been dealt with, Deku walks back over to the injured cyborg. Hey, do you need any help? You're kind of all broken up Deku said, somewhat awkwardly. The number one hero is afraid to pick the injured cyborg up, in fear that he might just cause even more damage. Please, tell me your name pleaded the injured cyborg, ignoring Izuku's worry over his condition. Deku looks down at the cyborg, wondering if his injuries affected his mind. I'm Deku, please, take me as your disciple. Dot 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 what? City Z Deku's apartment. After watching Genos be taken away by the collector drones, Izuku didn't expect to see the cyborg ever again. So imagine his surprise that in the next morning, Genos appears by his front doorstep, completely repaired and ready to learn. Instead, Izuku offers the cyborg a cup of tea. So you want to be my disciple? He asked for confirmation while he takes a seat on his couch. Instead of taking a seat on one of Izuku's couch chairs, Genos sits on the floor on his knees. Yes sir. And why is it that you want to be my disciple? Not to be insulting. But I can't exactly help in training you, since your body is mostly mechanical stated Izuku like as if it should be obvious. Gino stares at Izuku, managing to look confused while still keeping a serious expression on his face. I don't understand. Do you not have parts installed in your body, sensei? He already sees me as his sensei thought Izuku in bewilderment. I don't use any. You defeated that monster yesterday. With only physical power. Asked Gino's in disbelief. Obviously, Izuku isn't going to explain one for all to someone he has only met. Not even Tatsumaki or Fubuki know about the truth of one for all, although they know his strength isn't normal by any means. I guess you could say that. Incredible. To be as strong as you. That is my dream said Genos who begins explaining his life story to the number one hero. Usually, Izuku is a patient man. One must be patient when dealing with one of Tatsumaki's and Fubuki's shouting matches that occur once a week. But Genos' long and detailed life story has strained his patience to its limit. When Genos finally finishes explaining his life story, it takes all of Izuku's willpower to not sigh in relief. In the end, Izuku can sympathize with Genos. The cyborg is simply looking to avenge his family by destroying the crazed cyborg that killed them and throughout his search, he fights criminals and monsters that he comes across which puts him in Izuku's good books. Still, Izuku has never taken an actual student before. He has sometimes filled in for teachers at the Hero Academy when they turn up sick or injured from fighting monsters. But taking someone as an official student is different than teaching young teens in a classroom. He isn't even sure what he could teach the cyborg, since he obviously doesn't need any muscle training. 
Tell me, Genos, have you applied to the hero registry? Izuku asked, having come up with an idea. Genos shakes his head. Not yet. But I have been planning to do so for when the next time the exam opens. Good. I have heard that the next exam will be taking place in two weeks from now so I will give you a challenge. If you pass the hero certification exam with flying colors, then I will agree to take you on as my student stated Izuku, much to Genos's pleasure. I won't let you down, sir, exclaimed Genos which has Izuku's smile, finding the cyborg's determination to be inspiring. Suddenly, both hero and cyborg turns towards the far wall to Izuku's living room. Sensei, I sense targets approaching fast stated Genos who crouches down so he can spring into action at any moment. I sense them too remarked Izuku who pushes himself off his couch, just as the far wall smashes open. From the wreckage stands a mysterious being that looks like a mutated praying mantis, although the top of the monster's head is transparent, revealing its brain. Greetings, I am Kamakiri from the House of Evolution greeted the monster before he focuses his attention on Deku. I kindly ask that you come with me, Deku. If you refuse, I'll have no choice but to cut off your legs and carry you back to our headquarters. The monster rubs his side like four legs together while licking his lips, seemingly wishing for Deku to refuse so he can get violent. Normally, Izuku would just pulverize the mysterious being who just smashed into his apartment, but hearing that the monster is from the House of Evolution actually has him curious. House of Evolution, as in the same House of Evolution that Zombamin is from, he wondered, knowing of the S-Class Rank 8 hero's home origin. From what he recalls, Zombamin doesn't have a good relationship with the House of Evolution and Izuku is starting to see why. Izuku isn't ignorant to his surroundings as he can sense other monsters nearby, five more when not including Kamakuri. An idea suddenly springs to mind. Genos, you said that you wanted to be my student? Well I see an opportunity for you to show me what you can do. I want to see what makes you worthy to becoming my student. Kamakuri begins sweating when Genos raises his right arm which is now glowing with power. Exterminate. Outside the apartment on the street, Frogman and Sludris jumps in fright when a beam of fire erupts from the hole that their advanced agent, Kamakuri made in the apartment. I it seems that Kamakuri has been defeated. I can no longer sense him with my telepathy stated Sludris who lost contact with his comrade when the beam of flames shot out of the apartment. Frogman looks at Sludris in disbelief. What? Wasn't he one of our stronger guys? The two monsters are interrupted when two figures jump out of the hole in the apartment. One they recognize as their target, Deku. But they don't recognize the cyborg who is glaring daggers at them. Don't worry, sensei. I will deal with them stated Genos who charges at the two sweating monsters. But he only manages to take two steps before Deku suddenly picks him up by his shoulder with one hand. Sensei, you should study your surroundings before you rush in like that. Genos remarked Izuku, sagely. Before Genos can ask what he means by that, a pair of small claws poke out of the ground where Genos was just standing. After they grasp nothing but air for a moment, they retreat back underground. You had one job to do, ground dragon and you couldn't even do that right stated another monster who walks around the corner of the street while Deku puts Genos back down. The monster is a large humanoid lion with a full mane and tail. He adorns a black shirt, animal furs on his shoulders and a leopard skin cloth around his waist, secured by heavy chains and a belt with a lion head buckle. He also has bracelets on both wrists and ankles and bracers on both of his muscular biceps. Another monster that resembles a brown mole digs out of the ground nearby, looking ashamed. Apologies, I didn't expect our target to pick him up like that. Useless, the lot of you scoff the large monster who steps past a scared Sludris and Frogman to smirk at Deku. So you're the so-called strongest hero, huh? You don't look like much to me said the humanoid lion before bellowing out a laugh. But all you ants look weak when compared to the Beast King. Why you growled Genos who steps forward to defend his sensei. But Izuku blocks him with an arm. No need for you to dirty your hands with him. Gino stated Izuku who steps forward to challenge the Beast King. Besides, you should be focusing on the enemy behind you. Behind me, thought Gino's, having not sensed anyone behind him until another monster smashes through a nearby house. Gino's is quick to turn around and sees a gorilla-like creature that is adorned in metallic armor. A cyborg. The real reason Izuku doesn't let Gino's fight the Beast King is because he can tell the monster is far too strong for the cyborg to handle. Genos may have done well against Mosquito Girl before she transformed, but the Beast King is obviously on a completely different level than her. The armored monster that Genos is fighting now is at a more realistic power level for Genos to fight so he leaves him be for now. If he can't defeat that monster, then he won't make it as my student thought Izuku while facing off against Beast King. Beast King stares down at the supposed number one hero with a large cocky smirk on his face. So you wanna fight? Alright then, let's see how you face off against the likes of me. Roared Beast King who lunges at Izuku with his very sharp claws poised to rip him apart. Just as the Beast King's attack is about to connect, 
Deku throws a single punch which hits the Beast King in his stomach. Immediately, the monster is thrown backwards by the force of the punch, knocking aside Sludurus and Frogman who are unfortunate enough to be standing behind him. Beast King is thrown back nearly all the way down the street before he manages to stab his large claws down into the pavement to slow down his momentum. Once he comes to a complete stop, Beast King vomits out enough blood to fill a bathtub, showcasing how much damage Deku's lone punch did to him. He managed to push back Beast King and make him cough up blood. With one punch, thought Ground Dragon in complete and utter shock. The fact that the hero did so in an almost leisurely manner makes Ground Dragon realize that they might be fighting someone a bit above their league, even though he is in immense pain. Has a large bruise that covers most of his muscular torso and is coughing up blood, Beast King chuckles before pushing himself up to stand up at his full height. So what the doctor said was true. You really are the strongest hero praised the monster before he begins to transform. But there can only be one king of the jungle and that will be me. Roared Beast King whose muscle bulge and increase in size while his claws sharpen even more than they already are. Lion Slash, Meteor Power Shower. Izuku senses the already strong monster's power increase and reacts accordingly by activating full cowl to enhance his speed and reflexes. Green bolts of lightning spread across Izuku's large body with the occasional flicker of green flames that show his use of his full cowl technique. Beast King lunges at Izuku and unleashes a flurry of slashes so fast and strong that the shockwaves alone manage to cut apart nearby buildings with ease. However, they fail to cut Izuku who is moving so fast that he is able to dodge each one of Beast King's slashes. Although Sludurus and Frogman aren't so lucky for they are too slow to avoid the shockwaves and end up sliced into pieces. Not that Beast King cares about killing his comrades. Having enough of the destruction released upon by the monster, Izuku dives forward and gets into Beast King's personal space. Beast King smirks down at Izuku as he only sees an easier target, now that the hero is so close. Die, roared Beast King while thrusting his large claws down on Deku. The sound of ripping flesh and breaking bones echo across the city street. No longer smiling, Izuku closes his eyes and ignores the splatter of blood on his cheek. If it's any consolation, you were pretty strong said the number one hero whose left arm is currently embedded into Beast King's chest. Izuku's hand is protruding out of Beast King's back and in his bloodied hand is the monster still beating hard. Even now, killing doesn't feel very heroic to Izuku, but he has learned a long time ago that it's necessary. Unlike criminals, some monsters have proven to be too powerful to be kept inside any prison on the planet so with no other alternative, they must be killed so they can no longer cause widespread destruction. Beast King grunts in pain as blood spills out of the hole in his chest and his mouth. When he tries to speak, all he can let out are a few gurgles before he loses all his remaining strength and collapses on Deku's shoulder, dead. Ground Dragon shakes in fear after watching Izuku kill the House of Evolution's second strongest fighter. One moment, Beast King is pressing the attack, using his strongest move to do so in the next. The hero thrusts his entire arm into Beast King's chest, killing him. T this eye is who we were as supposed to see capture. This is T the S strength of the S strongest H hero, thought the shaking ground dragon. D Dr. G Genis sent us to our deaths. Ground dragon's fear only escalates once Deku turns his sights on himself. With a shriek of terror, ground dragon dives into the floor and begins digging so to escape the wrath of the strongest hero. Unfortunately, ground dragon doesn't get far because a whip made out of black energy dives in after the monster and wraps around his body before pulling him back to the surface. After being ripped out of the underground, Ground Dragon is suspended in front of Deku by the black whip of energy which is protruding out of the hero's open right palm. I am possible. You're going to tell me everything I need to know about the House of Evolution said Deku whose smile is no longer plastered on his face. All that's left is the strongest hero who wants to deal with the threat that is the House of Evolution. While the monsters like Kamakuri and Ground Dragon could be dealt with by nearly any B-class hero and above, the same can't be said about Armored Gorilla or Beast King. If the House of Evolution can make monsters as strong as them, then they need to be dealt with as soon as possible. Who knows, they might have even created another Zombaman. Sadly, Deku isn't getting much answers from Ground Dragon who is so terrified that he has lost all cognitive function. All the monster does is sweat heavily and shake in fear. Now that Izuku thinks about it, the petrified monster somewhat reminds him of his old classmate, Minta, at least when it comes to the sweating and shaking in fear part, with a sigh. Izuku goes ahead to give the monster a quick death and so, tightens the black whip around Ground Dragon's throat which ends up beheading the monster, dropping the two halves of Ground Dragon's body. Izuku turns to see how Genos is doing and is impressed to see that he has already dealt with the cyborg gorilla and did so without getting so much as a scratch on him. The same can't be said for the cyborg gorilla who has lost his helmet, as well as both his arms and legs. Answer the question or you're going to be eliminated. Your choice said Genos, aiming an incinerator cannon at the crippled monster. It is you who will be eliminated, you fool. I am the third most powerful fighter in the House of Evolution. 
At your power level, you will never beat the Beast King, the second most powerful fighter. You will be destroyed told Armored Gorilla, sounding like a robot. Izuku walks up from behind Genos and throws an object on the floor. Armored Gorilla looks down at the object and recognizes it as Beast King's belt, although the blood on the belt buckle is new. Beast King is dead and if you don't want to join him, then you're going to tell us everything. For a moment, it seems like Armored Gorilla is going to deny them. At least, until he begins sweating and shaking his head in fear, comically. L look, I'm sorry. I'll tell you everything, just don't kill me, pleaded the monster, losing his robotic voice. Izuku blinks in surprise. Wait, what happened to your robot voice? Sorry about that. I was just trying to sound cool answered Armored Gorilla. Afterwards, Armored Gorilla explains the origins of the House of Evolution, as well as the man who created it, Dr. Genis. Apparently, Dr. Genis's goal in life is the artificial evolution of humanity as a species. But since no one in the science community would help him, Dr. Genis continued his work by himself. It was only when the scientist was in his 70s did he manage to get the results he was looking for. With said results, he has managed to return his body to its youth, create an army of clones based off himself and has conducted experiments on both animals and humans, creating mutant monsters like Armored Gorilla and Beast King. Izuku also finds out that Mosquito Girl was also one of Dr. Genis's creation. Is the reason he sent you after me because of revenge? Because I killed Mosquito Girl? Asked Izuku. Armored Gorilla shakes his head. No, the boss man saw how easily you defeated Mosquito Girl after she gained her complete transformation and so, he ordered us to capture you and bring you back to our headquarters so he can study your body. I can see why he would want to study Sensei's body to further his research in evolution. Sensei's body surpasses that of other humans said Genos. Having spent last night watching many videos online that show Deku destroying titanic monsters, change the weather and even create twisters, all with one punch, no normal human could possibly have such godly strength in their body. Izuku frowns for many reasons. The first being that if what Armored Gorilla said is true, then this Dr. Genis will likely try to capture him again, but with more monsters. Secondly, Izuku doesn't like the sound of Dr. Genis at all. The scientist's goal to cause humanity to go through the next stage of evolution doesn't sound right with Izuku because the scientist sounds a lot like the people who belittled and bullied him as a child for being quirkless. Just because he wasn't born with a quirk of his own, he was looked down on and treated like as if he's lesser than everyone else. Izuku looks down at his open palm and can't help but find amusement in the irony. Everyone bullied and scoffed at him because he didn't have a quirk and now, he has seven of them. Dismissing his thoughts on the past, Izuku turns to Genos. Genos, let's go. We've got all we need so let's pay the House of Evolution a visit told Deku before he walks away. Genos nods and after asking Armored Gorilla if the House of Evolution has any other cyborgs, Genos follows after his sensei. House of Evolution. Impossible. Our elite force, formed for the extermination of these obsolete humans, wiped out exclaimed Dr. Genis who clenches his fists in rage. On the monitor of the large computer reveals that everyone but Armored Gorilla has been killed, including Beast King. Surrounding Dr. Genis is his small army of clones who all look exactly like him, except for their plain white shirts and pants which have different numbers on them so to identify which clone is which. Clone number 33 speaks up. According to Armored Gorilla's report, the two responsible in doing so are on their way here. On the monitor shows an image from Armored Gorilla's point of view, showing both Deku and the unknown cyborg. Dr. Genis grits his teeth, feeling a shiver of fear when he sees the image of the number one hero no longer smiling. The scientist didn't expect so much resistance from the hero, even if he's supposed to be the strongest hero of the Hero Association. Deku is still an obsolete human who should have fallen to his creations, but he has proven to be far stronger than he expected. If they manage to make it to the lab, all of our research, everything that we have been working on could be destroyed. We're in serious trouble stated clone number 78. Realizing that he has little options left, Dr. Genis clenches his fists and looks down. We're forced to use our trump card he said, making the clones gasp. Begin preparations for the release of Carnage Cabuto. Dr. Genis's order is met with the disbelieving and terrified cries of all his clones. What? No, not him. That's crazy. He'll finally be released. He's right. That might be the only way. It's too dangerous. I have a bad feeling about this. Quiet down. He'll be our very last resort told Dr. Genis, silencing his clones. Clone number 33 gulps, nervously. But, sir, we'll start by activating all of our traps from the first floor to the eight. If we're lucky, they will take care of the intruders. I'm aware what would happen to us if we fail. Especially to me stated Dr. Genis, knowing that if the traps don't work then one of two things will happen to him. Deku will either arrest him or Carnage Kabuto will kill them all. As it's still too early to tell what will happen, he will just have to wait and see. XXX. Moving faster than the eye can see, Deku flies across the sky while holding Genos under his left arm. 
On occasion, multiple shockwaves occurs whenever he breaks the sound barrier. Incredible, I knew you could fly, but not as fast as this, Sensei said Gino's as the wind brushes past him, harshly. The harsh wind might have hurt the skin of a normal human, but Gino's skin is synthetic so he doesn't feel any pain from the cold winds. Apologies, but this faster than us running and I don't think you can keep up with my top speed said Izuku, not out of arrogance, but simply stating a fact. When using 100% of one for all, Deku can keep up with the likes of Flashy Flash who is known as the fastest hero in the world. Gino's might be fast, but he is nowhere near fast enough to keep up with Deku. If Gino's tried, he would only damage his mechanical body. After flying across the sky in blinding speeds for a solid 10 minutes, Izuku spots the tall building that Armored Gorilla told them about, deactivating his float quirk. Izuku lets gravity drop him back down to the ground in front of the building. When Izuku's body hits the floor, the ground explodes in a shower of dirt and rock, but when the dust clears, Izuku can be seen crouched in the crater, having landed perfectly without any damage to his person, nor to Gino's who he still carries under his arm. We're here stated Deku while dropping Gino's who gets up to look up at the tower that makes up the headquarters for the House of Evolution. Taking in his surroundings, Izuku can see why Dr. Genis decided to place the headquarters here. The headquarters is located in a forest with a large cliff close enough that it hides the tall building from one side. The building itself looks old and weathered, having moss growing along the sides of the building. But if what Armored Gorilla said about Dr. Genis unlocking a scientific method to keep his youth is true, then the scientist and the building must be nearly a hundred years old which explains the weathered appearance of the building. Unless you were specifically looking for it in the middle for the forest, you likely wouldn't find it. Looks like there's eight floors to it so we should start from the top and make our way to TH. Boom. The old and weathered headquarters to the House of Evolution explodes and is incinerated on the spot. Courtesy of Genos who went ahead and destroyed the building with the use of both of his incinerator cannons. Genos, yes, sensei, why did you just blow up the building? In the interest of efficiency, I thought it would be best to destroy them all in one fell swoop answered the cyborg, honestly. Izuku forgets that Genos is only 19 years old and has yet to learn the steps to being a good hero. True, that was efficient, but next time, don't just destroy everything. When dealing with criminals, our job as heroes are to apprehend them while also gathering evidence. We only kill humans if we have no other choice on the matter. If we are so quick to kill humans, then we become no better than the monsters. Genos looks at his sensei, finding a lot of wisdom in his words. In the blink of an eye, Genos takes out his notebook and begins writing down Izuku's words. So inspiring. No wonder you are the number one hero. Strong in both body and mind complimented the cyborg while he writes. Genos's straightforward and serious manner reminds Izuku a lot of his old classmate, Tenya Ida, shaking his head over the cyborg's antics, Deku walks over to what little remains of the House of Evolution. After looking around the rubble, Deku spots a metal door in the floor. Walking over to it, Deku grabs one corner of the door and peels it open without any struggle. Looks like there's a basement. XXX. The sound of screams and gunfire can be heard in one of the rooms of the underground facility for the House of Evolution. In the room, one of Dr. Genesis's clones can be found shooting an assault rifle at a giant monster. Said monster is a massive being that towers over the shooting clone and looks humanoid in appearance, but has many characteristics that resembles a beetle, including a thick exoskeleton, a pair of wings encased by elytra and a large horn on its head. Along its bulky arms and legs are large spikes. The monster is Carnage Kebuto, the strongest fighter in the House of Evolution. As stop it, just stay away yelled the clone as terror as he continues firing his automatic rifle at Carnage Kebuto, not that it does anything to the monster. In fact, Carnage Kebuto's exoskeleton is so thick that the bullets aren't even tickling him. The clone's cries are quickly silenced when Carnage Kebuto throws a lazy punch at him, causing the clone to explode from the power in the punch and become a bloody smear across the floor. Behind Carnage Kebuto, Dr. Genis enters the large room with his hands in his pockets so he can pretend that they're not shaking in fear. Hey. Uh, Carnage Kebuto greeted the sweating Dr. Genis who is trying to keep himself calm while in the presence of his strongest creation. Tell me, are you feeling alright? It seems like you killed a bunch of my clones again asked the scientist while referring to the smears of blood and remnants of white cloth which used to be some of his clones who were given the unfortunate job to releasing Carnage Kebuto. Are you satisfied? You fool. Why would I be satisfied? Huh? Asked the monster in annoyance. I've been kept up deep under the earth. I'm the strongest warrior in the entire house of evolution bellowed Carnage Kebuto while ripping off the heavy metal brace around his neck, freeing him from the last of restraints that kept him locked up for so many years. You were imprisoned because you're mentally unstable. We couldn't control you. There was no choice on the matter answered Dr. Genis, glaring at his strongest creation. You couldn't control me, laughed Carnage Kebuto. Moron, I'm the ultimate culmination of the new human you guys had sought for so long. 
My intelligence and physical strength are incomparable to your own. The way I see it, you and your clones should be the ones obeying me stated Carnage Kabuto while getting into Dr. Genesis' face. To add insult to injury, the monster sticks his tongue out, mockingly. No, you're a failure thought Dr. Genis, believing Carnage Kebuto to be his greatest failure. It's true that you perform at unheard of levels, but you lack humanity. Go ahead and kill me. Plenty of clones could take my place said Dr. Genis, accepting his faith. If he wanted to, Carnage Kebuto could kill him and all his clones and there would be nothing they could do to stop him. Even if all their other creations like Mosquito Girl and Beast King were still alive, they would just be killed by Carnage Kebuto. He's simply that strong. Oh, voiced Carnage Kebuto in curiosity. But I have a favor to ask continued the scientist as a holographic screen appears beside them, showing a captured image of Deku and Genos. There's a specimen I must have. He's proven to be extremely strong, said to be the strongest man on the planet. I want you to catch him for me. Carnage Kabuto looks at the screen with an excited grin on his face. Dead or alive? XXX. Ever since they found the underground hatch, Deku and Genos have been walking down a straight hallway for the past five minutes, failing to find any signs of anyone alive in the underground facility. Stay on your guard, Genos told Asirius Izuku, although he remains smiling. I will, Sensei nodded Genos, walking alongside Deku who suddenly stops, making the cyborg stop as well. Something's coming. Genos turns to his sensei in confusion before he stiffens up, discovering two living signatures from his sensors. Sensei could sense them coming even when my own sensors couldn't pick them up, thought Genos, only being further amazed by his sensei. The more he learns about Deku, the more reasons why the man is deserving of his number one hero title. In the distance, they can see lights being smashed, courtesy of Carnage Kabuto who is running towards them while holding an injured Dr. Genis in his right hand. Which one is it? Asked the monster. T the one on the right answered Dr. Genis, struggling to remain conscious with the pain from Carnage Kebuto's rough handling of him. In that case, you don't need the one on the left, exclaimed Carnage Kebuto who backhands Genos into the wall while also dropping Dr. Genis to the floor. Genos, pride Izuku, seeing the cyborg is now embedded into the wall. At the same time, Carnage Kebuto appears behind Izuku who turns to him. My name is Carnage Kebuto. We've got a combat experimentation room back this way said Carnage Kebuto while pointing a thumb behind him. Let's throw down in there. Izuku glares up at Carnage Kebuto with his eyes while keeping his smile. This monster is strong. Stronger than Beast King. Dragon level threat. For sure he thought while nodding. Fine then. Let's fight. Grinning, Carnage Kebuto leads Deku into the combat experimentation room which happens to be a large room that has giant white tiles covering the floor, walls and ceiling. Pretty big, huh? Said Carnage Kebuto as Deku and himself square off against each other. It's the largest room in this facility. This is where we fight to test our combat ability, which means there's plenty of room here to kick your ass. The monster has an excited grin on his face. Let's start the killing. All of a sudden, Carnage Kebuto is enveloped in intense flames. Once the flames die down, Carnage Kebuto curiously looks over to the source of the flames, having been left completely unharmed by the intense heat. Huh, still alive are you? He asked, noticing that the one who attacked him is the cyborg from before. Izuku didn't expect Genos to recover so fast after the monster embedded him into the wall so he's also surprised by Genos' sudden attack, but still tries to stop him. Genos wasn't strong enough to fight Beast King earlier today and he most definitely isn't strong enough to beat Carnage Kebuto. Genos, stand down. You have no chance in defeating him told Izuku, knowing that while Genos has a lot of firepower, none of it will do any good against Carnage Kebuto's powerful shell. While hurt from the blow he took earlier, Genos stands to his full height and focuses his attention on the monster. No need to worry about me, sensei. I will handle him told Genos, ignoring Izuku's order as he charges at the monster. Like a blur, Genos dashes across the field and lands a powerful spin kick across Carnage Kebuto's chest. Not that it did any damage to the monster. Genos then begins circling the monster while firing powerful beams of fire at him. Not once has Carnage Kebuto dodged any of the cyborg's attacks. Jumping into the air, Genos flips forward before he pulls his right arm back for a finishing move. A smoky, but unharmed Carnage Kebuto looks up at the incoming cyborg with an arrogant grin on his face. You fool. Genos' eyes glow. Machine gun blow. Exclaimed the cyborg before he delivers a barrage of powerful and destructive punches on the monster. However, Carnage Kebuto counters by throwing a punch almost lazily at the cyborg. The punch connects and Genos' body is thrown back while it bounces along the floor several times before Deku catches him. Deku looks down at the injured cyborg in his arms. I told you that you couldn't handle him said the number one hero. Izuku can see that like many heroes, Genos thinks he's stronger than he really is. The cyborg may have fought monsters before, but he has never fought beasts like Carnage Kebuto and so, doesn't realize that there are people and creatures out there much stronger than him. 
with his face cracked and his left eye destroyed. Genos glares at the smug monster with hatred. Let me take him pleaded Genos who aims his left incinerator cannon at the monster before firing the most powerful beam of fire that he can come up with. The powerful beam of fire might have incinerated tiger level and demon level monsters, but Carnage Kebuto is on a whole different league than them. Taking a deep breath of air, Carnage Kebuto blows the air in his lungs at the beam of fire, not only stopping it in its tracks, but also repelling it back at Genos and Deku. With his breath, impossible, cried out Genos in disbelief, watching as his most powerful beam is repelled back at himself with just the monster's breath. Before the flames can hit them, Izuku focuses one for all into his right forefinger and aims it at the incoming flames. Flick bolt. Izuku flicks his finger and with the use of one for all, releases a powerful beam of pressurized air at the incoming stream of fire. The concentrated burst of air disperses the flames away while also hitting Carnage Kabuto in the chest, causing an explosion of wind. When the dust settles, Carnage Kabuto can be seen without a single scratch on his shell. Not bad. That actually tickled a little chuckled Carnage Kabuto, showing no damage from Izuku's finger flick. He even sticks his tongue out at Izuku, mockingly. Genos, I want you to stay by the exit told Deku who stands up to face off against Carnage Kabuto. But Sensei, I can stay. Genos, if you want there to be any chance of me accepting you as my student, then you will follow my orders and stay by the exit. This time, Izuku pushes his full authority onto the cyborg who can only gulp nervously, feeling an invisible pressure press down on his body. If you continue to fight, you will lose and you will die. How will you be able to avenge your family if you're dead? Genos widens his eyes in realization, now knowing the truth of his sensei's words. He wanted to prove himself to Deku so badly that he went out of his way to fight the monster that is so obviously above him in raw power and defense, even if it killed him. I'm so foolish. I obviously still have so much to learn thought Genos, chastising himself while he pushes himself back up to his feet. Very well, sensei. I wish you luck on your fight. The cyborg turns and runs for the exit, leaving Izuku and Carnage Kabuto in the room. With Genos no longer in the way, Izuku can now get serious. The number one hero loses his smile and walks towards an arrogant Carnage Kebuto with both of his fists clenched. Deku's serious demeanor amuses the dragon-level monster. Oh, I see it. I see it. You're supposed to be strong mock Carnage Kebuto while pointing both fingers at the hero. Strongest man in the world they say. Look at you, oozing with confidence. You must think that you can get away with anything said Deku whose green eyes actually seem to glow. I think it's about time someone teaches you a lesson. Carnage Kabuto chuckles in amusement before disappearing from sight, moving faster than a being of his size should be capable of. Laughing, the monster runs along a wall before appearing behind Izuku with his fist pulled back for a powerful punch. Such speed thought of viewing Genos, shocked to see a creature as big as Carnage Kabuto move so fast. He's even faster than Mosquito Girl. Smirking, Carnage Kebuto throws a punch at the hero's back so to see him become a bloody smear across the floor. However, that doesn't happen for instead. Deku suddenly turns around to face the monster in an instant and with his right hand, redirects the monster's punch away while throwing one of his own with his left hand. All the while he focuses 30% of one for all's power into his full cowl technique. Spark punch, with his arm encased in the lighting of one for all. Deku punches Carnage Kebuto in the chest, causing an explosion of power to wash over the room. Genos has to keep himself steady so to not be blown away by the explosion. Before the smoke can subside, Deku is thrown out of the smoke, courtesy of Carnage Kabuto who punches him. A fool, quickly recovering. Izuku spins while in midair and lands on the wall with his feet before kicking off of it, launching him back at the monster who crosses his arms, just in time to block Midoriya's flying dropkick. Although the force of the blow does push back the monster a few hundred feet, it does no noticeable damage. Both monster and hero size each other up before in a blur. Both disappear and reappear in the center of the room, throwing a barrage of punches at each other that are so fast that it looks like they are throwing ten punches at once. Most of the thrown punches are countered by the others which causes miniature shockwaves while the punches which do hit are mostly ignored. They're both evenly matched thought Genos who ignores how the wind blows back his hair every time a collision of fists causes a shockwave. Not even his mechanical eye can keep up with the speeds of their punches. Charging his power up to 40%, Deku's strength and speed increases drastically. All of a sudden, Deku catches both of Carnage Kebuto's arms and squeezes them. The monster widens his eyes in surprise when he sees his arm's armor-like shell crack under the hero's growing strength. Is he getting stronger? Carnage Kebuto doesn't get much time to think on that because with both of his arms seized, he has no way to protect himself from Midoriya who jumps up and throws a powerful upwards kick which hits the monster's chin. Carnage Kebuto's mouth is forced closed by Deku's kick which also propels him up to the ceiling which he bounces off of and has him thrown back down to Deku who jumps up to meet the monster in midair. 
With a battle cry, Deku throws a punch up at the falling monster, but Carnage Kebuto manages to avoid the attack by flying back up into the air by using his wings. At least, Carnage Kebuto thought he dodged the attack. Even if Deku didn't physically hit the monster, the power of his punch blows an incredibly powerful gust of wind that throws Carnage Kebuto back and forcefully presses him to the ceiling. With the gust of wind pressing Carnage Kebuto into the ceiling, the monster can only roar in pain once Deku jumps up and punches the monster in the chest, forcing Carnage Kebuto to cough up blood while pieces of his shell fly off. The ceiling itself cracks up with some rubble falling to the floor. Get off me, yelled Carnage Kebuto who kicks Midoriya away now that the winds has died off. Izuku backflips before he lands back on the floor while skidding backwards a couple of feet. Carnage Kabuto drops back down to the floor and lands less gracefully than Deku, due to his injuries which he sustained from Deku's previous punch. How is this possible? Wondered a panting Carnage Kabuto who looks over himself to see the extent of his injury. His powerful shell which can brush off bullets and rockets has been severely damaged with pieces haven fallen off and cracks covering nearly his entire body. The monster can also taste the blood that is pooling in his mouth, meaning that he has suffered internal damage, but his regenerative abilities has mostly healed him of such injuries. How can a human be this strong? Angry over his injuries, Carnage Kebuto charges at Izuku with a scowl and his fists clenched. Take this you bastard. I punched him with nearly half of one for all's power and he can still move so fast thought Izuku. Honestly surprised that Carnage Kebuto survived being hit with 40% of one for all's power, even if it's spread throughout his body when he uses full cowl. That shell of his must have absorbed most of the impact and I'm guessing he has some sort of regenerative ability to heal what damage I did to him, which means I need to take him out in one blow. Nodding to himself, Izuku decides to go all in and use 100% of one for all to finish off Carnage Kebuto. Deku tenses his body and separates both feet before rearing his right arm back, preparing a punch that contains 100% of his power. Lightning engulfs Deku's arm which bulges in size while red veins begins to stretch across the bulging muscular arm. One for all 100%, Big Ba. Before Izuku can finish his move, Carnage Kebuto suddenly stops his charge and instead, jumps far away until his back is pressed against the wall. Huh, an injured Dr. Gunos who has been watching the battle between the strongest hero and his strongest creation is left with his mouth hanging wide open in shock. Impossible, Carnage Kebuto retreating. A heavily sweating Carnage Kebuto breathes in heavily as he stares at his opponent in terrified disbelief. If I stayed on the attack, he would have killed me thought the monster, having sensed an unbelievable amount of power coming from the hero. The hero was strong ever since the start of the battle, but the monster has noticed that the longer they fought, the more powerful the hero seems to become. Bastard has been holding back on me thought Carnage Kabuto, forgetting his fear once his rage begins to take over. The monster doesn't like to be looked down on, especially by some worthless human. You think you can look down on me? Ward Carnage Kabuto who begins transforming. Dr. Gunos widens his eyes in horror. Oh no, it looks like he's going into another rampage. The scientist's security system detects Carnage Kebuto's transformation and emits an alarm while also locking down the entire facility. The only exit to the combat experimentation room closes behind him, trapping him with the two heroes and the out-of-control Carnage Kebuto. Deku narrows his eyes as he watches Carnage Kebuto's muscles bulge. Disgustingly, the monster's damaged shell shatters as his muscles become too large to contain in them. Carnage Kebuto's horn grows longer in size and becomes incredibly sharp. Once his transformation is complete, Carnage Kebuto glares down at Deku with his blood-red eyes. The monster's disgustingly large purple muscles and green veins nearly seem to glow in the dark, especially when the experimentation room changes in appearance and now it looks like everyone is standing on an invisible floor. Carnage Mode Bellowed Carnage Kebuto who stomps his feet on the ground, cracking the floor with ease. When I get like this, I lose control for a whole week and my lust for death cannot be quelled told the transformed monster. When I'm done killing you, I'm going to head to town and go on a killing rampage hunt. Carnage Kebuto is interrupted by Deku who punches the monster in his left cheek, having appeared before the monster in an instant, now powered with 60% of one for all. Green blood spurts out of Carnage Kebuto's open mouth, but the monster is quick to recover and throws its own punch at the hero. Deku actually has to clench his teeth to suppress the winds from Carnage Kebuto's punch which bounces him off two walls in the ceiling. The hero stops himself in midair by using float, but he is quickly attacked by Carnage Kebuto. He can only cross his arms across his chest to lessen the force in Carnage Kebuto next punch which is stronger than the previous one. The punch launches him back, but Izuku quickly wraps Black Whip around the monster's neck to stop him from going far and is repelled back at Carnage Kebuto who is too busy trying to stop the whip from choking him to block or avoid Deku's shoulder bash. Deku can hear Carnage Kebuto's bones breaking.
But the monster is in so much rage that he ignores the pain and instead throws a barrage of punches down on Deku who is deflecting them, although more than a few manage to hit its mark. Time to finish this. Die, 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 roared Carnage Kebuto as he throws punch after punch down at the hero so to turn his bones into dust and muscles into paste, filled with so much rage because of his transformation. Carnage Kebuto doesn't even process the fact that Midoriya has suddenly vanished in a flash of green light, nor the fact that he no longer has any arms, due to Midoriya having ripped them off in that instant. Carnage Kebuto soon figures out that something is wrong when a dreadful feeling of doom fills his body causing him to calm down from his murderous rage for a moment. The reason for the cold feeling of dread making the monster break out in a sweat is because of Midoriya, who is enveloped in a combination of green flames and lighting rears his right arm back for his finishing move. The now glowing hero gathers the power of one for all into his right arm which is bulging and covered in red veins. So much power is flowing through Deku's arm that it actually manages to disintegrate his glove and the right side of his hero costume. Deku's hero costume may be designed to withstand blows from powerful monsters and when he uses full cow, but the costume can't withstand all of one for all's power being focused on one single point. It isn't only Izuku's costume that is being damaged, but the surrounding environment as well. As Deku focuses one for all into his arm, the ground all around him cracks and craters as the entire underground facility shakes. One for all 100%, Big Bang Blast. For everyone, it nearly seems like time stops after Deku throws his punch. For what seems like forever, nothing happens, but then, an explosion of light blinds everyone in the room, as well as a powerful gust of wind that blows in every direction. When the light eventually dies down, Dr. Genis and Genos turn back to see what has happened. For Dr. Genis, even his genius mind couldn't comprehend the sheer overwhelming power of Deku's punch. One moment, Carnage Kebuto is standing there after getting his arms ripped off and the next, he's just gone. There's no blood, bone or anything that can be used to identify the existence of Carnage Kebuto. In fact, everything facing the direction of Deku's outstretched fist is gone, including the wall. From the hole where the wall used to be, the scientists can see that it leads out to the surface and that for miles away, the forest has simply vanished, leaving behind an empty wasteland of what used to be a vast land of flora and fauna. He eradicated Carnage Kebuto. With one punch, thought the scientist who is only now processing the fact that his most powerful creation is now nothing but dust in the wind. The hero's punch didn't even leave a scrap of carnage Kabuto left, having obliterated him out of existence. While relieved that his sensei defeated the powerful monster, Genos is just as shocked as the scientist to see the aftermath of Deku's punch. What destructive power. It's almost like sensei's fist has the power of an atomic bomb, if not several thought the cyborg. A slightly sweaty Deku looks at the wasteland which used to be covered in forests and mountains before looking at the fist which caused said destruction. Maybe I should have held back to 80% muttered the hero, realizing that he may have gone a bit overboard with defeating the monster. In the past 10 years he has spent as both a vigilante and as an official hero. None were as powerful as Carnage Kebuto who made him use 60% of his power, a feat that very few have managed to accomplish. However, he needed to finish the fight fast once Carnage Kebuto entered Carnage mode as he feared that the scientist and Genos could end up killed in the crossfire of the monster's rampage. Turning away from the massive hole he made in the wall which was designed to withstand powerful attacks from the House of Evolution creations, Izuku Midoriya eyes the injured scientist who caused this mess in the first place. Dr. Genis, I am placing you under arrest for illegal experimentation, destruction of property, attempted kidnapping and attempted murder. Please don't resist or I'll be forced to detain you he said, all with a smile on his face. Dr. Genis sniffs but shakes his head. I won't resist, not to you. You have actually thought me a valuable less today. Izuku's smile slightly widens over hearing that. Oh, and what lesson is that? You showed me that it isn't humanity that needs to change. Instead, I realize that I am the one that needs to change. A couple of days have gone by after the incident with the House of Evolution and ever since then, Izuku has been spending most of his time either fighting mysterious beings or completing his duties as principal to Hero Academy. The only actual change to Izuku's usual routine is that Genos has made it his duty to follow him around wherever he goes so he can learn from him, even though Genos still has to prove himself in the Hero Certification Exam which will occur next week. However, Izuku lets the cyborg be as he doesn't see the harm in Gino's learning a thing or two from himself. Although after taking a peek at Gino's notebook, Izuku had to point out to him that he didn't need to take note of literally everything he does. As someone who had filled many notebooks with information on heroes and their quirks as a child, Izuku can appreciate Gino's thinking, but the cyborg went into far too much detail in studying himself. Izuku still can't understand what Gino's could possibly learn by studying the angle in which he sits on a chair. 
While Izuku's schedule is usually busy, he has managed to take a day off which is a rare occurrence for the number one hero. Mysterious beings don't take days off and often attack at random times, meaning that predicting the movements of mysterious beings is impossible and requires Deku to remain vigilant at all times. However, it has been quiet these past couple of days, while there has been some mysterious being attacks. They mostly tend to be tiger-level threats who can be dealt with by other heroes who want to rise in the ranks, and since it's a Sai, Izuku's principal duties are practically non-existent, giving him the day off to himself. That's why Izuku Midoriya is walking around City F on his own. Usually, Genos would be following him like a puppy, but the cyborg is visiting a scientist for a maintenance check. Tatsumaki was called away to deal with a mysterious being threatened City X while Fubuki is off recruiting some heroes for her blizzard group, leaving Izuku to travel on his lonesome. As the number one hero, Izuku can be easily recognized by most civilians, which is why he is wearing a simple pair of jeans and a green hoodie which has the hood up to hide his messy green hair and upper face. Even with his attempt to remain inconspicuous, Izuku sticks out like a sore thumb because of his muscular build and tall height. While walking down the path, Izuku stops in front of a TV display window. I wonder if there's a place nearby that sells katsudan Izuku muttered to himself, having a craving for his favorite food. The terrorist group responsible for the riots call themselves the Paradisers. Izuku turns towards the TV display window which has seven TVs showing the news about a terrorist group. Along with the female news anchor, the screen also shows a video of a building which was destroyed by the terrorist group. They have destroyed a high-rise building in City F and the situation seems to be spiraling out of control. We have just learned the identity of their leader spoke the news anchor before a close-up picture of a smirking man with a scar across his nose and a large head appears on the screen. This is Hammerhead, a B-class criminal who has been involved in several violent incidents in the past. He's a man of large stature, standing at 66 tall and weighing 462 pounds. According to a police report, he fought 20 men in a street brawl and sent each of them to the hospital. Of all the times for terrorists to cause havoc, why did it have to be today and in the same city I'm in? thought Izuku with a sigh. Maybe I won't be needed. Snack supervises City F so I'm sure he and other heroes are already on the case. The Paradisers sent the following message to this TV station. We will continue to riot until food, clothing and shelter are provided free of charge to those who do not work, amongst other unintelligible demands. Like Hammerhead, the group is made up of unemployed young men with no motivation to work continued the news anchor. They're rioting because they don't want to work, thought a baffled Izuku. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Reports indicate that they all have shaven heads, making them not only uniform in appearance, but also quite intimidating. It is advised that those who encounter any shaven-haired men on the street should leave the area immediately. Never mind, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard, thought Izuku, staring at the television screens in bewilderment. All the paradisers being bald is weird enough, but for the news anchor to actually tell the public to run away if they were to see a bald man on the street. Does the news station not realize that there's a lot of bald men in the world who aren't members of the Paradisers? I need to send a complaint to the news station when this is all done and over with. Knowing that he can't just walk away while the Paradisers run rampant throughout the city, Izuku bends his knees and leaps up into the air, surprising the nearby people who feel the wind blow upwards from the force of Izuku's jump. With the single jump, Izuku reaches all the way to the rooftop of the high-rise building. Once on the rooftop, Izuku looks around to see if he can spot any sign of the Paradisers. Izuku narrows his gaze when he sees smoke coming from a few blocks away. The hero runs across the rooftop and leaps towards the source of the smoke. After leaping over several city blocks, Izuku glides down to the road and once he lands, Izuku takes in his surroundings. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that the Paradisers have been through the area. Izuku looks around and sees that the source of the smoke is a pile of rubble which used to be a high-rise building. The street is also filled with destroyed vehicles and the unconscious bodies of nearly a hundred police officers in riot gear. Already, several ambulances have been called and medics are currently working on treating the injured police officers, as well as a hero who looks to have attempted to stop the Paradisers by himself. Izuku recognizes the hero when he sees the hero's helmet and his bicycle. Isn't that Muman Rider? He doesn't personally know Muman Rider, since they don't ever meet each other during patrols or monster attacks, but from a few meetings with the Hero Association Council that Izuku attended. One of the topics spoken about was Muman Rider's lack of desire to move up to B-Class after holding the title of C-Class Rank 1 for nearly half a year. The area has been closed off with police tape so to keep the curious civilians from getting any closer to the wreckage. There are also some police officers around who lack the riot gear that their unconscious comrades are wearing meaning that they arrived after the Paradisers. Izuku walks past the crowd of civilians and ducks underneath the police tape. A nearby police officer notices the large man in civilian clothing going past the police tape and moves to stop him. 
Sir, you need to stay back behind the tape. No need for that, officer. I'm here to help told Izuku before he pulls down his hood, revealing his face to the public. Everyone quickly recognizes the face of the S-Class Rank 1 hero, Deku. Mr. D. Deku stuttered the police officer who pales when he realizes that he was trying to order around the strongest hero. Apologies, I didn't know it was you. Deku bellows out a laugh that slightly shakes the ground. No need to worry about that. You were just doing your job. Tell me, what happened here? He asked while looking towards the unconscious officers who are being treated by the medics. It was the Paradisers. They have been causing havoc across City F, throwing cars, beating officers and they've recently destroyed a building. We sent in a riot team to deal with them. But they were completely overwhelmed explained the police officer while trying to ignore the civilians who are either gossiping with one another overseeing the number one hero in person or are taking pictures of said hero with their phones. Izuku ignores the excited civilians and keeps his attention on the police officer. What are the numbers of the Paradisers? They've been last reported to have 23 members, including their leader, Hammerhead. How does a group of 23 criminals manage to defeat nearly a hundred police officers in riot gear and destroy an entire building? Asked Deku, curiously. True, Hammerhead must be strong to earn his B-class villain ranking. But he shouldn't be able to defeat the overwhelming numbers of police officers in riot gear, even with 22 others. Izuku also notices a lack of explosive residue near the destroyed building indicating that no explosives were used to topple down the building. Which only pegs the question, how did they destroy an entire building without explosives? The Paradisers are all wearing some sort of high-tech suit of armor. Not sure how they got their hands on that sort of tech. But eyewitness reports say that one of the Paradisers destroyed the building. With one punch explained the officer who gulps at the thought of fighting a group of villains with such powerful high-tech armor. Only one Paradiser destroyed the building muttered Deku who doesn't like the sound of that. He is also curious over how the terrorist group managed to get their hands on high-tech suits of armor that can give them enhanced strength. Do you happen to know which way the Paradisers are heading? Izuku asked the police officer. The police officer is more than happy to point down the street. Last we checked, they were heading towards the direction of the woods. Deku offers a grateful nod to the police officer. Thank you, officer. You have been most helpful. Now, it's time for the Paradisers to face justice, exclaimed Deku who runs down the road, looking like a green blur to everyone who is watching. XXX. It doesn't take long for Deku to arrive at the woods, but what he finds stops him in his tracks. The Paradisers are all dead. Izuku looks around the destroyed part of the woods, seeing nothing but the headless corpses of the Paradisers. As the police officer said, the Paradisers all adorn a full-body suit of armor, but it looks like the armor didn't do much to protect them against whoever found them. Wait a second, where's Hammerhead? Izuku asked himself, noticing that Hammerhead's body isn't among the corpses of his fellow Paradisers. Hammerhead's large head would be easy to notice in the pile of others so the fact that it's missing must mean that he's still alive, at least for now. Izuku turns his head when he sees a large boulder fly into the sky from deep in the woods and watches as the flying boulder hits what looks like a giant pile of gold pieces on top of a nearby high-rise building. I swear, nobody has any taste in style these days thought Deku. Wondering why anyone in their right mind would want a giant piece of gold that's shaped as feces lying on top of their building. Ignoring the awful taste of design, Izuku runs towards the direction in which the throne boulder came from. XXX, Hammerhead can be found running through the forest with a kunai stuck in the back of his head. The villain's goal to destroying Zenaru's building has failed after the multi-millionaire sent his bodyguard to stop the Paradisers. The Paradisers had the numbers and strength, yet Zenaru's bodyguard was far too fast for them to handle. All of Hammerhead's followers were butchered within seconds and while Hammerhead did put up a fight, he had still lost to the speedster. That's why the criminal faked his death when the bodyguard threw a kunai in the back of his head and is now retreating. That was close. Good thing that ninja freak hit my head. My skull has always been several times thicker than a normal person's thought an angry Hammerhead while he runs as far away as he can from Zenaru's bodyguard. I don't know who that guy was, but one day, I'm going to kill Hammerhead's thoughts stop when he sees someone running towards him. Now what? Hammerhead stops and stares at the green-haired man who he sees is wearing a simple hoodie. Who the hell are you? He asked, finding the man familiar for some reason. I swear I've seen his face somewhere before. Izuku Midoriya looks Hammerhead up and down while purposely studying the villain's suit of armor. While the suit of armor looks exactly like the ones that the other Paradisers were wearing. Hammerhead's has been painted with fire designs to help him stand out as the leader. Hammerhead, I am from the Hero Association and I'm here to put you under arrest. When Hammerhead throws a punch, Izuku isn't surprised, nor caught off guard. Most villains tend to throw the first punch when they first encounter heroes so he has been expecting it from the moment they made eye contact. That's why Izuku is so quick to raise a hand to catch the punch, but he is honestly surprised by the power he can feel in the blow. He still manages to keep a hold of Hammerhead's thrown fist. 
but Izuku can feel his hand get slightly numb from the power and the punch, even when using full cowl at 5%. Even though he successfully catches Hammerhead's punch, the shockwave from the impact causes the surrounding area to explode as if an explosion went off. Nearby trees and boulders either shatter or are blown away by the shockwave and the ground craters. When the dust from the explosion disperses, Hammerhead can only gape at the hero who is holding onto his outstretched fist, having blocked his punch with one hand and did so with ease. How? This suit of armor enhances my strength to the point where I can bring down a building with one punch and he stopped it with one hand, thought Hammerhead. Noticing that the only actual damage he did to the hero is destroy his hoodie which was shredded by the explosive shockwave, leaving the hero shirtless. W wait a minute, I know you. Why you're DD Deku? Stuttered the villain who only now recognizes the man who's known as the world's strongest hero. That explains why his suit didn't do any damage to the hero. That's gonna sting for a bit muttered Deku. Referring to his stinging right hand which he used to block Hammerhead's punch. That suit is impressive. If I were to gauge its strength, I would say it's around the level of Puri Puri prisoner he thought. Impressed, but weary that the suit of armor can give a B-class villain like Hammerhead strength to rival that of a S-class hero. Deku is quick to return his attention to the villain. That suit is troublesome. Take it off. Small sparks of emerald lightning appear across Deku's body as he increases the power of his full cowl technique from 5% to 10%. Without giving the villain a chance to respond, Deku punches Hammerhead in his chest. The punch shatters the suit of high-tech armor like glass while also knocking Hammerhead out at the same time, leaving the B-class villain naked and unconscious on the floor. Izuku is about to reach down and arrest Hammerhead when he senses killing intent to his left. In the blink of an eye, Izuku's left hand snaps upwards and catches a thrown kunai that was aimed at his head. WH Izuku's eyes widen when a man appears out of nowhere and thrusts his sword towards Izuku's left eye. Fast. Just as the sword is only a few millimeters away from piercing Deku's eye, the hero catches the blade and stops it in its tracks. The owner of said sword tries to push and pull the sword out of the man's grip but finds that it won't budge. It's not budging thought the surprised assailant, Speedo sound sonic. Be careful. You could have poked someone's eye out with this thing joked a smiling Deku. Here, let me help with that. Izuku clenches his fist and shatters the sword with ease. Sonic jumps back to a safe distance and looks at his destroyed sword. You, you're that hero everyone is always talking about. Deku, isn't it? Deku nods while keeping his guard up around the man before him. The young man who just attempted to kill him has black hair and adorns a tight bodysuit with plates of armor covering some of his shoulders and arms with a long purple scarf wrapped around his neck. That I am and I take it you're the one who dealt with the Paradisers, isn't that right? Those bald-headed fools were unfortunate to attempt an attack on my employer while I was still under contract answered Sonic with a cold stare. You see, I'm a perfectionist so I complete all my jobs with 100% efficiency. That's why I can't allow Hammerhead to live. I can't let you walk away either. Izuku narrows his eyes at the ninja, tensing up for a fight that's about to occur. Oh, you were able to read my attacks, twice. This I cannot allow. Born in a ninja village, I've been honing and perfecting my techniques since the early days of childhood, yet you saw right through them. This I cannot allow told Sonic. He reeks of killing intent thought a tense, but still smiling Deku who's getting a bad vibe from the man before him. My pride won't have it. I don't care who you are. I can't let you simply walk away. In a near instant, Sonic appears behind Izuku in a burst of speed that could nearly be considered as teleporting. Izuku senses the ninja behind him and is quick to turn around to throw a fast punch. But the ninja disappears and reappears a couple of feet away from Izuku. He even has his back turned to Deku, looking as if he's not worried about facing off against the S-Class Rank 1 hero. He's fast thought Deku. He had thrown his punch with full cowl at 15% and yet, the ninja dodged it effortlessly. Although, that smile of his is a bit creepy. During the split second that the ninja appeared behind him, Izuku had caught a glance of the man's expression before B disappeared again and what he saw was a bloodthirsty grin. If Izuku's smile brings hope and joy to the populace, then the ninja's smile would be the complete opposite, only bringing fear and terror. With a wide grin and a chuckle, Sonic jumps up into the air in a burst of speed so fast that he causes a shockwave from the motion. The ninja begins jumping from tree to tree while moving so fast that he barely appears as a black blur. In fact, he's moving so fast that it looks like there's several of him moving around. Each time the ninja jumps off a tree or off the ground, a shockwave occurs. Izuku's eyes blaze around the area as he keeps track of the ninja's movements. Even if Sonic is moving at speeds faster than the speed of sound. What incredible speed. Every time he jumps, he breaks the sound barrier. No wonder the Paradisers were massacred so easily. They likely died before they had any idea what was happening thought Deku who has only seen such speed among a handful of humans, himself included. Deku then narrows his eyes in suspicion. But this speed, those movements, why are they so familiar? 
He wondered, seeing a very big resemblance in Sonic's moves to that of a certain S-Class hero. What do you think of this speed that breaks the sound barrier? Of these shockwaves, can you even see me? Thought Sonic while jumping all over the area while keeping his eyes focused on the hero so he can choose the right moment to strike. Sonic chose the moment after he jumps off a tree and aims straight towards the back of the hero. There you are. To Sonic's disbelief, the hero actually turns his head to look at him, even as he's moving faster than the speed of sound. Bastard thought Sonic before he begins spinning forward in a series of very fast flips to gain momentum. Wind blade kick, exclaimed Sonic who stops flipping before aiming an axe kick down on the hero's head. But the combination of his speed, as well as the momentum from his flips, Sonic's kick now has the power to cut through steel. Deku widens his eyes upon recognizing the ninja's attack. His moves are exactly like flashy flashes, he thought. Recognizing Sonic's move is the same one that the S-Class Rank 13 hero uses. Sonic is baffled when he witnesses the hero actually step aside to dodge his wind blade kick. The ninja's bafflement is quickly replaced with pain once Deku punches him in the chest. Sonic opens his mouth to scream once he feels his ribs shatter from Izuku's punch, but no sounds comes out. However, the ninja does manage to release a scream when the force of Izuku's punch tosses him away into the sky, quickly disappearing into the horizon. Izuku only realizes what he did once he sees the ninja fade in the distance. Oops, kind of panicked there for a moment muttered Deku who realizes that he used too much power in his punch. Recognizing the ninja's moves as the same ones Flashy Flash uses had honestly surprised Izuku and while the revelation only distracted him for a second, it was more than enough time for the ninja to land a possible fatal blow on him. Luckily, Izuku managed to use full cowl at 70% capacity to dodge the kick. But in his panic to knock aside the dangerous individual, Izuku forgot to lessen one for all's output when he threw his punch so instead of simply knocking out the ninja like he attended, he had punched him through the sky and possibly killed him. I doubt that punch did him in. Flashy Flash can take one of my punches at 100% so I'm sure that guy could survive that thought Izuku who is trying to save himself the thought of having killed an actual human being. It would be the first time and if he's honest, the thought makes the hero queasy. While his moves were practically identical to flashy flashes, he wasn't as fast as him. The ninja proved to be incredibly fast and deadly, but he didn't match up to the speed of flashy flash who can move so fast that Deku struggles at times to keep up with him. Where it took 70% of Izuku's full cowl technique to dodge Sonic's kick, it usually takes the use of his full cowl at 100% to match and even surpass Flashy Flash's speed. I better head back and report this to headquarters. Deku's apartment. Was he really that fast? Asked Fubuki who as usual, invited herself into Izuku's apartment. She sits on one of the chairs near the couch that Izuku is currently sitting on. Izuku leans back and nods. Very fast. If he had applied to the hero registry. He would have made it to ask class, easily. Bah, if I was the one who met him, I could have destroyed him. You should have called me. I could have dealt with him for you remarked Tatsumaki who lies back across the other side of the couch. Even though she's lying down on the couch, Tatsumaki's feet don't touch Izuku, due to her small height. I have no doubt about that. The guy was fast, but his speed wouldn't matter if either of you two used your psychic abilities on him stated Izuku in complete honesty. The ninja might move faster than the speed of sound. But all that speed doesn't mean much if he's caught in a psychic hold by either of the psychic sisters. Even Fubuki who's the weakest of the two could have beaten the ninja if she got to use her abilities on him before he could move. Fubuki is honestly surprised by Izuku's high praise and looks down at her knees so to hide the blush on her cheek. Izuku saying that the B-class hero could defeat the S-class villain has Fubuki's heart skip a beat. Tatsumaki on the other hand knows that she can defeat the S-class villain. But she glares at her sister once she notices Fubuki's blush. One compliment and Izuku turns Fubuki into a blushing schoolgirl. A knock of the door has Izuku stand up to answer it, leaving the living room to the sisters who glare at each other with sparks clashing between their eyes. Their glare stops the moment Izuku returns, although they're surprised to see a cyborg walking behind him. Ladies, this is Genos. He'll be taking the hero certification exam in a few days and if he passes, I've promised to take him on as a student said Izuku, introducing Genos to the psychic sisters. Genos bows in a perfect 90 degree angle. Please take care of me. What? Yelled Tatsumaki who levitates up from the couch so she can glare down at the cyborg who dares think he's good enough to be named Deku's student. And what makes this kind of bolts think he's good enough to be your student? Demanded the Asper while glaring daggers at Genos. Tatsumaki's aggression has Genos take a battle stance while heat begins building up in his mechanical arms. If it's a fight you are requesting, then. There will be no fighting in my apartment told Izuku who lightly smacks Genos across the top of his head. I only got this place fixed up. Genos powers down his weapons and bows to Izuku in apology. Apologies, sensei. If you're going to be my student, then my first lesson for you is to control your recklessness scolded Izuku. 
You're skilled, but you overestimate your abilities when facing against beings more powerful than you, like Beast King and Carnage Kabuto. You need to recognize when to fight and when to retreat. Take Tatsumaki for instance. Izuku points up to the Esper who is still glaring down at Genos. Without thinking, you got reckless and attempted to fight her. I can tell you now that if I didn't stop you, she would have killed you in an instant explained the number one hero in a serious manner. Genos looks between a serious Izuku and smug Tatsumaki in disbelief. This little girl is that strong. What did you call me you piece of scrap metal? Yelled Tatsumaki whose power is starting to make the building shake. A black whip emerges from Izuku's shoulder and hits the back of Tatsumaki's head, making her lose focus of her powers. Tatsumaki is the S-Class Rank 2 hero for a reason, Genos. She's practically on the same level of power as myself. Genos nods in understanding, although he finds it hard to believe that the little girl is as strong as Deku. Fubuki has kept quiet throughout the interaction, but now that it seems like things are calming down, she decides to speak up. I'm surprised that you accepted to have a student. Many people would give anything to be taught by the number one hero. What can I say? Gino's is stubborn answered Izuku who chuckles when he sees Gino's puff out his chest as if he should be proud about that. Besides, he has the skill and firepower to be a good hero. How strong would you class him? Asked Fubuki, knowing that Izuku has a great mind when it comes to studying heroes. He even helped her learn some new fighting techniques just by studying her abilities. At the moment, low S class answered Izuku, much to Gino's pride. His firepower and mechanical body makes him faster and stronger than Puri Puri Prisoner. But he isn't as physically strong as say, Tank Top Master or as fast as Flashy Flash. In other words, he's weak stated an unimpressed Tatsumaki. Puri Puri Prisoner is the weakest among the S-Class branch so the cyborg being stronger than him doesn't account for much, especially when Deku admits that he isn't as strong as the other weak S-Class heroes, like Tank Top Master and Flashy Flash. Deku ignores Tatsumaki and claps Genos on his shoulder. Ignore Tatsu. She sees everyone as weak so you should just get used to it. Hey, for now, I need you all to leave. I have a meeting with the Hero Association in 20 minutes and need to lock up. Being the S-Class Rank 1 hero has a lot of responsibilities, including having to attend meetings with Hero Association officials. Fubuki smirks at the number one hero. Don't trust us alone in your apartment. Yes deadpan Deku, making Fubuki pout. Fine, I got something to do anyway remarked Tatsumaki who opts to fly out the window instead of the door. Izuku wonders if he would have made friends with such eccentric characters if he was still in his own world. Shrugging his shoulders, Izuku locks the door behind him once Genos leaves and then once outside, he takes flight towards City A. City A Hero Association HQ. Izuku manages to fly to City A from City Z and makes it just in time for his meeting with the Hero Association officials. I'm sorry. I hope I'm not late asked Izuku who walks into the meeting room where everyone is already sitting down. The meeting room is made up of 14 chairs placed around a long meeting table where 12 men in suits are sitting, including bearded worker and bespectacled worker with one female official sitting with them. Another female official is standing by a nearby podium and one side of the room has a monitor that covers the entire wall. Bearded worker smiles at the hero. There's nothing to apologize for, Deku. We know you're busy with your duties as a hero and as principal to the academy he said with the other hero association officials nodding their heads in agreement. The spectacled worker chimes in. Besides, we were just about to start. Izuku takes the only remaining seat beside the female official who blushes upon being so up close to the hero, Deku. Great. So then, what's our first agenda? Asked Izuku while opening up the file in front of him which was given to everyone in the meeting. The first item of our agenda is on the C-Class Rank 1 hero. Mumin Rider announced an official. He remains number one in both popularity and in completing heroic duties among the C-Class heroes. One of these duties is his attempt in stopping the Paradisers and while he may have failed. His actions do deserve a promotion to B-Class. Deku looks over the page referring to the C-Class hero, Mumin Rider. That was the hero who attempted to stop the Paradisers by himself after they defeated the riot police. Isn't that right? The official nods his head. Indeed he is. Izuku smiles brightly and nods his head in agreement. Usually, I do not promote recklessness, especially from a hero who tried to fight the Paradisers by himself, but he was willing to risk his life to protect civilians. I support Mumin Rider's promotion to B-Class, although I'm sure it isn't that simple. Correct. Mr. Deku said a female official who is sitting to Izuku's left. This isn't the first time Mumin Rider has been up for a promotion into B-Class. We have offered to promote him several times. But he has always refused without giving an explanation as to why. A hero that doesn't want to rise in the ranks. Now I've seen it all remarked a bemused Deku who gets a few chuckles from some of the officials. Izuku always thought that every hero wanted to rise in the ranks. But Mumin Rider is a rare phenomenon. Well if he doesn't want to be promoted, then that's his right to refuse. Are there any objections? Asked an official who stands up. 
When no one does object, the official nods. Then it is decided. Newman Ryder will remain the top-ranked Class C hero. Understood. I will inform him of our decision answered another official. It's baffling. I don't know why he has no desire to move up to Class B said an overweight official in bewilderment. As Deku said, a hero who doesn't want to rise in the ranks is very bizarre. Our next item on the agenda for our meeting, the 55th Hero Certification Exam and the circumstances surrounding it. For this exam, the total number of candidates is, the official turns to the female official standing by the podium. Over 11,000 with the exam offered at six different venues answered the female official who looks up. That is an increase of more than 22% over the previous exam. Many of the Hero Association officials are amazed by the increase of candidates who want to be heroes. Although the overweight official, the spectacled worker and Deku don't look as impressed as the other officials are. Sadly, most of those candidates will likely not pass the exam stated Deku who folds his muscular arms across his chest. The overweight official nods in agreement. Deku is correct. We mustn't be happy with simple quantity. Even with more candidates, if the quality of the heroes are reduced, then the numbers are meaningless he said while turning his attention to the large monitor which shows two graphs. The graph on the left shows the increasing number of candidates over the past few months. But the graph on the right shows that the candidates who have passed the hero certification exam in recent months have all dipped in quality. Which is why we should be even more critical during evaluations spoke Deku. We need heroes that can defeat mysterious beings when they appear not to be taken out by some street thugs. Speaking of which, how are your students coming along? Asked the spectacled worker who has an interest in Hero Academy's progress. Deku's smile widens and when he laughs, the room starts to shake. They are coming along, swimmingly. Silver Fang and I both agree that the upcoming graduating class will be more than ready to join C-Class and even B-Class once they've earned some experience out on the field. Many of the Hero Association officials look at each other in awe, believing that to be great news. The overweight official nods his head in satisfaction. Very good. I and many others will be looking forward to see how the first graduates of Hero Academy shall complete their heroic duties. By the way, it's to my understanding that a person of interest will be taking the exam this time. Bearded worker nods. Yes sir, it hasn't been confirmed yet, but I'm confident that his participation will indeed occur he said while looking at a profile of the person of interest. Who is this person of interest? Asked Deku who looks over the file he has been given and finds the profile of a certain cyborg. The person of interest is Genos. The spectacled worker doesn't miss the familiarity of Deku's tone of voice when speaking about the cyborg. You know of him, Deku. I have. Saved him during the Mosquito Girl incident and he was with me when I apprehended Dr. Genis answered the number one hero, much to everyone's surprise. I agreed to take him on as my student if he passes the hero certification exam. This time, none of the Hero Association officials could hide their surprise for none have ever been given the honor to learn from under the world's strongest man. Even bespectacled worker can't help but be surprised. Are really? Is Genos really that impressive? Asked an official to Izuku's right. If we base on power, then he would be classed as low S class. However, he's young and reckless which has nearly led him to getting himself killed a few times already. Once he passes the hero certification exam, I'll be working on curbing that recklessness of his. If he's as powerful as you say, then wouldn't it be easier to just skip the formality and assign him a hero status? Asked the overweight worker, turning to Deku. The hero association officials nearly jump out of their seats when they see the number one hero, Deku, no longer smiling. In fact, Deku's usual joyous smile has now been replaced with a very stern frown. I believe that nobody should be given such special treatment, no matter who they are said Deku, remembering a former friend of his who had been given special treatment ever since he discovered his quirk. I once had an old friend who is much like Genos, a brilliant individual who can dish out serious explosive firepower. But ever since he was a child, my friend was constantly praised and given special treatment by everyone around him. Izuku can still remember how his teachers from middle school would ignore all the times Bakugo verbally and physically bullet him, even when he used his quirk in public which is illegal. Hopefully, Yue taught him how to properly behave as a hero. My friend was given special treatment because of his abilities and because of that, he became a very arrogant and prideful person, believing himself to be God's gift to the world. I fear if we do the same to Genos or anyone else, they could end up like my old friend and trust me, that is the last thing we need. Bearded worker and bespectacled worker share a glance with each other, having both noticed a saddened tone in the hero's words. Bespectacled worker then turns to Izuku with an understanding gaze. I agree, heroes today are arrogant enough as it is. If we show others special treatment, then that arrogance may grow and fester out of control. Everyone is happy to see Izuku's smile return. Thank you. You all don't need to worry about the possibility of Gino's failing for I believe he'll pass both the written and physical tests with ease. 
Well then, if Deku has faith in Genos then I don't see why we shouldn't encourage bearded worker, getting a few nods from those around the meeting table. If that's all, let us continue to our next agenda. XXX. The day of the hero certification exam finally comes around with Deku and Genos both arriving at Venue 6 which is taking place in a public shelter in City J. Izuku looks around the interior of the massive shelter which has been divided up for each part of the physical exam. This brings back memories said a smiling Deku who recalls the time he took his own hero certification exam. So far, nobody has been able to beat his physical records. By the looks of the candidates today, I don't have to worry about someone toppling my records he thought while looking over the hundreds of candidates who are either idling or performing in one of the several physical tests. Not that Izuku wants to be mean, but he can tell that most, if not all of the candidates aren't suited for the hero life. Most of them are in good physical shape, but they are all wearing flashy costumes to try and stand out of the crowd, probably thinking that they might be able to pass by appearance alone. None have the strength or skill to pass the exam and if they do, they won't live long enough to enjoy their roles as heroes. Wait, is that? That's him, isn't it? The S-Class Rank 1 Hero, Deku. Wow, Mr. Invincible himself has come to see us participate. Deku is cuter in person. Such attention might have embarrassed the Izuku from 10 years back. But he has gotten used to the attention that he gets as the number one hero. With a smile, Izuku waves at the crowd of candidates who cheer or swoon. XXX. To the surprise of no one, Genos manages to pass the hero certification exam with a perfect score in both the physical and written exam. This says I'm now certified as a class S hero Genos told Izuku with both standing in the locker room. The cyborg shrugs his shoulders in disinterest. In the end, I'm sure these rankings mean very little. Izuku who is leaning against a set of lockers snorts over Genos' statement. You'd be surprised by the amount of heroes who would kill to join class S. Genos blinks in confusion. Are the rankings that important? To most heroes, they are. Heroes are constantly trying to one-up each other in the rankings so to get more recognition and fame from the public. The Hero Association also offers higher pay, benefits and access to resources for those who rise high in the ranking. Really, then I'm surprised that there aren't more heroes among Class S they would have access to much wealth and resources remarked a curious Genos. That would be putting it lightly answered Izuku who knows that Child Emperor and Metal Knight use their access to Hero Association resources to build all sorts of dangerous gadgets and robots. As to why more heroes aren't as class, it's because to do so, they need to rise to a class rank 1 in order to be considered for a promotion into S class. Unfortunately, the current a class rank 1 hero has been preventing other heroes from rising to S class. That's why they call him the gatekeeper. I'm actually a little surprised you were allowed into class S for that would only be possible if the gatekeeper granted you permission. This gatekeeper must be strong to keep a hold on their rank like that said Genos. Very strong. If he ever joined S class, he would be considered one of the strongest. Top 5, easily. Genos widens his eyes in surprise. He thought the A class rank 1 hero to be strong, but not that strong. Izuku pushes off the lockers and pats Genos on the shoulder. Enough of that. You've got a briefing to take. Both Genos and Izuku leave the locker room with the number 1 hero leading the cyborg towards the lecture hall. Both notice how empty the shelter is now, meaning that a lot of the candidates have gone home after failing to pass the exam. Both stop in front of Lecture Hall 3 where Genos is supposed to be given his briefing. Briefing shouldn't take too long so I'll wait out here for you said Izuku. Genos nods before stepping into the Lecture Hall. The cyborg is surprised to see that the Lecture Hall is empty, except for the man in an oddly designed suit who is standing by the podium. Genos guesses that the man is the hero who is supposed to brief him. You've arrived. It's about time. Now, sit down so I can get this briefing underway said the A-class hero, Snack. Genos takes a seat in the front of the row of desks and folds his arms while staring at the hero. Congratulations on passing. To be honest, I am surprised that you passed at all so unless you want your luck to go to waste, I better see you giving it your all told snack before pointing at Genos. And don't get cocky, got it? Keep your hero certified status in mind and from here on out, I expect you to act modestly. After all, your face is going to be placed on the main page of the Hero Association website. Genos's uncaring stare is quick to annoy snack. Did you hear me? Your stupid face is going to be seen by the whole world. If you don't want to humiliate yourself, Snek jumps onto the podium and begins showing off his biting snake fist martial art to the newcomer. Snek finishes off his showcasing by posing in a martial art stance. Aspire to be an extinguished hero like me. Genos continues to coldly stare at Snek, making the A-class hero feel stupid after showing off his skills like that. That is until he hears clapping by the doorway. Bravo. That was an impressive show of skill congratulated Deku who claps after witnessing Snek's martial art moves. Upon recognizing the strongest hero, Snek ends up being paralyzed, due to a mixture of awe, embarrassment and fear. I it's D Deku. 
thought the A class rank 38 hero who realizes that Deku just saw him show off to the rookie hero. If I'm not mistaken, that martial arts style is biting Snake Fist, right? Asked Deku, recognizing the movements of said fighting style. Snek manages to recover from his paralysis so to answer the S-class rank 1 hero. I it is, sir. Izuku laughs and waves his hand. None of that sir business. You can just call me Deku or Izuku, whichever works for you. Deku turns to Genos who has been patiently waiting in his seat. You ready to go, Genos? Yes, sensei. Answered Genos who stands up and follows Izuku out of the lecture hall. Now alone, Snek feels all his strength leave him and collapses to the floor on his back. But with a smile on his face, he said I can call him Izuku. Are you sure about this? Asked Izuku as he and Gino's face off against each other in the middle of an abandoned quarry. Not long after Gino's joined the hero registry and earned his S-class status, the cyborg had gotten new mechanical upgrades installed onto his body to boost both his power and performance. Soon after, the cyborg asked Izuku to spar with him to test out his new upgrades and seeing no reason not to, Izuku accepted with the goal to teach his student a lesson on how to be an official hero. Hence, why they are in the middle of an abandoned quarry which is miles away from any civilization so they don't have to worry about injuring any civilians or causing any unnecessary property damage. I am confirmed Genos with a confident nod. Sensei, thank you for agreeing to my odd request. I appreciate it. I wouldn't be allowed to call myself a teacher if I didn't teach my student anything chuckled Izuku who begins to stretch his arms and legs to loosen up his muscle. It's not often that he gets to spar due to his busy schedule. So how do you want to do this? I want you to go all out. Izuku pauses while in the middle of stretching his left leg. Excuse me. I want you to go all out and in return. I will do the same said Genos who takes a battle stance while his mechanical body heats itself up in preparation for the fight with the strongest hero in the world. Please, sensei. No. The quick and straightforward answer causes Genos to look at Izuku in surprise. Please, sensei. If I am to learn, I must test myself against you at your strongest. Now finished with his stretches, Izuku pushes himself up and stares at his student from across the quarry. Genos, I will be completely honest with you. If I were to fight you while using my full power, you would die. Carnage Kebuto didn't last more than a few seconds when I used 100% of my power and I believe that doing so was overkill. Not only did he defeat you, but he did so easily and I doubt your recent upgrades would have made much of a difference. Genos widens his eyes and is quick to note that his sensei didn't say that out of arrogance, but with full confidence. As much as Izuku's blunt words hurt, Genos looks down at his clenched right fist, knowing that his sensei is right. Sensei is correct. Whereas he defeated Kebuto with ease, I couldn't so much as leave a scratch on that monster. Izuku knows that he might have been a little harsh, but he needs to curb Genos' recklessness before it gets him killed. I want you to go all out and show me what you can do. In return, I will judge you on your fighting skills and point out on how you can improve them. While disappointed that he won't be facing his sensei at full power, Genos nods in understanding and takes his fighting stance again while also powering up his mechanical body. From underneath Genos' sleeveless white shirt, Izuku can see the ports on the cyborg's chest glow a bright orange due to the heat building up in Genos' body. The same glow can also be seen from the gaps in Genos' recently upgraded mechanical arms, the anti-Deku tactical arms. Without giving Izuku a warning, the boosters on Genos' shoulders erupt in a detonation of heat and flame that propels the cyborg forward while he thrusts his right leg out to kick the number one hero. A small spark of emerald lightning bounces off Deku's muscular body, showing that he is now using his full cowl technique. Seeing Genos' flying dropkick a mile away, Deku leans back in a perfect 90-degree angle to dodge the cyborg who flies overhead, missing his kick. Realizing that he missed, Genos uses the cannon on his right palm to slow down his momentum before he uses both palms to force himself into a spin and throws a spin kick at the back of Deku's head. With his back turned to Genos, most would expect the kick to land, but because of one of Izuku's various quirks, he senses the incoming kick and ducks at the last second to avoid it. The quirk that Izuku just used is a useful one called Danger Sense which he inherited from the fourth user of One for All. It allows him to detect any potential threats in the surrounding area thus giving him the opportunity to properly react to any attacks, even those that he can't see. When amplified with one for all, Danger Sense allows Izuku to detect threats for miles, although the sharp stabbing pain that he gets whenever detecting a threat can be annoying. Undeterred, Genos uses his boosters to fly around his sensei in a random pattern to confuse him before he propels himself high up into the air with his right leg raised up high for an axe kick. The cyborg then activates his boosters again to launch himself back down at Deku to increase the power in his axe kick which he connects on his sensei. The result of Genos's axe kick causes the ground to explode from the force with rocks and dust being thrown into the air. 
However, the cloud of dust quickly disperses because of a small shockwave that occurs in the middle of the dust cloud. With the cloud of dust no longer blocking their sight, Genos can be seen with his shaking right leg pressing down on Deku's left arm which he used to block the axe kick, leaving him unharmed. While Izuku received no damage to Genos' axe kick, the force of the blow still manages to sink Izuku's legs into the floor of the crater. Noticing how Deku's legs are now stuck in the ground, Genos sees an opening and presses his other foot on Deku's blocking arm to kick off it. Backflipping away to a safe distance, Genos aims his right arm at the number one hero. Genos' fist and forearm open up, revealing several cannons which are glowing with energy. All the cannons fire and the gathered power from each cannon combines to shoot a powerful beam. Still smiling, Izuku disappears from the crater, dodging the beam which instead hits the cliff behind him, resulting in an explosion of flames and flying melting rock which can be heard for over a mile. Izuku appears several feet away from where he once stood and looks over the smoking crater and the cliff. Impressive. Your beams were powerful before, but they acted more like strong flamethrowers. Now, they fire like an actual laser complimented Izuku who is hoping to someday meet the scientist who made the upgrades, Dr. Kusino. Genos releases the breath he has been holding. Damn, I need more speed thought the cyborg who then slams his palms on the molten floor. The power in Genos' body drastically increases as heat gathers in his booster while electricity is bouncing off his mechanical hands. The rise in power isn't missed by Izuku who focuses his attention on Genos who begins to levitate. Then all of a sudden, the ground shatters as Genos disappears in a burst of speed that he couldn't perform before getting his anti-Deku tactical arms upgrade. Deku disappears as well, easily matching Genos' improved speeds. The pair of them move across the quarry at speeds that make them invisible to the human eye. The only reason anyone would notice their presence is because of the craters that are popping up across the quarry, as well as the occasional shockwaves that occur whenever Izuku and Genos clash. Clenching his teeth in annoyance, Genos chases after his fleeing sensei and unleashes a barrage of punches at Izuku with each punch dodged effortlessly by Izuku. Every punch that Genos misses makes a new crater in either the floor or in the face of a cliff. Spotting his sensei stopping in midair by the cliff, Genos takes his chance and throws a barrage of punches at him. The resulting blows destroy the face of a cliff and leaves behind a large crater. While in midair and facing the large crater he just made in the cliff, Genos pulls back his fist for another punch, but stops once he notices that Deku has completely vanished from view. He is gone. How can Sensei move so fast? Thought Genos who then uses his hyper sensors to scan his surrounding environment for Deku. Sensei is, above me, too slow, Genos, before the cyborg can react. A black whip suddenly wraps itself around Genos from above, trapping his arms to his torso. Looking up, Genos sees his floating sensei smiling down at him with the black whip protruding from his left palm. Just as Genos is about to use his boosters to try and escape his sensei's grasp, Izuku pulls the black whip over his head while taking Genos for the ride and then flicks it downwards, throwing Genos straight down to the floor. The floor cracks and bursts once Genos collides into it. Izuku lands back on the cracked ground and looks into the cloud of dust where he threw Genos. You ready to call it quits? He asked, but by the orange glow he can see from inside the cloud of dust. Izuku guesses that the answer is a resounding no. With both of his fists now connected together, Genos's forearms and fists open up to reveal over a dozen cannons, each glowing orange as they all gather energy from his core. Incinerate! exclaimed Genos before firing a much more powerful beam that vaporizes everything in front of him. While impressed with the powerful beam of destruction, Deku decides to take it head-on instead of dodging it. Izuku aims his left hand at the incoming beam with his middle finger pulled back for a flick and brimming with the power of one for all. With a smile, Izuku flicks his finger and the power placed in the flick unleashes a thin, but powerful beam of pressurized air which flies towards Genos's beam. Due to his beam being so large and wide, Genos can't see Deku flick his finger, because if he did, he might have remembered him using the same move against Carnage Kebuto after the monster blew away Genos's beam of fire. Deku's concentrated beam of pressurized air collides into Genos's more widespread beam. But instead of fighting in a clash for power, the pressurized air pierces through Genos's beam, dispersing it in all directions in the process. Once Genos's beam has been completely dispersed, the pressurized air then flies over the cyborg's right shoulder, just enough distance away from causing any damage to his mechanical body, but close enough to rip the upper right side of Genos's shirt. With wide eyes, Genos attempts to comprehend how his most powerful attack was just countered. But he then sees that Deku is now standing right in front of him, having moved so fast that it seems like he just teleported. The cyborg attempts to attack, but when Izuku pulls his clenched fist back for an obvious punch, Genos is hit with a strange and terrifying foreboding feeling that paralyzes him. It's a feeling that reminds Genos of when someone is dropped into the freezing waters of a raging river and no matter how hard they try to fight the current, it still drags them away. 
It's only when Gino's witnesses Deku throw his fist, which almost seems to have grown immensely in size, does the cyborg realize what the foreboding feeling is. Death. As much as Gino's wants to dodge or counter the incoming punch, he knows that nothing he does will save him. He's too slow to dodge it, he's too weak to counter it and he knows that an attempt to block the punch will only lead to a swift and hopefully painless death. Maybe that's why Gino's doesn't attempt to resist, because he has already realized the futility in resisting his upcoming death. However, Gino's is given mercy, since Deku stops his punch just an inch away from Gino's's face. For a moment, nothing seems to happen until a powerful gust of wind blows into Gino's's face who barely manages to keep himself on his feet. Once the powerful winds have subsided, Gino's looks at Deku with a bewildered expression on his face, uncaring about how the wind made by Sensei's punch has blown his hair back, making it look spikier than normal. Not bad, Gino's. Not bad at all praised Izuku who pulls his arm back, watching as the cyborg seems to relax once the offending appendage has been removed from his face. Compliments to Dr. Cusino. The upgrades he made on your body is very impressive. You're stronger, faster and your incinerator cannons have been greatly improved. However, you are still too reckless, especially when things don't go your way stated Izuku. Sensei, Gino's asked. You are quick to attack and while it's good to be quick on the draw, sometimes you need to take a step back and analyze your opponent for any weaknesses. You had rushed in during the encounter with Carnage Kabuto. And if not for him not taking you seriously, he would have killed you in an instant told Izuku. Knowing that Carnage Kebuto was simply playing with Genos during their encounter with him at the House of Evolution. If you fought another monster as strong as Carnage Kebuto, they might be more willing to fight you more seriously. And that would spell the end of you. Genos nods, understanding that he needs to be careful when fighting his next opponents. I've also noticed that you are quick to get frustrated when your attacks don't connect. Remain calm when fighting, because getting angry in the middle of a fight might just be what kills you in the end. Another thing I want to point out is your weaponry. Genos looks at his sensei in surprise. My weaponry. Yes, I noticed that all your weaponry focuses on the absolute destruction of your enemy said Izuku. Genos nods in confirmation. Of course, with more destructive power, I can deal greater damage to my enemies. I can understand that. But what if you were caught in a situation where your destructive weaponry was made useless? Asked Deku, curious over how Genos would handle such a situation. Genos looks at Izuku like as if he asked him something crazy. How could my weapons be made useless? Asked the cyborg, curiously. What if you were fighting a mysterious being and they took an innocent civilian hostage? How would you save that civilian? Asked Izuku, folding his muscular arms across his equally muscular chest. Genos opens his mouth to answer, but no words come out. Genos may be intelligent, but he honestly has no idea on how to save the civilian, since he obviously cannot use his incinerator cannons with the mysterious being holding a hostage. I, I do not know, Sensei. Forgive me apologize Genos, looking down in defeat. Izuku merely laughs and pats Genos on the shoulder, not noticing that his gentle pats are slightly denting the cyborg's shoulder. There is nothing to forgive. You wanted to become my student to learn so learn you shall. Having the firepower to eliminate mysterious beings is great and all, but there's more to being a hero than simply fighting monsters. Most tend to forget that. You must be ready to save lives at a moment's notice, either it be by defeating monsters or by rescuing civilians from a collapsed building caused by a natural disaster. Genos looks up at Deku with complete admiration. I didn't realize that hero work was more than fighting monsters. Sensei really is amazing. A groaning sound interrupts the thoughts of the two heroes who both look down at Deku's stomach which is groaning in protest. Izuku blushes in embarrassment and laughs. It seems like the spar made me hungry. Let's go and get something to eat, my treat. As Izuku turns and walks towards the closest city of the quarry, Genos feels a draft from behind him so he turns around and what he sees makes him widen his eyes in awe and fear. The cliff behind Genos is now a massive trench which reaches all the way to the other side and the cyborg doesn't fail to notice how the overhead clouds look to have been split in half. Genos thought he had a good grasp on understanding Deku's strength, but seeing as how the winds blown from one of Sensei's punches destroyed a large cliff and split the clouds, it makes the cyborg rethink on what he knows about Sensei's strength. I am fully prepared to do anything in order to become stronger, but I cannot picture myself ever approaching Sensei's power. Not even close thought Genos while staring at the massive trench in the cliff. The cyborg turns back to look at the back of Izuku Midoriya who is walking away. He's on a different level. No wonder he is the world's strongest hero. XXX. After returning to civilization, Izuku and Genos stop in front of an Udon noodle restaurant. Since neither of the heroes are picky, they decide to try it and so, Izuku walks over and slides the door open. Walking in, Izuku looks around and finds the restaurant to be small, but comfy in appearance. With it being so late, it appears to be mostly empty with only two high school girls sitting at a table and a middle-aged couple sitting by the counter where the chef is working. 
Excuse us, table for two. He asked while Gino's closes the door behind them. Welcome, come on in and take a seat and he spoke the chef who looks up from what he's doing to see who are his next customers, only to stop and stare with wide eyes upon recognizing the large man to be none other than the S-Class Rank 1 hero, Deku. Why you're D Deku gasped the chef, pointing a very shaky finger at the one nicknamed Mr. Invincible, the world's strongest hero, in his restaurant. Of course, the chef's gasp captures the attention of everyone else in the restaurant who all turn to see the number one hero, Deku, standing before them. The high school girls shriek in obvious excitement, alongside the wife of the middle-aged couple. Oh my god, it's Deku. I can't believe it's actually him. Oh my. While the husband might not be happy that his wife of 30 years is ogling somebody else, he'll give her a pass since it's Deku. Izuku chuckles over the excitement and waves at the citizens before turning his gaze to the chef. So we can take a seat anywhere. The gaping chef mindlessly nods before regaining control of himself. Oh of course, take a seat anywhere you want told the chef, waving an arm towards the seats in his small restaurant. Nodding with a smile, Deku takes a seat at a table that's two tables down from where the high school girls are sitting. Once sitting down, the pair of S-class heroes look over the menu while ignoring the stares from the other occupants of the restaurant. What is it you are having, sensei? Asked Gino's while looking over the menu. Izuku hums as he looks for something appetizing, but a sign hanging over the counter catches his attention. Super spicy mega monster yudon challenge, he said, reading the sign. By the looks of it, it's an eating challenge made up by the chef and beside the sign are pictures of people who had managed to complete the challenge. I'll be having the super spicy mega monster yudon he answered, folding up his menu. Very well. I will have the same as you, sensei told Gino's, folding his own menu. Once they've put down their menus, the chef is quick to come to their side. Are you ready to order? He asked, attempting to not look nervous while in front of the number one hero. We would like two super spicy mega monster yudons and two colas, please said Izuku while giving the shocked chef their menus. It turns out that making the challenge takes nearly half an hour and Izuku can't help but laugh when he sees the chef serve them their noodles in blue bucket, showing the hero that the challenge isn't just difficult because the yudon noodles are very spicy, but also because they are given a large amount of the noodles. After thanking the chef, Izuku takes a whiff of the yudon noodles and feels his mouth water over the smell. Bottoms up. He exclaimed into the shock and amazement of everyone watching. Izuku lifts the bucket and begins downing the noodles in one go. Gino's watches for a moment before shrugging his shoulders and copies his sensei by gulping down the spicy noodles without any trouble. After a couple of seconds, Izuku places the now empty bucket onto the table and sighs in satisfaction. After training his body to be as large as it is now, he requires a lot of food to satisfy his stomach, as well as keep up his muscle mass. The super spicy mega monster yudon was perfect to satisfy his stomach. That was delicious he complimented, making the chef blush over the praise. Did you see that? He ate all those noodles in one go whispered one of the high school students in awe. That's the number one hero for you answered the other girl, although she sounds just as shocked as the other. Gino's places his own bucket down after finishing his noodles and simply sighs in satisfaction. As Izuku drinks his cola, the chef returns with a camera on hand. Mr. D. Deku, I hope you don't mind if I take a picture of you. I usually take a picture of anyone who completes the super spicy mega monster yudon challenge and place it on the wall. Of course, it's up to you. I don't mind one bit answered Izuku who sits back and smiles as the chef takes his picture. The chef also takes a picture of Gino's, seeing as he has also completed the challenge. Thank you and if I'm not pushing it, could I please have an autograph? It's for my son asked the chef, hoping that he's not pushing his luck. As a hero who makes time for his fans, Izuku nods and takes out a pen from one of his suit's pockets. No problem. What is it you want me to sign? Quickly checking himself for anything, the chef offers Izuku his notepad that he uses to write down customer orders. Taking the notepad, Izuku signs his name before offering it back to the chef who looks at the autograph like as if it was signed by God himself. It's not the first time someone has looked at his autograph with that expression and it will definitely not be the last. I bet I made the same face when I first got All Might's autograph he thought with a silent chuckle, remembering how excited he was to get the autograph of the number one hero, All Might. Izuku's is shaken out of his thoughts when the two high school girls and the middle-aged wife come up to him with excited smiles. D. Deku, you are just the best. Could I please get an autograph as well? Asked one of the high school girls who appears to be doing everything in her power not to collapse in embarrassment. That's no problem at all. What would you like me to sign? After giving three more autographs and taking a few selfies, everyone returns to their tables. Izuku downs the rest of his cola and sighs in satisfaction. But he turns to the door when he hears it open and slightly widens his eyes when he recognizes the man who walks into the restaurant. Welcome, said any said the chef who gasps once he recognizes another famous face walking into his restaurant. 
Said person ignores the stares and gasps from the civilians and walks over to the table Izuku and Genos are sitting. He stops by the table and smiles down at the pair with his hands still in his pockets. You must be Genos. I'm Sweet Mask. Class of rank 1 introduced the now revealed hero, Sweet Mask. Sweet Mask is a tall, lean-built handsome young man with messy, shoulder-length light blue hair and yellow eyes. He is wearing a white jacket over a gray shirt with a green circle necklace and a pair of black trousers. Izuku isn't surprised to see Sweet Mask, having suspected that he would be coming to welcome Genos and to speak with him about taking his job as a hero seriously. After all, Genos wouldn't have been allowed to rise up to S-Class so quickly unless Sweet Mask allowed it. Many heroes have attempted to rise up to S-Class, but to do so, they must first earn the A-Class Rank 1 title, but none have managed to take it from the monster that is Sweet Mask. Sweet Mask has done such a good job on preventing heroes from joining Class S that he has been given the unofficial title of Gatekeeper. Deku is on friendly terms with Sweet Mask, having worked with him on a few occasions, either it be from fighting mysterious beings or when working on a collaboration to advertising hero memorabilia. While Izuku isn't aware of the entirety of Sweet Mask's strength, Izuku believes without any shadow of a doubt that Sweet Mask is more than strong enough to join S Class, but he remains as the top ranked hero in class so he can keep the so called weaklings out of Class S while Izuku doesn't agree with Sweet Mask calling fellow heroes weaklings. He does agree that only the best heroes should be allowed to join S-Class. S-Class heroes are expected to fight and defeat dragon level threats and only the strongest of them can do that. Sweet Mask, I was expecting you to give Genos a visit, sooner or later said Izuku, smiling at the famous hero. While Izuku may be officially the top ranked hero in the world without question, he is constantly fighting Sweet Mask over the number one spot for most popular hero. Sweet Mask is the most popular celebrity in the world after all so it isn't easy. Sweet Mask turns to Izuku and his smile seems to widen. Deku, it's always a pleasure to meet the world's beautiful symbol of justice complimented the A-Class hero in complete honesty. As the gatekeeper, he has stopped many unworthy heroes from reaching S-Class status, hence why he rebuffs them when they attempt to take his spot as the A-Class rank 1 hero. There are even some S-Class heroes who Sweet Mask believes don't deserve their ranks, such as Puri Puri Prisoner and Metal Bat. However, there is one true hero who he sees as the perfect representation of what a hero should aspire to be and that's none other than the number one hero himself, Deku. What is it you want? Asked Genos, being as blunt as usual when it comes to speaking with people. If Sweet Mask is offended, he doesn't show it and instead, turns back to Genos with a smile. Could we speak for a moment? Seeing no reason why they can't, Genos turns to Izuku. I shall return, Sensei. I'll be here answered Deku, waving the cyborg off who follows Sweet Mask outside. Within five minutes, Genos returns and sits back down with a thoughtful expression. Hope he didn't come off too strong. Sweet Mask takes hero work more seriously than others said Izuku, having an idea on what Sweet Mask wanted to speak with Genos about. It is fine, Sensei. He was simply welcoming me to the Hero Association answered Genos. Izuku nods before reaching for his wallet. Okay then, we should head off. It's late and I'd like to get some sleep he said before placing the payment for the noodles, as well as a generous tip for the chef. Thanks for the food. Oh of course, please come again. City Z. A week has passed by in blissful silence, much to Izuku's relief. With no dragon level monsters causing havoc in any of the cities, Izuku is given more time to focus his energy on his duties as principal to the Hero Academy, specifically, completing his paperwork. At the moment, Izuku is walking through City Z so he can do some shopping, as his apartment is in dire need of food. As someone who is seven foot tall and packed with muscle, he needs to eat four times the normally recommended amount of food every day to keep his muscle mass and fill him with energy. Hence, shopping for food tends to be expensive, but seeing as he is the S-Class Rank 1 hero, he is given more than enough money from the Hero Association to pay the bill. Walking through the busy streets of City Z, Izuku tugs the hood of his green hoodie down to hide more of his hair and face. So far, it looks like he doesn't have to worry about anyone recognizing him. At least, that's until he hears a woman's voice from behind him which is followed by someone grabbing him by his left shoulder. That's the guy. He looks very suspicious and dangerous said a young woman, pointing at the disguised Izuku Midori. She had noticed the large and dangerous looking man purposely trying to keep his face hidden, which she found very suspicious. Thinking that he is some kind of criminal, she had alerted a nearby hero to deal with him. Hey, buddy, what do you think you're doing? Izuku turns around and sees that the person who grabbed his shoulder is a large muscular man who has tiger stripes running through his hair and eyebrows. He also wears a tiger striped tank top, which signifies him as the C-class hero, Tank Top Tiger who is a member of the Tank Topper Army, one of the largest and strongest factions in the Hero Association which is led by the S-class rank 14 hero, Tank Top Master. 
Izuku has a lot of respect for his fellow S-class hero, tank top master who he knows is a chivalrous and humble hero, which is sadly uncommon among the current heroes. To make sure that the next generation of heroes become more humble than the current generation, Izuku specifically has the students in Hero Academy learn how to not be a victim of their own arrogance. Last thing the world needs are more arrogant heroes with explosive personalities, like his former friend, Katsuki Bakugo. As much as Izuku respects Tank Top Master, he can't help but be baffled over how Tank Top Master believes he gains power from wearing tank tops of all things. Still, Tank Top Master is S-class for a reason and is more than deserving of his rank not just for his strength, but for also commanding the Tank Topper Army. Although Izuku has heard rumors that some heroes of the Tank Topper Army are prone to being arrogant and rude. Are you deaf? I said. What do you think you're doing? Looking all suspicious demanded Tank Top Tiger, glaring at the hooded man. Izuku stares at the hero and blinks, realizing that Tank Top Tiger doesn't recognize him. As much as he doesn't like to sound arrogant, none of the C-class heroes would dare talk down to him if they knew who he was. I think this is a simple misunderstanding. Misunderstanding, huh? Don't think you can weasel your way out of this remark Tank Top Tiger in an aggressive manner. The confrontation isn't missed by the civilians who watch in awe, recognizing the C-Class Rank 6 hero, Tank Top Tiger. Look, isn't that Tank Top Tiger? I can't believe it, it is Tank Top Tiger. No way. Awesome, he's the real deal. Tank Top Tiger soaks up the attention and praise from the public. Even Class C heroes get recognized. Well if they're in the top 10 anyway said the hero before he gets into Izuku's face. Well how about it? You want to fight and make me look good in the process? Asked the C-class hero in a smug tone. Exploding shuriken. Izuku feels a pulse of pain in the back of his head which tells him that his danger sense quirk is detecting a nearby threat. Moving quickly, Izuku grabs Tank Top Tiger by his shoulders and as easily as lifting a feather, he lifts the muscular hero off the ground and moves him to the right so Izuku can use his own body to protect his fellow hero. The trio of thrown shuriken which was meant for the C-class hero instead swerves towards Izuku and detonate upon hitting Izuku's muscular back, engulfing the upper half of his body in smoke. What the? muttered Tank Top Tiger in surprise. Due to being caught off guard by the surprise attack and the fact that the stranger just took the attack for him. The class C hero may not be smart like Tank Top Doctor, but he isn't blind. You took that hit for me. He stated in disbelief, wondering why the hooded man would do that for him. From inside the small cloud of smoke, a deep chuckle erupts and many feel a tingle of excitement when they recognize it from the many online videos that showcase a certain hero. Of course, after all, it is my duty as a hero. From the smoke, a muscular man with curly green hair and glowing emerald eyes emerge with a wide smile on his face, unharmed by the explosive shurikens, yet now shirtless because his hoodie and shirt was destroyed by the explosions. Not that anyone is complaining, obviously. Everyone recognizes who the man is and while his appearance brings hope and excitement to the nearby civilian, Tank Top Tiger instead feels his blood turn ice cold once he realizes that he was talking smack to the number one hero of all people. Do not fear, for Deku is here, bellowed the shirtless hero while flexing his powerful muscles to the crowd, much to their pleasure. Izuku turns around to find that the source of the explosive shurikens is none other than the villain, Speedo Sound Sonic who is wearing a black shirt, pants and has a sheathed sword tied to his waist. You again said Izuku in more relief than surprise. At least I know now that I didn't kill him. I've finally found you, Deku. Today is the day we settle our score told Sonic whose hand slowly reaches for the hilt of his sword. The ninja had suffered a humiliating defeat by the hands of the hero during the Paradisers incident and he for one can't accept that. He needs to make things even and he can only do that by defeating and killing the man that's nicknamed the Invincible Man. Deku takes in his surroundings, not liking the idea of fighting Sonic in the middle of the street with so many people in the area. Tank Top Tiger, I need you to evacuate everyone from the surrounding area, now. Gulping, the C-Class Rank 6 hero nods, knowing that he's likely on thin ice with the S-Class Rank 1 hero so the last thing he wants is to annoy him further. Alright he nodded before turning to the watching civilians. You heard the man. Get your butts moving and get out of here. That's all the civilians need to hear before they begin to run away with Tank Top Tiger moving to follow after them. However, the C-Class hero widens his eyes when the villain suddenly appears before him with the sword already in mid-swing, aiming to remove his head from his shoulders. I can't dodge, thought Tank Top Tiger who widens his eyes in horror, knowing that he's about to get killed and he can't do anything to save himself. Luckily for him, Sonic's sword shatters into a hundred pieces after being punched by Deku who appears before him in an instant forcing Sonic to disappear again and reappear a few feet away. A sweaty and shaking tank top tiger collapses onto his hands and knees while looking down at the ground. If it wasn't for Deku, I would be dead right now he thought in terrifying realization. Taking down thieves and fighting tiger-level monsters with his tank top brethren is a lot different than facing someone who can move much faster than he can react. Don't let this put you down, tank top tiger. 
Blinking, Tank Top Tiger looks up from the floor to see Deku smiling at him from over his shoulder. W what? Every hero has felt the sting of defeat at some point in their lives, including myself. That's why we must learn from our defeats to improve ourselves so we can become better heroes. Learn from this defeat. Tank Top Tiger and strive to become a better hero advised Deku before turning back to Sonic. Deku's advice and actions strikes a chord with Tank Top Tiger who looks down at the floor in shame. Deku saved his life not once, but twice, even after he talked down to the disguised number one hero. His pride made him look like a fool in front of Deku and he only has himself to blame. I shame the tank top I'm wearing, thought tank top tiger who pushes himself up to his feet and runs away, knowing that he will only get in Deku's way if he stays. Speedo sound Sonic looks at the hilt of his destroyed sword in surprise, wondering how Deku could shatter his sharpened steel with just a single punch. My sword should have taken his hand off so why did it shatter? Thought Sonic while he sheathes his destroyed blade and glares at the hero. Is his fist truly stronger than steel? As someone who has been punched across the sky with that same fist, Sonic is willing to believe that. Stand down, Sonic. Don't make this harder than it should be ordered Deku. Having noticed that there are still a few stragglers in the area. If a fight does break out, they could get caught in the crossfire. Sonic isn't someone who's easily intimidated. But when he looks at Deku who has a smile that doesn't reach his eyes, he feels an invisible force press down on him, as if warning him that attempting anything will lead to serious consequences. The uncomfortable feeling is quashed and Sonic hides his discomfort with a cocky smirk. Oh, is that a threat? He asked, noticing Deku's eyes look to the few civilians who are still in the area. An idea springs to mind. Sonic disappears and reappears high in the air, seemingly gliding in the air before he throws a handful of exploding shuriken down at Deku. Hail of carnage, Deku tenses up, preparing to deal with the incoming shuriken, only to be surprised when they all suddenly venture off in different directions, hitting the nearby buildings and causing rubble to fall down on the street where some civilians still remain. A specifically large piece of rubble nearly lands on a woman who tripped while fleeing, but Deku uses a black whip to knock the rubble away. Deku looks back up at the villain who is still throwing exploding shuriken. Face me, Deku. Can you defeat me and save them from their deaths? exclaimed Sonic while throwing more exploding shurikens all over the area with a sinister smirk on his face. Deku is about to jump up to put down the villain, but an explosion from one of the shurikens manages to toss a car in the air, and the hero notices the car is heading towards a crying child who is walking in the middle of the street. Deku activates full cowl and is about to move to save the kid, but it turns out that he isn't needed. I've got you kid, exclaimed Tank Top Tiger, having grabbed the child and jumped away from the flying car before it could hit them. Rolling forward while keeping his arms around the child to protect him, Tank Top Tiger rolls to his feet with the child still in his arms. Come on, let's get out of here said the C-class hero who runs in the opposite direction of the explosion. That honestly did surprise Deku, having expected Tank Top Tiger to have fled for safety along with most of the civilians. Instead, it turns out that he had stuck around to help evacuate those who couldn't and he had even risked his own life to save a kid from the flying car. Those actions speak of a different tank top tiger from just a few minutes ago. Someone's due for a promotion thought Deku who then focuses his attention back on Sonic who has run out of explosive shuriken. What, not coming? Then I'll come to you, shouted Sonic, moving to attack Deku since it looks like the number one hero isn't coming to him. Again, the invisible force emerges and presses down on him. Only this time, the pressure is a hundred times more powerful than before. This actually causes the villain to falter while still in midair as he tries to breathe while under the unseen force. What is this feeling? Thought Sonic while struggling to breathe. Noticing something glowing at the edge of his vision, Sonic looks over his shoulder and widens his eyes in horror. Hovering above the gliding villain is the hero, Deku who had managed to appear above him without him noticing. While making a note of that, Sonic is more worried about how Deku is covered in a shroud of energy that looks like a mix of emerald flames and lightning. The hero's now spiky hair is also blocking the sun from reaching the upper half of Deku's face, covering it in a shadow, not that it hides the two glowing green eyes that are glaring into Sonic's soul. However, such overwhelming speed and power isn't what fills the villain with dread. No, it's the lack of a smile on Deku's face which manages to frighten Sonic more than anything else and he doesn't even know why. Not that he is given any longer to think about it, because Deku throws a punch into Sonic's left cheek. Upon contact with Deku's fist and Sonic's cheek, a shockwave of massive proportion occurs which shatters the windows of every building in a 10-mile radius. The shockwave also causes the entirety of City Z to shake, as if it's being hit by an earthquake and the sky which was once relatively filled with white fluffy clouds is now perfectly clear. The moment Sonic's cheek meets with Deku's fist, the villain falls into unconsciousness, even before he is rocketed down into the pavement. Deku lowers himself to the edge of the crater that he put Sonic in and once he sees the unconscious villain stuck in the crater, Deku cancels out his full cowl. 
giving the surrounding area a quick look over to check out the damage. Izuku winces when he notices the shattered windows of every building in the area, knowing that he did that. I'm gonna have to pay for that muttered the hero who takes responsibility for every piece of damage he does to public property. Hero Association Headquarters Control Room In the control room, there are only three Hero Association employees who are each sitting at a console, including bearded worker who is sitting on the main console which overlooks the floor below it where the two console operators are stationed. At the moment, they are discussing the arrest made by Deku a couple days ago. The man apprehended by Deku the other day in City Z is suspected to being involved in several heinous crimes, including assassination told the male operator while looking over the holographic screen in front of him. Bearded worker who has his own holographic screen open looks over the data and image of the villain, Speedo Sound Sonic who is now the newest resident of the Smelly Lid Prison, home of the S-Class Rank 16 hero, Puri Puri Prisoner. City Z again, ha. Huh. Side bearded worker who looks down at a piece of paper which is made up of graphs which show that monsters have been appearing in City Z a lot more often. What's the status of the investigation I requested? You mean the one for the ghost town? Asked the female console operator who is already in the middle of bringing up the information onto her holographic screen. Yes answered bearded worker. Let me see. Muttered the female operator before another holographic screen appears, showcasing the required information about the requested investigation. It appears that an official inquiry has been submitted she answered while reading off the screen which reveals that the two class heroes, Golden Ball and Spring Mustachio have been assigned to investigate City Z. Well, doesn't that sound ever so interesting? Want me to check it out? Asked a smiling tornado of terror. Tatsumaki who is leaning against bearded workers console while keeping herself in the air by using her telekinetic powers. Tornado, how did you get in here? Asked a surprised bearded worker who nearly jumps out of his chair, due to surprise. He never even seen her enter the room. Tatsumaki pushes off the console so she can stand upright in the air. Why, aren't I allowed here? She asked, losing her smile. Of course, for City Z, the investigation is just a formality, it's not worth your time explained bearded worker. Turns out, that was the wrong thing to say to the S-Class Rank 2 hero who misinterprets the man's words. What? The Asper's temper rises which causes her psychokinetic powers to shake the room and levitate some small items, such as bearded worker's coffee cup. Luckily for bearded worker, the female console operator walks up to the upper level with a smile, seemingly unafraid of Tatsumaki's rising power and temper. That's not it. The association decided this was not a class S matter. That's all she explained, walking over to bearded worker's side. Yes, exactly right confirmed bearded worker, thankful for the help. Tatsumaki glares at the two for a moment before she turns her nose away from them while also stopping her rising power. You better tell me if you find anything that looks like it can fight warned Tatsumaki, pointing a finger at bearded worker before she flies to the door. She then turns to glare at the two employees again. It would be much faster if I just went myself. You guys are idiots she insulted before the automatic door slides shut, much to bearded worker's relief. She's lively, isn't she? Giggled the console operator. She's just bored. There's not exactly a lot of monsters out there that can last more than a second against her side bearded work, knowing that Tatsumaki usually wouldn't dare lead something as simple as an investigation. But since there's no dragon level threats that require her assistance, she has nothing else to do. I wish Deku was here to keep her in line. We couldn't exactly ask the number one hero to babysit Tatsumaki giggled the female operator. If only side bearded worker in disappointment. Hero Association, Meeting Room. At the same time, there is a meeting occurring among ten executives of the Hero Association within the meeting room which is only being lit by the large holographic table where all the executives are sitting around. Leading the meeting is the executive, Sekinger who is standing at the end of the holographic table so he can easily go over the meeting's main agenda which is about the report submitted by the heroes who supervise an assigned city that is being investigated. Some of the executives who are taking part in the meeting include Executive Girl, the Spectacled Worker and the Minister Officer of Justice, Sitch. Reports have come in from each location being investigated told Sekinger who places his phone on the holographic table which automatically synchronizes together, uploading the contents of Sekinger's phone onto the holographic table so everyone can see the reports submitted by the heroes. Once all reports have been successfully uploaded to the holographic table, a hologram of a young-looking man wearing a full-body dog suit appears floating above the table. First is Watchdog Man, Class S Hero, investigating City Q nothing unusual. Nothing unusual? Repeated an executive in disbelief. Yes sir confirmed Sekinger. That's hard to believe. We all know City Q is a hot zone with more casualties and monsters than any other area under our jurisdiction. Well, sir, knowing him, I'm confident that he believes that, whatever may occur, he'll be able to take care of it on his own without assistance. 
Though he has focused his effort in City Q, his track record at Monster Elimination is top-notch. There's no need to worry, answered Sekinger. Class S heroes don't pay much attention to details. They're not ones known to writing reports stated another executive before everyone's attention is brought to the next hero's report. Next, City W Heavy Kong, Class A Hero, reports, Nothing unusual said Sekinger as a hologram of the hero, Heavy Kong appears beside his submitted report. In City H, Mushroom, Class B and Horsebone, Class C report, Nothing unusual. The holographic images of the two heroes appear beside their reports. In City D, Class A Hero, Lightning Genji reports, Moderate restoration after the damage caused by the gigantic creature aside, nothing unusual. Holographic images of the giant monster, Maragori appears over the holographic table, as well as images of the destruction he caused during his brief time as a monster. Cities B and D both sustained damage that day. Would have been worse, if not for the timely arrival of Deku chimed executive girl while looking over the images, in order to prevent more disasters from occurring. We must be diligent and uncover any covert activity that can threaten our society stated Sekinger. Well, keep in mind that this investigation was requested for that expressed purpose. But detecting these monsters is more difficult than expected remarked a serious looking sitch. Sekinger continues to the final report. City F, Class A Hero, Snakebite Snack reports, nothing unusual ever since the massacre of the Paradiser terrorist group and the arrest of their leader, Hammerhead. Did we ever find out who killed the Paradisers? Asked Executive Girl. Knowing that Deku is the one who found the headless corpses of the terrorist group and apprehended Hammerhead. But it's common knowledge that unlike some heroes, Deku doesn't kill humans. Yes, a skilled assassin who goes by the name, Speedo Sound Sonic was responsible for the massacre and has only been recently incarcerated to Smelly Lid Prison, thanks to Deku himself answered Sekinger with a nod. That's good and all, but what have we heard about City Z? I've heard repeated rumblings of a potential disaster brewing somewhere in the abandoned area asked a concerned executive. Having heard of how monsters seem to be appearing more often in City Z no reports available. However, two highly capable class of heroes have been sent to investigate so we should get to the bottom of these rumors soon answered bespectacled worker, having been the one to assign Golden Ball and Spring Mustachio to lead the investigation. City Z Deku's apartment. And that bastard claimed I couldn't handle it. Lone Tatsumaki, having gone to Deku's apartment to complain about what had happened at the Hero Association headquarters. The S-Class Rank 2 hero is laying on Izuku's couch, kicking her legs up and down like a child who's throwing a tantrum. Sitting on a chair across from his couch, Izuku silently nods his head while sipping from his cup of tea. He has learned a long time ago to just nod his head in agreement whenever Tatsumaki gets in one of her moods. It's less troubling to do so, although he hopes something will come up soon to distract him from Tatsumaki's complaining. He'll always be there to support her, but an hour of her constantly complaining is starting to give him a slight headache, similar to the pain he gets from using his danger sense quirk too much, as if someone is answering his wish. Both heroes hear their phones ding, indicating that they've been sent an alert from the Hero Association. Both Izuku and Tatsumaki pull out their phones and read the alert message. Hero backup request in the ghost town of City Z class of rank 29. Golden Ball has been knocked out in class of rank 33. Spring Mustachio is in trouble. Threat is tiger level or above. Huh. I knew they should have sent me instead of those weaklings exclaimed Tatsumaki with a victorious glare. Drinking the remains of his cup of tea in one go, Izuku places the cup down and stands up before he moves to leave his apartment. His apartment is on the outskirts of the ghost town so it'll take him just a few seconds to get to the hero's location. You coming? Tatsumaki levitates herself off the couch and follows Izuku out of the apartment, noting how he doesn't stop to change into his hero costume and instead, leaves while wearing a sleeveless green tank top and grey sweatpants. Once the duo are outside, both glow green with their respective powers and then bolt into the sky while heading towards Spring Mustachio's location. Within two seconds, both S-Class heroes arrive in the ghost town and it doesn't take long for them to hear the sound of steel hitting steel. Both heroes fly in the direction of the noise and stop in the air once they spot Spring Mustachio who they see is deflecting the monster's swinging hair which looks to be made of kombu. Only that the kombu appears to be as strong as steel, as shown when they manage to easily cut up some concrete whenever they miss the A-Class hero. This is the monster that's been causing so much trouble. Pathetic scoffed Tatsumaki who folds her arms while looking down on both the monster and the A-class heroes. No time for that, Tatsu. Looks like Spring Mustachio is in need of assistance remarked Deku. Spring Mustachio is putting up one hell of a fight against the monster, but the A-class hero can only block or dodge only so many of the monster's many steel-like kombu tentacles. 
Even now, some combo are getting through Spring Mustachio's defense and leaving cuts across the hero's nice suit and some physical cuts on his body that is dripping blood. Whatever, let's just deal with this and get out of here told Tatsumaki who lazily points her arm at the monster, just as it launches ten of its kombu tentacles at the exhausted Spring Mustachio. Just as the A-class hero is about to be overwhelmed, the kombu and the monster all stop where they are and remain in place, due to Tatsumaki using her psychokinesis. This surprises both the monster and Spring Mustachio. But before either can question it, Tatsumaki clenches his fist, using her psychokinesis to squeeze the monster. The monster can't even resist as it's squeezed into a ball of torn flesh, broken bones and ripped kombu. Watching Tatsumaki easily kill the strong monster with barely any effort reminds Deku how terrifyingly powerful she is being the only one who can match him when he uses 100% of one for all. Deku lowers himself down to Spring Mustachio's side, causing the A-class hero to jump away in fright, thinking that it's another monster. Izuku raises his arms to calm the hero down. Calm yourself, Spring Mustachio. Where the good guys said Deku, placating the A-class rank 33 hero, realizing that there's no other monster and that the ones who saved him is none other than the top two heroes. Deku and Tornado of Terror, Spring Mustachio puts away his rapier and bows an apology. Apologies for that. You caught me unaware, but thank you for coming. I was afraid I wouldn't last much longer against such a beast said Spring Mustachio in exhaustion. Deku chuckles with a smile and pats the A-class hero on his shoulder. You did good so don't beat yourself up about it. The moment Izuku's hand touches Spring Mustachio, the A-class hero loses the remaining strength in his legs and topples over. Spring Mustachio would have fallen on the floor, if not for Deku catching him at the last second. We better get you to the hospital said Deku before hoisting the hero over his shoulder. Once Spring Mustachio is secured, Deku walks over to the unconscious form of Golden Ball and carefully places him on his back along the road. After giving the unconscious a class hero a pat down to check his injuries, Deku stands back up. Golden Ball has a cracked rib, likely a concussion and his right arm is broken. Nothing life-threatening, but we still need to get him to the hospital. Deku carefully picks up the unconscious golden ball and puts him over his other shoulder before he looks up at Tatsumaki who's still floating above them. You coming, Tatsu? Deku gets his answer when Tatsumaki turns her head aside in an arrogant manner before she flies off in green blur. Deku simply laughs. I guess that was a no. City M. In one of the many apartment buildings in City M, two S-class heroes can be found playing a video game of all things. The civilians would find it hard to believe that two S-class heroes would spend their free time playing video games and they would be especially shocked to discover that the two class S heroes who are doing so are S-class rank 6, King and S-class rank 1, Deku. Yet, that is exactly what is happening in King's apartment as both S-class heroes are currently battling it out in a fighting video game, sitting side by side on the floor while in front of King's television. Both men are pressing the buttons on their controllers at a rapid pace, although Izuku is doing so in more flustered state, unlike King who is as cool as a cucumber. King is a tall, lean man with light tan skin, blue eyes and shoulder length, slicked back blonde hair combed down to the nape of his neck. He has a long face with sunken cheeks and a well-defined jawline. His most noticeable feature are the set of three vertical scars over his left eye. I've got you now, declared Izuku with a wide grin pressing a combination of buttons on his controller that makes his player character use their super move. With King's character's health so low, the special move should be more than enough to win the game. If Izuku was playing against someone else, he might have just won, but he's up against King, the god of video games. With just two fingers, King presses a series of buttons on his controller, making his character counter Izuku's own at the last second before he could unleash his special move. This left Izuku's character at the mercy of King who used a combo move to remove the rest of Izuku's character's life bar, ending the match in another victory for King. No, cried Izuku is disbelief. But I was so close. King decides not to tell Izuku that he was holding back to give him a better chance. That makes it 81 minus 0 to me, doesn't it? He asked, already knowing that he's right. Izuku doesn't even answer, simply dropping his controller and looking down at his crossed legs in defeat. How is he so good at playing video games? He wondered, sadly. With it being Sunday, Izuku had gone to King's apartment for their weekly video game matches and just like the many times before, he had lost. In the eyes of everyone, Izuku Midoriya is the strongest man in the world. But it is believed that King is the only other hero who can match him in sheer physical might. Everyone believes the two heroes are fated rivals with King being the only man alive who's capable of taking Izuku's title as the strongest man on earth. In truth, the entire world believes in a lie. The truth of the matter is that King is not Izuku's rival. Yes, they are friends, but King can't be Izuku's rival because he's actually just a civilian who had unintentionally gained credit of some of Izuku's heroic acts during his time as a vigilante years ago. King never wanted the credit, but before he could even open his mouth to deny the accomplishments, 
He was already made a S-class hero by the Hero Association and given the title as rival to Deku. Izuku still finds it hard to believe that the Hero Association was so quick to jump the gun and name King a S-class hero, especially without actually witnessing him defeat a single mysterious being. Usually, Izuku wouldn't allow a civilian to be made a hero, especially a class S hero, without any sort of training or skill, but it turns out that King does have some useful skills of his own. Other than his incredible skills at playing video games, King is both incredibly lucky and has an overwhelming presence that intimidates all his foes into backing down. For nearly three years, King has been an S-class hero who has gone up against dozens of opponents, both human and monster, with him defeating them all with just his sheer overwhelming presence alone. Such a feat has only proven to the world how powerful he truly is. Seeing as how King can handle himself, even without fighting, Izuku decided to not reveal the truth about King. Another reason Izuku doesn't reveal the truth about King is that it would not only ruin King's life, but also make the entire world look foolish, especially the Hero Association. If the world found out that the Hero Association promoted a weak civilian to S-Class because of miscommunication, it would make the public lose faith in the Hero Association. With powerful monsters causing havoc every so often, the last thing the people need is to lose faith in the Hero Association who are quite literally the first and last defense against the constant threat of mysterious being. As Izuku grumbles over his defeat, much to King's amusement, he feels his phone buzz in one of his costume's pockets. After taking the device out, Izuku gets serious once he sees that it's a call from the Hero Association. Answering the call, Izuku places the phone to his ear so to find out what the Hero Association wants with him. Yes, Deku, thank god you answered, we've got a serious problem. The threat level is Dragon, exclaimed bearded worker from the other side of the phone call. In an instant, Izuku jumps up to his feet, startling King beside him. Which city is the threat in? The threat isn't in any of the cities. At least, it isn't yet. What do you mean by that? Asked Izuku, hoping that he gets an explanation and fast. Dragon level threats are no joke after all. A large meteor has just shifted course and is now heading straight for City Z within the hour. City Z will be destroyed and all the nearby cities will be severely damaged as well. We've asked for any nearby S-class heroes to try and do something about it. Izuku widens his eyes and runs over to the closest window and pokes his head out. Just as bearded worker said, he can see a falling meteor in the sky, glowing red from the intense heat caused by friction. King decides to look out the window as well to see what Izuku is looking at and once he sees the meteor, King breaks into a nervous sweat. Have you started evacuating City Z in the nearby cities? Asked Izuku while keeping his attention on the glowing red meteor. The top brass want us to send out the warning 30 minutes before the impact answered bearded worker, having disagreed with the executive's orders to delay the warning. They may not be able to safely evacuate everyone within the hour, but they'll be able to get more people out of the blast radius in an hour than they would at half that time. Ignore that order and begin the evacuation of the civilians from City Z and all nearby cities. I will see about dealing with the meteor told Izuku, dismissing the orders of his superiors. Bearded worker is more than happy to follow Deku's orders. If the Hero Association executives have a problem with that, they can bring it up with the hero themselves. I will do that at once. Thank you, Deku. Izuku hangs up and pockets his phone before stepping out of the window and uses float to keep himself floating in midair by King's window. King looks at Deku, seeming a bit worried, not for himself, but for the people in City Z who are in danger of being completely wiped out. Can you actually deal with that? He asked, glancing up at the meteor for a second. He knows that Izuku is powerful, but is he actually strong enough to stop a falling meteor? Deku turns around and with a smile, shrugs his shoulders. Guess we'll find out, won't we? He remarked before he floods his body with the power of one for all. Glowing an emerald lightning. Deku propels himself high enough in the sky so that he doesn't risk hitting any high-rise buildings before he disappears in a green blur, breaking the sound barrier several times as he flies towards City Z. Since City M is on the complete opposite side of the landmass to City Z, Deku will need to pick up speed to get there in time to stop the meteor. City Z. Genos can be found jumping across the rooftops of the high-rise buildings in City Z with a black suitcase in hand. The cyborg moves towards the tallest building in City Z so he can have the best vantage point to try and stop the meteor. I did not expect to be testing this prototype so soon thought Genos, pressing a button on the suitcase while still jumping across rooftops. The suitcase is revealed to be a new prototype for Genos to enhance his power as it flies off before transforming into a pair of mechanical arms that clasps over Genos's own arms. The new arms are bulkier in black in color. Upon clasping over Genos's arms, metal parts run up the cyborg's shoulder and pieces of metal frame the sides of his face. Genos lands on top of a rooftop intending to stop the meteor by using his incineration cannons that are now being enhanced with his new arms mode. 
before the cyborg can make an attempt. His sensors detect something flying in his direction at fast speed. Genos looks up as something large flies over his head. What is that? muttered Genos in curiosity. The large flying object happens to be a battle robot, created and operated by the S-Class Rank 7 hero, Metal Knight. The battle robot quickly lands on a nearby rooftop and does so with a grace one wouldn't expect from such a large robot. The battle robot is bulky in size and quite intimidating to look at, especially with the large cannons on its back. It has a distinct set of three circular marks on its face and a yellow hazard triangle on its back. You are Bafoy, correct? asked Genos, having jumped up to the same rooftop as the battle robot to speak with the hero inside it. The battle robot looks over its shoulder to address Genos. And you are the new boy, Genos remarked Metal Knight. Have you come to stop the meteor? Yes answered Genos while studying the battle robot. Class S rank 7, uses intense firepower to obliterate opponents along with everything in their vicinity. Does he also live in City Z or did he rush here, putting his life at risk? He thought, feeling a lot more confident now that another S-class hero has arrived to help destroy the meteor. Bafoy, I am in need of your assistance. I refuse. Metal Knight's rejection to help each other catches Genos off guard. Why is that? I only answered the call to field test my new weapon. The meteor is a perfect target explained Metal Knight without shame. Field test repeated Genos with a slight glare. If that meter hits, you will die too. Before Metal Knight can explain, someone else interrupts the conversation. Metal Knight won't die because he isn't actually here. What you're talking to is just one of Metal Knight's many robots explained Deku who is standing on the same rooftop as Genos and Metal Knight's battle robot. This surprises both Genos and Metal Knight, because neither of their sensors detected him close by, nor detect him when he's standing right behind them. By the way, when on the job, you speak to others using their hero names, not their real ones, Genos told Deku, knowing that it's a common mistake among rookies. Ah, Deku, you have come to stop the meteor as well said Metal Knight is more as a statement than a question. Of all the S-class heroes who were called to try and stop the meteor, he predicted that Deku would be one of the first to arrive. I am a hero. I wasn't going to sit back and let a meteor destroy City Z and kill millions in the process answered Deku while he looks up at the sky where he can see the meteor getting closer. At this point, it looks like a miniature red sun in the sky and every second that passes by, it gets ever so closer to the planet. Could you perhaps wait a moment? I must test out my latest weapon and the meteor makes for a perfect target asked Metal Knight who gets his answer when Deku looks at the battle robot with a smile that doesn't reach his eyes. No, I will not wait for you to test your new weapon. I plan to destroy the meteor. And yourself, Genos and Silverfang will be helping to defend the city as I do so told Deku in a tone that warns Metal Knight not to question him if he knows what's good for him. Izuku doesn't like to be threatening, but when there are powerful S-class heroes like Metal Knight who think that they can do whatever they want because of their power and rank status, someone has to be there to keep them all in line. Silver Fang, muttered Genos, having briefly met the S-class rank 3 hero before he went off to try and destroy the meat. The cyborg turns around and sees the elderly hero standing behind them with an amused smile on his wrinkled face. My sensors couldn't detect him either thought Genos, noting that Silver Fang managed to get onto the same rooftop as him without his sensors detecting his presence. Either his sensors are on the Fritz or Deku and Silver Fang are a lot stealthier than he would have thought. The battle robot's three eyes glow a threatening red. Just because you are the number one hero doesn't mean I am inclined to follow your orders, Deku retorted Metal Knight, sounding unhappy with not getting what he wants. Being the S-Class Rank 7 hero and main benefactor to the Hero Association, there is very little that Metal Knight can't get away with. Being told that he can't test his weapon on the meteor by Deku is both new and annoying. Metal Knight's words makes Deku's smile drop and the hero stares deep into the eyes of the battle robot, making Metal Knight who is hidden in a secret location shiver. You will either help me destroy the meteor, or I will personally send your robot back to you as a rolled-up ball of scrap metal. Your choice, Metal Knight. After a moment of tense silence, the battle robot's head nods. Very well answered Metal Knight in resignation. As much as the scientist doesn't like to be ordered around, he can't very well make an enemy out of Deku, especially with his favorite robot on the line. What is your plan? And could you explain it quickly? The meteor is getting awfully too close for comfort told Silver Fang who looks up to see the large meteor minutes away from making impact with City Z if that happens. They will all die or at least, everyone but Metal Knight will die. Deku nods and activates full cowl, lighting himself up with green energy and emerald lightning. I plan to destroy the meteor, but when I do, it will likely shatter into smaller pieces that could cause just as much damage to City Z if not stopped. I want you three to do whatever you can to destroy as many of the broken pieces of the meteor before they can hit the city. Hem. So it looks like I still get to test out my new weapon after all said Metal Knight, sounding a lot more chipper. A hero would have preferred to test his weapon against the intact meat, but being able to use them on the shattered pieces of the meter will just have to do. 
Sounds fine by me nodded Silver Fang. Genos looks at Deku for a moment before gazing up at the meteor. He knows that his sensei is monstrously powerful, as his title as world's strongest man would detail. But he's not sure if even Deku can stop the meteor on his own. Sensei, are you sure that you can destroy the meteor by yourself? Deku shrugs his shoulders. Maybe. Haven't tried it before so I'm not entirely sure. But I will give it my all to make sure it doesn't land on City Z so he's going to use his full power. This will be a perfect opportunity to gauge how powerful Deku really is thought Metal Knight. Having never witnessed Deku ever use his full power before. He heard rumors that he once fought the Tornado of Terror to a standstill and if those rumors are true, then that speaks more about how terrifyingly powerful Deku is. Seeing as Tatsumaki is the most powerful Asper in the world and likely the only other hero who could stop the meteor, himself not included, Deku turns his full attention onto the meteor which is far too close to his liking. Let's do this. He roared in with a jump that leaves large cracks on the rooftop. Deku jumps straight up into the sky. To those watching from the surface, they see what looks like a glowing green star flying straight towards the meteor. Just before he makes contact with the meteor, Deku cancels out his full cowl technique and instead, focuses the entirety of one for all into his right arm. Red veins stretch out along Deku's muscular arm which bulges to nearly twice its usual size. The fabric of Deku's hero costume which covers his right arm disintegrates, leaving Deku's arm completely bare as he pulls it back to punch the meteor. With a battle cry that can be heard throughout City Z, Deku throws his punch at the meteor. To those watching, they watch in amazement as the meteor which has been falling all the way from space suddenly stops its descent. For what seems like minutes when it was actually just a few seconds, the meteor remains still in the sky with Deku's fist pressing into it, being the only reason as to why the meteor isn't plummeting down on City Z. All of a sudden, the crater that Deku's punch made in the meteor shatters into a large hole, allowing Deku to fly straight into the meteor itself. The moment Deku flies into the meteor, large cracks that are emitting a green glow quickly begin to stretch across the entirety of the meteor, all within the matter of seconds. It's only when Deku flies out the other side of the meteor does the large space rock explode in a large explosion of green and red energy which lights up the sky. The colors made from the destruction of the meteor by Deku are breathtaking to behold, but it has also led to the meteor shattering into smaller numerous pieces. Unfortunately, those shattered pieces are each the size of a skyscraper and dozens of them are now falling back down to City Z at a much faster rate. Firing missiles, called Metal Knight who aims the cannons on his battle robots back at a few of the falling meteors and fires. The missiles each hit their respective meteor and light up the sky upon detonation, destroying several meteors in one go. Genos has opted to firing concentrated blasts from his incineration cannons to destroy the closest meteors he can see. The cyborg manages to incinerate over a dozen meteors by himself. Silver Fang can be seen jumping across buildings and using his mastery of martial arts to destroy any meteors he can get to. Even now, Silver Fang jumps off a building and uses a technique to smash through a falling meteor, shattering it into harmless little pieces. Even with all four of us working together, there are still some that are getting through thought Silver Fang. Having noticed that a few meteors managed to get past the heroes and caused some damage to the city, either destroying a building or damaging a road. Within moments, the meteors have stopped falling, having either been destroyed by the S-Class heroes or having hit City Z, causing some damage in the process. All four S-Class heroes reunite on a nearby rooftop with Deku floating back down with nearly half of his hero costume missing. Well, I can cross punching a falling meteor off my bucket list now laughed Deku with Silver Fang chuckling together with him. Several meteors managed to get by us, but the damage done to the city appears to be minimal, especially when compared to what would have happened if the whole meteor had hit Told Metal Knight knowing that City Z would just be a massive crater if the meteor had landed. Luckily, the surrounding area had been evacuated earlier remarked Silver Fang, sharing a knowing glance with Deku. If Deku hadn't gotten the evacuation alert sent earlier, there would have definitely been casualties thought the master martial artist. The top brass of the Hero Association could have gotten a lot of people killed if it wasn't for Deku's quick thinking. We're not finished yet. The meteors that hit City Z have broken out into fires said Genos, using his scanners to count the fires. The cyborg counts seven, meaning that seven meteors must have hit the city. I'll inform the closest fire departments told Metal Knight, seeing as how none of the 4S class heroes are equipped to handle fires. No need for that, Metal Knight. I will deal with the fire said Deku who walks towards the edge of the rooftop where he can see smoke coming from the fires in seven different locations across the city. You have a way to battle the fires. Can you spray water out of your hands now? Asked Sliver Fang, sounding somewhat genuine. Deku can summon black whips from anywhere on his body. Fly and destroy mountains with one punch so if Deku were to say that he can spray water as well, Silver Fang would very much believe him. Deku laughs. Of course not, but I've got the next best thing he answered before he holds his hands out. 
focusing 10% of one for all's power into each of his hands which spark with emerald lightning. Deku then claps his hands once. The resulting impact releases a powerful gust of wind outwards which travels across the city like an expanding bubble. Behind Deku, Genos, Silver Fang and even Metal Knight's battle robot have to hunker themselves down so to not be blown away by the powerful winds. The powerful winds blow across the empty city, shaking abandoned vehicles, rattling windows and most importantly, blowing out the fires across the city. With a clap of his hands, he managed to blow out seven different fires across City Z in a near instant and did so without causing any further damage to the city thought Metal Knight. Watching the event from the cameras attached to his battle robot, not only does he possess overwhelmingly monstrous power, but he can control it with such incredible precision. I can see why nobody has been able to take his S-Class Rank 1 status from him these past three years. As Genos gapes in amazement, Silver Fang laughs. I shouldn't be surprised and yet, I still am. City J, saving City Z from a meteor that was classed as a dragon level threat has lead to all four S-Class heroes getting a lot of praise and adoration from both the Hero Association and the general public. The Hero Association was especially grateful and showed their gratefulness by promoting Metal Knight to S-Class Rank 6 as a reward for his efforts in protecting City Z. Genos was also promoted from S-Class Rank 17 to S-Class Rank 16, now overtaking Puri Puri Prisoner in the rankings. Genos doesn't much care about the rankings. But he does accept the increased funding so he can use it to help Dr. Cusino fund his experiments and further his upgrades to Genos's mechanical body. Deku is already S-Class Rank 1 so he literally can't rise any higher on the ranking system. But he does manage to surpass Sweet Mask in the popularity polls, for now at least. Silver Fang was actually offered a promotion to S-Class Rank 2, but he rejected it for his own reason. Those reasons being that he doesn't want to draw the ire of Tatsumaki who would not like it if her rank behind Deku was taken out from under her. Bang may be the world's greatest martial artist, but Tatsumaki could destroy him with just a thought so he would like to avoid that if he possibly can. Yet, even after saving City Z from total destruction, the world moves on and the next threat emerges from the shadows. Just barely a month after destroying the meteor, Izuku finds himself facing off against a new threat, the clan of the Seafolk. Deku had been patrolling through City J when he caught sight of something large and ominous stepping out of the ocean and walk onto a beach. As Deku predicts, the large and ominous sight turns out to be a mysterious being that has the appearance of a bipedal octopus-shaped monster that is wearing a white toga of all things. Kahaha. <laughs> Humans, if you wish to be spared annihilation, take heed. I bear a message from the depths, bellowed the tall mysterious being. Obviously, none of the citizens stay around to listen to the monster so they all run away in fear. The messenger of the Seafolk either doesn't notice or care and continues. You will surrender the surface to us, the clan of the Seafolk. Thereafter, you shall become our nourishment, bipedal human scum, declared the Seafolk in arrogance, before he notices one of the humans walking towards him, not running away like the others are. The messenger of the Seafolk is more interested in the human's messy green hair which reminds him of seaweed. Mice head, are you related to seaweed by any chance? Asked the Seafolk before it laughs loudly at its own joke. It's Deku. Deku came to defeat the monster, our hero. Similar relieved and encouraging shouts are spoken by nearby civilians who stop fleeing in order to watch the world's strongest man defeat the monster. The shouts aren't ignored by the messenger of the seafolk who looks at the civilians, curiously before turning back to the muscular human before him. So you're one of those useless heroes that protects the surface world. If that's so, I am not impressed told the monster before he begins laughing obnoxiously again. Deku stops before the monster and looks it up and down, since danger sense isn't flaring. Then that means the monster isn't a threat to him, so it's likely a tiger-level threat or lower. You are from the clan of the Seafolk. Does that mean there's more of you? Deku asked, having listened to the monster as he gave his so-called message. But there are and they will all be coming to take back the surface world from you stupid monkeys, declared the messenger, loudly and proudly. Then we'll just have to prepare for their arrival. Before the messenger of the Seafolk can reply, he suddenly finds himself without the top half of his body, courtesy of Deku who holds up his steaming fist, having killed the tiger-level threat with a single punch. I'll have to inform the Hero Association about this. Within the crowd of civilians who all stare in awe, Mumin Rider watches Deku with the same kind of awe as everyone else. XXX After informing the Hero Association about the impending threat from the clan of the Seafolk, Deku flies off to continue his patrol throughout the city believing that the attack will likely not happen on the same day that they sent a messenger. Deku was dead wrong. It turns out that the Hero Association didn't have a lot of time to prepare for the threat, since the Seafolk launched their attack mere hours after they sent their messenger. It could be because their messenger never returned or maybe they just lost their patience. But within moments, a large wave from the ocean hits the edge of City J and with the wave came the Seafolk. 
civilians scream in terror at the sight of around a dozen seafolk monsters who are causing havoc across the edge of City J. An unlucky civilian finds himself caught in one of the monster's tentacles. We, the clan of the seafolk, now rule the surface, humans. It's useless to resist declared the seafolk who's holding the civilian in one of his yellow tentacles. Before he can squeeze the life out of the human, the monster flinches in pain when the tentacle holding the human is suddenly cut off. All the surrounding seafolk focus their attention on the one responsible, who so happens to be a young hero who has spiky black hair, adorns a black suit made out of black bandages and wields a spear. After cutting off the monster's tentacle and saving the civilian who runs away once free, the hero lands on top of a nearby car. Don't worry, the class a hero, Stinger is here. Announce the class a rank 11 hero, Stinger who spins his spear, bamboo shoot, like an expert. It's Stinger. Now we're safe. Set a civilian in relief. Show him who's boss, Stinger, shouted a woman in encouragement. He'll pay for that, human. Threatened the mysterious being as he and his seafolk brethren surround the A-class hero. Even with all the large and intimidating monsters surrounding him, Stinger stares at them all with full confidence. Listen up, fish. Whoever needs a new blowhole drilled into their torso, step right up said Stinger, spinning his spear before pointing it towards the group of seafolk. One of the seafolk narrows his eyes at the insufferable human. Big talk from a lone human. You are severely outnumbered. Do you think you can handle all of us on your own? Stinger smirks at the seafolk monster who spoke. Who says I'm alone? One of the seafolk monsters catches sight of movement at the edge of his vision and turns towards it to see what it is, only to suddenly find his head no longer connected to the rest of his body. All. But one of the seafolk looks surprised by the death of one of their own and turned to see another human walking towards them with a weapon on hand. But instead of a spear like Stinger's, the new hero is wielding a katana. The newly arrived hero is a young man with dark hair that arcs upwards and splits at the neck with hairpins on each side of his head. The hero wears a long-sleeved sweater, a long dress and has a large dot on both of his cheeks. The hero is a class rank 3, Akame Tachi, student of the S class rank 4 hero, Atomic Samurai. So Deku was correct about the invasion from Seafolk spoke Akame Tachi who had been nearby in City K when he got a call from the Hero Association about an impending invasion from Seafolk. Usually, he wouldn't believe such crap without evidence, but he was told that Deku was the one who learned of the invasion which was all the proof Akame Tachi needed to come to City J's defense. Although, it's not much of an invasion, is it? There's only ten of them. The swordsman's frown deepens as he looks even closer at the monsters, and there's not even a single cute one among them. How disappointing. Stinger glances at his fellow hero, strangely, before focusing his attention back on the seafolk. Right, let's do this. Arrogant humans. Or a seafolk who raises its large right arm to drop down on Stinger. But the monster roars in pain when he finds his arm no longer connected to his shoulder, having been cleanly cut through like a hot knife to butter. W what? Akame Tachi pulls his sword back for another swing. Too slow, exclaimed the swordsman before he swings his sword again. Using a technique taught to him by his sensei, Atomic Samurai. Airblade, announced the hero who swings his sword with enough strength to cut through the air itself. This results in a large blade of wind being created which flies towards the seafolk and cuts through his stomach, bisecting the monster into two separate pieces. The same occurs to the seafolk monster behind him as the blade of wind continues cutting and bisects another in half. I can't let you have all the fun remarked Stinger who jumps and spins his spear over his head so fast that it actually manages to make Stinger fly upwards. Stop him, roared one for the seafolk, having now realized that the humans aren't as weak as they first thought them to be. Four of the seafolk monsters attack Stinger, either with their tentacles or claws, but the A-class hero is a lot faster than them. Gigantic drill Stinger, quadruple thrust, faster than the seafolk can react to. Stinger thrusts his spear at each of them once in vital areas on their body. The spinning spearhead of Stinger's bamboo shoot easily kills each of the four seafolk monsters, having punctured a large hole in each of their bodies. Akame Tachi who has been watching nods his head in approval. He's only been a hero for six months, but I can see how he has managed to rise up the ranks so quickly. Stinger's quite skilled and not bad to look at either thought the A-class rank 3 hero who feels the wind shift slightly. The shift in the wind is because one of the few remaining seafolk monsters attempted to attack him when he wasn't looking. But unfortunately for the monster, Akame Tachi doesn't need to look at his opponent to know where they are. The seafolk monster which looks like an oversized crab, swings its massive claw towards Akame Tachi, but the hero jumps over the claw and prepares to swing his katana while he's still in the air above the monster. In a blur, Akame Tachi reappears behind the crab-like monster, standing on one knee with his katana blade out, having completed his attack. For a moment, neither the hero or seafolk move until a line begins stretching from the top of the seafolk's head to the bottom of its large body. The seafolk monster then collapses into two perfectly even pieces, courtesy of Akame Tachi who sliced the monster in half with a single vertical cut. 
At the same time, Stinger finishes drilling his bamboo shoot through the skulls of the other seafolk monsters. Sweaty, but victorious, Stinger grips his spear tightly in excitement. We did it. We beat those bastards. These monsters were probably a god-level threat and we defeated them. Is he actually serious? These guys were a tiger-level threat. If only barely thought Akame Tachi, having suddenly lost a bit of respect for his fellow A-class hero. To be fair, Stinger has only been a hero for six months now so he's still recently new compared to most heroes. But even he should realize that facing something considered a god-level threat would require more than two class of heroes. Before Akame Tachi can scold Stinger, he widens his eyes in surprise when he sees a seafolk monster suddenly appear before Stinger and punch him in the stomach. I didn't even see him move. Thought the A-class rank 3 hero, having thought that all the seafolk monsters were killed, but apparently one had managed to escape detection. You know, when something is so annoying, watching it die is a pleasure said the seafolk, glaring down at the unconscious stinger who is being held up off the ground by the monster's large fist. This one isn't like the rest of the seafolk thought Akemachi, holding his katana out in front of him while watching for the monster's next move. Stinger may be a recent hero, but he is still considered a strong A-class hero so the fact that the seafolk monster managed to defeat him with one punch speaks of the monster's strength. Who are you? He demanded. Though, muttered the seafolk, turning to Akemachi. That's right, there were two of you apes together. Not just this one said the monster who tosses Stinger aside as if he's nothing but trash. Stinger's unconscious body hits the side of an abandoned van, denting the metal and causing it to skid across the road until it hits a wall that stops it, but cracks from the force. The civilians have already fled the area once the fighting started so there's no chance of them getting in the way. As for my name, I am the Deep Sea King, ruler of the sea folk, and I hereby claim my right to rule the surface. Do you dare to defy me, human? Asked the now revealed Deep Sea King, staring at Akemachi with a playful smile. The Deep Sea King is the most humanoid of all the sea folk Akemachi has seen today, being a large muscular being with green skin on his arms, legs and back with light skin on his chest. He also has sharp eyes, large fangs and fins protruding from the sides of his head. The monster's attire consists of a red speedo, an ornate crown and a large fur-trimmed cape. All in all, he does look kingly and is much easier on the eyes than the other sea folk, but Akemachi makes sure to keep his guard up. Akamachi studies the Deep Sea King's appearance, looking for any weaknesses that he may be able to exploit, but clenches his teeth. He's just standing there, but I can't find any openings. Are you not going to attack? Asked the Deep Sea King, curiously, before a bloodthirsty grin emerges on his face. Very well, I'll start things off. Within the blink of an eye, Deep Sea King runs the distance between him and Akamachi while throwing a powerful punch straight at the hero's face. Akemachi tilts his head to the side and just barely avoids the punch, although he does feel the skin on his right cheek heat up from the friction of the monster's punch as it sails by. With the monster so close, Akemachi swings his sword straight at the monster's neck in blinding speeds, hoping to end the fight then and there. However, much like how he did before, Deep Sea King tilts his head back to barely avoid the swinging sword and while he does avoid getting his head chopped off, the monster feels the sword nick his neck. Deep Sea King steps back to touch his neck and then looks at his fingers to see blood, showing that he's bleeding from the cut. He spilled first blood. Impressive. For a dirty ape chuckled the king of the sea folk as the cut on his neck heals itself within a few seconds. Akaimachi doesn't bother with saying anything and instead, begins swinging his katana at the monster with speeds that most A-class heroes couldn't even comprehend, while himself and his fellow disciples of Atomic Samurai are all at the top of the class of ranking. They are actually considered by both Atomic Samurai and Child Emperor to be low S-class level in strength and would have been placed in S-class a long time ago, if not for Sweet Mask's gatekeeping. They might be strong enough to be considered S-class, but Sweet Mask is a monster on a whole different level. Yet, even with his swordsmanship skills which are considered to be S-class level, the Deep Sea King seems to be having no problem dodging his blinding katana strikes, moving far faster than a creature of his size should be capable of. What's worse, he's doing so with a smug grin on his face, showing that he's not even trying. This is no tiger-level threat. This guy is definitely demon-level thought Akemachi, having stopped his swinging and taken a few steps away from the monster to gain some distance for his next attack. The swordsman then swings his katana with all his strength at the direction of Deep Sea King. Air Blade, he called out, unleashing a powerful blade of wind at the monster at intense speeds. How amusing. Akamachi suddenly spins at a 180-eyed angle while swinging his katana at the Deep Sea King who he knows is standing right behind him, having dodged his air blade attack and appeared behind him in a near instant. However, the swordsman's swing is stopped by the Deep Sea King who uses both hands to grab onto his wrists. The A-class hero tries to fight off the monster's hold on him, but his strength proves to be too weak compared to the Deep Sea King's. Just when the swordsman is about to throw a kick at the monster's smug face, 
He cries out when he feels his wrists get crushed under the deep sea king's grip. If all the other apes are as weak as you, I guess I won't have any bother taking the surface world chuckled the deep sea king, enjoying the sadistic pleasure he gets for breaking the human's wrists. Now if you'll excuse me, I've got a surface world to take over. Deep sea king reels back his right arm and throws a punch into Akemachi's chest, landing the blow with no struggle. Akemachi coughs up blood as he's launched straight through several nearby houses before his body eventually stops after the seventh house, having become buried under the rubble of the building with his head just barely sticking out. Even still, Akemachi remains conscious for a moment, struggling to free himself of the rubble to continue the fight before he loses his remaining strength and succumbs to his wounds, falling unconscious. Now then Deep Sea King turns towards the direction of the city where he can see all the tall towers. Let's see what else the humans have in store for me. Hero Association Headquarters, Control Room In the control room of the Hero Association Headquarters, bearded worker can be found sitting by the main monitor, looking over the proceedings on the Seafolk invasion which they were warned about by Deku. Last he heard, class of heroes, Stinger and Akemachi were on the move to fight the clan of the Seafolk. He hopes that the two high-ranking A-class heroes can deal with the monsters. Was the warning issued? He asked to the female console operator below him. The request just went out. Sir she answered, having sent a tiger level threat alert message across all of City J so that the citizens know to stay away from the surrounding area of where the monsters were last seen. Good. But now it's looking like we need to change the announcement told bespectacled worker who walks into the control room. Everyone, including bearded worker, turn their chairs to look at bespectacled worker in confusion. What do you mean? Asked bearded worker. Stinger and Akemachi are both down bespectacled worker answered, simply. The bad news shocks everyone in the control room. None more so than bearded worker who grits his teeth. If both Akimachi and Stinger were defeated by these seafolk then the threat level is greater than Tiger he thought before he turns to the female console operator who is staring up at him. Issue a new warning to City J the threat level is now demon. Why yes, sir she stuttered, shocked and scared at the prospect of the seafolk becoming a demon level threat, meaning that they're now classed as a danger to the whole city, hopefully with the updated warning sent. The civilians of City J will either flee to the surrounding cities or move towards the closest evacuation shelter. It'll also warn all nearby C-class heroes to stay away as the monster is much too powerful for them to handle. I'm afraid there's more news. Word is that Stinger and Akamachi defeated most of the Seafolk when they invaded. But there is still one left roaming the city, the one who defeated them told bespectacled worker with a serious expression. While the news about how most of the Seafolk have been killed is great. The fact is that there's still one more seafolk monster walking the streets of City J and it's apparently the strongest one of them all. Bearded worker swivels his chair back to face the console operators. Tell me, what heroes are in the area that we can send? He ordered, watching as the console operators shuffle through the data on their holographic screen. A class rank 20, lightning max is in the area, exclaimed a console operator, only for the female console operator to speak up. We've just got an update. Lightning max is down she told in a grim tone. Her grim tone changes to a chance of hope when she finds out who else is in the area. New information has just come in. As class rank 17, Puri Puri Prisoner is in City J and is now confronting the monster. The news raises morale among the console operators and even has bearded worker nod his head, grateful. Hopefully Puri Puri Prisoner can deal with the threat he said. And if he can't, asked bespectacled worker who is just as hopeful as bearded worker. But there is a slight chance that Puri Puri Prisoner might not be able to stop the threat. Then we pray for a miracle muttered bearded worker who doesn't want to think about what might happen if Puri Puri prisoner can't defeat the demon level monster, as one would expect for being a class S hero. Puri Puri prisoner is immensely powerful, possessing physical strength that surpasses most heroes, even some of his fellow S class heroes. While he may be the lowest ranked S class hero and probably the weakest, he has defeated demon level monsters before. Hopefully, he can defeat this demon level monster as well. City J the Deep Sea King just finishes punching another one of those weak heroes out of a building and he looks out of the hole he made to watch as the blonde-haired human falls towards the floor below, waiting to see his body splatter across the pavement. Unfortunately, the King of the Seafolk doesn't get his wish as another human catches him and runs down the road to avoid the rubble falling down from above. The one who caught and saved the unconscious Lightning Max is none other than the S-Class Rank 17 hero, Puri Puri Prisoner. Puri Puri Prisoner is a large muscular man with a stubbly, cleft chin, large lips and black bushy hair. He has a well-defined jawline and light blue eyes with long eyelashes. For his costume and everyday clothing, he adorns a prison jumpsuit with white and blue stripes which is common attire for prisoners who are contained in the smelly lid prison. Over his jumpsuit, Puri Puri Prisoner is wearing a white sleeveless vest with a large pink heart in the center of it, a present from one of his many boyfriends in prison. 
Attached to his right ankle is a ball and chain that weighs over 20 kilograms. Not that it actually slows him down. At this point, the hero doesn't even feel the weight of the ball and chain, but he keeps wearing it for decoration. Once clear of the rubble, Puri Puri Prisoner gently places Lightning Max on the ground. I, the Class S hero, Puri Puri Prisoner, escaped prison just to see you he said to Lightning Max in a loving manner, even though the A Class hero is currently unconscious from his fight with the Deep Sea King. Well, well said someone from behind Piri Piri prisoner who turns to see a fellow inmate who is wearing the same prison jumpsuit as him, showing that they also came from the smelly lid prison. Imagine that. A hero serving time in prison said the prisoner who so happens to be the S-class villain, Speedo Sound Sonic. I took a que from you and decided to escape as well. Thanks for that smiled Sonic. Thanking Piri Piri prisoner since it was the S-class hero who had smashed through the steel walls of the prison when he left, giving Sonic the perfect opportunity to escape as well. Prisoner number 4188. The name's Sonic, right? Remarked Piri Piri Prisoner, surprising Sonic. You surprised I know. I check up on all the boys who catch my eye answered Piri Piri Prisoner. Honestly, he had taken note of Sonic and Smelly Lid Prison because of his good looks, but never had the time to make his move on the villain. Most of the time, he's either fighting mysterious beings or focusing his attention on the many men in his harem. I'm serving a life sentence because I can't seem to control myself. I see a beautiful man and I take it he told the villain, explaining the reason as to why he's serving time in prison, not that he minds. On paper, Puri Puri Prisoner is a prisoner who resides in Smelly Lid Prison, but in reality, he is freer than any other convict can hope to be. Not only is it because none of the prisons in the world can actually hold Puri Puri Prisoner, but also because he is allowed to leave the prison whenever he wants to do his heroic duties, hence why he doesn't have to do prison labor like the rest of his fellow prisoners. It's why he's here now as he heard news about a monster who has been causing chaos across City J. Luckily, Smelly Lid Prison is located in City J so Puri Puri Prisoner didn't have to go far to find the monster. Oh my, more soldiers have come for me. Goodness, my fins are quivering chuckled Deep Sea King who had jumped back down onto the road to confront his next opponent. Hopefully, they'll be stronger than the last three he fought against. Puri Puri Prisoner turns to the King of the Sea Folk with an excited grin on his face. Goodness, I feel the strength erupting out of him he said, sensing the strength of the Deep Sea King. Puri Puri Prisoner's excited smile soon turns to an angry glare as he points an accusing finger at the advancing Deep Sea King. Class A Rank 20, Lightning Max, Class A Rank 11, Sweet Stinger and Class A Rank 3, Akimachi. I fancied all of those lovelies. Then you show up out of nowhere and ruin them, he exclaimed, clenching his fist in outrage. Now that Gino's passed me, I rank lowest in my class, but I'm still Class S, unlike those three you've defeated he told, wanting to both avenge the three A-class heroes who were defeated and to also prove to himself that he belongs in Class S. As Puri Puri Prisoner speaks, Sonic is watching and listening to the hero on the sidelines. The speedster knows that now would be the best opportunity to flee before any more heroes show up. But he can't help but be curious about how a fight between a demon-level monster and a S-class hero will go. Who knows, he might just stay around and fight the victor of the fight so he can prove his superiority over them in strength. I'll start things off at half power to gauge how much you can take, exclaimed Puri Puri Prisoner before his already large muscles bulge in size. However, Puri Puri Prisoner had forgotten all about the vest he was wearing which was already struggling to cover his muscular chest. When Puri Puri Prisoner's muscles bulge upon him using half of his power, his now enlarged muscles tear through the vest as easily as ripping apart toilet paper, leaving it in tatters on the floor. Puri Puri Prisoner gasps in horror as he watches the torn fabric of what was once his vest flutter to the ground. You made me rip the hand that sweater my boyfriend made for me. Roared the S-Class hero is utter rage. Sonic watches in disbelief as the hero shouts about how the monster is at fault for ripping his vest when it was obviously Puri Puri Prisoner's own stupid fault for bulging his muscles while still wearing it. I will never forgive you, you bastard. Deep Sea King ignores the human shouts and licks his lips in excitement. Hum, a delectable slab of meat, prime and tasty. You've wet my deep sea king lands a strong roundhouse punch across Puri Puri prisoner's left cheek. Appetite. Such a powerful punch would have knocked out an A-class hero with ease, seeing as how he has used similar punches on three A-class heroes already. However, Puri Puri prisoner is on a whole different league compared to the A-class heroes who the deep sea king has already defeated, which is why the deep sea king is surprised when Puri Puri prisoner doesn't drop to the floor like all the others and instead returns a powerful punch of his own across the sea folk's left cheek. Huh, oh dear muttered Deep Sea King through his now broken jaw. For the first time since invading the surface, he has actually suffered an injury from one of the humans. Puri Puri Prisoner then performs a powerful uppercut into Deep Sea King's chest, launching the monster in the air. Deep Sea King flips backwards while in midair and lands on his feet while planting an arm against the floor to keep himself steady. 
I felt that said the king of the seafolk whose broken jaw heals within seconds, as well as the damage done from the human's uppercut. Just a little. I felt that as well. A little said a smiling piri piri prisoner who blocks one nostril with his thumb so he can blow out the blood that's pooling in his other nostril. The S-class hero's thoughts tell a different story. Damn it. His punch was stronger than I expected thought piri piri prisoner who is suffering a lot of pain from the punch the seafolk monster gave him. Even so, I must not lose to him. I can't have any more of my boys so savagely destroyed by this monster. I've got no choice, I gotta go all out. Both Deep Sea King and Sonic sense Puri Puri prisoners' power suddenly rise even higher. City M, what's with all these monster attacks today? Deku asked himself, jumping away in time to avoid a swinging claw which tears apart a wall behind him. After warning the Hero Association about the impending invasion of the Seafolk, he continued his patrol throughout the neighboring cities, only stopping whenever he comes across a mysterious being wrecking havoc. In the past six hours, he has already defeated five tiger-level monsters and two demon-level, not including the one he's fighting against right now. Said monster looks like a bipedal raccoon who stands over eight feet tall, is covered in black and white fur and has very sharp claws which he has been swinging around in an attempt to cut Deku up into ribbons. So far, the monster has not had much success, but not for a lack of trying. Usually, Deku wouldn't have much trouble defeating demon-level monsters, but this one has the most annoying ability of teleportation, reminding the number one hero of the villain from the USJ incident who possessed a quirk that could teleport himself and others to different locations. Only difference is that when the monster teleports, it does so in a near instant and always leaves behind a small cloud of black ash whenever he teleports. Every time Deku tries to attack the monster, he would teleport away and attack him from a blind spot but Danger Sense would always warn Deku of which direction the attack was coming from. For the past 20 minutes, the fight has become more of a game of cat and mouse which is starting to test Deku's patience. Getting sick and tired of the monster teleporting in every direction, Deku throws a roundhouse kick at the monster who teleports away, obviously to try and attack him from behind. Immediately, Deku uses Black Whip to summon tendrils all over this body and propels them in every direction to try and hit the monster. Luckily, he hears the monster cry out in pain, having been hit by his whips. Charging up his full cowl, Deku turns and jumps towards the monster who has fallen with one of Deku's black whips punctured in his left shoulder and another in the lower right side of his torso. When the monster realizes that Deku is upon him, he tries to teleport away, but is too late. Deku's fist connects with the monster's face and in a display of splattered blood and brain matter, the monster's head explodes. The now dead monster collapses with his head completely missing and his neck hole smoking from the speed and strength of Deku's punch. While the monster's teleportation ability made him difficult to catch, it has also made his body weak to actual physical damage. Now that the mysterious being is dead and seeing that there are no nearby threats, Izuku recalls his black whips and goes ahead to check his phone, having noticed that it was buzzing throughout his fights with the monsters. Izuku raises a brow when he sees that he has missed several calls and has over 10 messages from the Hero Association. Upon opening them, Izuku is shocked to read that the Seafolk had actually started their invasion hours after he left, but is relieved to hear that the invasion was made up of only a few Seafolk monsters, not the hundreds, if not thousands he would have expected. Who would the Seafolk invade with so few numbers? Thought Izuku, fearing that the low numbers were because the Seafolk were just that powerful, but maybe it's actually because their population is low in number. It would explain why nobody has ever encountered a Seafolk before while exploring the ocean. A large army of sea folk would be difficult to hide from the government, no matter how low they lived in the sea. Izuku then reads the one message that details how the two A-class heroes, Stinger and Akamachi defeated all but one sea folk who then defeated them. Another message then tells him that the monster who goes by the name of Deep Sea King has also defeated Lightning Max, having now defeated three A-class heroes. The latest message informs Izuku that the Deep Sea King is currently fighting against his fellow S-class hero, Puri Puri Prisoner. However, Izuku isn't as relieved to hear that as one might expect. It's not that Izuku doesn't have faith that Puri Puri Prisoner can handle a demon-level threat on his own. Puri Puri Prisoner may be the lowest-ranked S-class hero, now that Genos has passed him. But Puri Puri Prisoner is still a monstrously powerful hero who is known as one of the physically strongest humans on the planet, alongside himself, Tank Top Master and Super Alloy Darkshine. The man has more than earned his S-class ranking and would have easily made it into the top 10 ranking in Izuku's own world, as long as the people could look past the fact that he's quirkless, highly doubtful to be honest. However, Izuku has seen Puri Puri Prisoner fight before and while his fighting style is effective, Izuku has noticed that Puri Puri Prisoner doesn't fight monsters with the intent to kill them. While the monsters he fights do die, they die from the grievous injuries that Puri Puri Prisoner deals upon them, not because he attacked their vital areas for a quick kill like how every other hero would. 
Honestly, Puri Puri Prisoner must be the only hero he has met to not fight monsters with killing intent. And it's for that reason why Izuku is worried about him fighting the Deep Sea King. If Puri Puri Prisoner doesn't fight the demon-level monster with the intention to kill it, then he is unconsciously holding himself back from using his full strength. It's a weakness that Puri Puri Prisoner needs to shake off if he wants to truly grow as a hero. Just as Deku is about to fly off to assist Puri Puri Prisoner, a nearby explosion draws his attention instead. The screams of civilians has Deku focus his attention on them so while he runs in the direction of the explosion, he wishes Puri Puri Prisoner good luck in fighting the Deep Sea King. City J. Transform. Both the Deep Sea King and Sonic watch as a pinkish light envelops the S-Class hero, seemingly a result of his transformation. Said transformation happens to be Puri Puri Prisoner increasing his muscle mass to its full potential, making the already muscular hero even larger than before. In fact, Puri Puri Prisoner's muscles have grown so large that his prison jumpsuit can no longer contain them. Puri Puri Prisoner Angel Style Bellowed the now naked Puri Puri Prisoner while in a front double bicep pose, appearing to not care that his muscles have torn his clothing to shreds. He's naked, and he's definitely no angel thought Sonic in disgust. Watching as the naked Puri Puri prisoner goes from one pose to another, nor is he human he thought, admitting that the S-Class hero's muscles are abnormally massive. Just by looking, he can sense the power that is contained in those massive muscles. The fact that it reminds him of Deku annoys him, but at least Deku wears a costume that can actually contain his muscular physique, unlike the Class S hero before him who seems to have no trouble with fighting naked. Obviously, it's not his first time doing so. Turns out that Sonic isn't the only one disgusted with Puri Puri Prisoner's nudity. How unsightly deadpan Deep Sea King in disgust. Are those your last words? Shouted Puri Puri Prisoner before he leaps high into the air to perform his special move. The S-Class hero spreads his arms out while in midair and to the surprise of the Deep Sea King and Sonic. A mirage of beautiful angel wings appears from behind the hero, making Puri Puri Prisoner look like an actual angel for a fleeting moment. The mirage then disappears as Puri Puri Prisoner drops down on the King of the Seafolk so to deliver his special move. Angel Rush, he exclaimed and throws a barrage of punches down on Deep Sea King who raises his arms up to lessen the damage made by the barrage. Puri Puri Prisoner throws punch after punch down on Deep Sea King with such strength that he causes the monster's feet to literally sink into the concrete floor. After a moment of constantly punching, a sweaty Puri Puri prisoner stops his barrage and steps back to gauge the condition of the monster. When the smoke clears, Deep Sea King can be seen standing with his arms still raised, showing them bruised, but mostly unharmed. Are you finished with your little combo, human? Asked Deep Sea King in a mocking tone. Puri Puri prisoner gasps in shock over how the monster is not only alive, but seems to have suffered no actual damage from his angel rush. Nobody has ever survived being hit from my angel rush before thought the S-Class hero in disbelief. Many tiger-level and demon-level monsters have fallen after being hit with his powerful barrage of punches and yet, Deep Sea King remains standing with a smug grin plastered on his face. Even Sonic can't hide his surprise that the monster managed to survive such an onslaught of powerful blows to the body and do so with so little damage to show for it. He has already estimated that Puri Puri Prisoner is stronger than Hammerhead when in his advanced suit of armor. While Hammerhead is obviously much weaker than himself, Sonic won't deny that the suit of armor did give the B-Class villain an enormous boost in physical strength that is surpassed by Puri Puri Prisoner's own natural strength. The fact that the Seafolk monster could withstand Puri Puri Prisoner's angel rush and walk away with just a few bruises on his arms proves to Sonic how powerful the monster really is. Deep Sea King lowers his already healed arms to show a mocking grin. Felt that too, just a little, having noticed a lack of killing intent from his opponent. The king of the seafolk decides to teach the human a lesson on how to properly fight. So caught off guard by the lack of damage his angel rush did to the monster, Puri Puri prisoner fails to anticipate the deep sea king's next move as the monster lands a powerful blow into the hero's stomach and follows it up with a punch to his right shoulder and then a powerful uppercut that leaves Puri Puri prisoner in a pain day. Hear me. The objective of a combination move is to finish your opponent. Each separate attack must be delivered with intent to kill. Like this, the monster decides to personally show the hero the difference and so, he throws a barrage of fast and powerful upwards blows onto Piri Piri Prisoner's body which leaves marks all over the hero's muscular body. Once he's satisfied with his combo attack, Deep Sea King kicks the S-Class hero high into the air, launching him into a high-rise building a fair distance away. With Piri Piri Prisoner now out of commission, this leaves Deep Sea King and Sonic alone in the middle of the empty street and City J isn't this fun. Asked Deep Sea King to Sonic, looking forward to another fight. Seeing the monster defeat a Class S hero so easily has Sonic anticipating a good fight as well. City C. Puri Puri Prisoner was defeated. Deku exclaimed to the phone he's holding to his right ear. 
With his right hand busy holding his phone, Deku has to use his left hand to hold up the tiger-level mysterious being, who he just stopped from attacking nearby civilians. By his throat, the mysterious being looks like a humanoid porcupine who is just over 5 feet tall and has razor-sharp needles sticking out of his back. The mysterious being kicks the empty air and tries to use his hands to pry open Deku's grip from his throat, but with no success. The mysterious being has even tried to stab his needles into the hero's wrist to force him to let go. But the monster's needles fails to penetrate Deku's skin. I'm afraid so. Puri Puri prisoner is injured, but alive. Unfortunately, there's nobody else in the nearby vicinity who can stop the deep sea king who is now making his way towards the evacuation shelter in City J. Genos is the closest hero at the moment and he intends to stop the monster before he can get to the evacuation shelter. But I'm unsure if he can make it on time explained bearded worker from the other side of the phone call. Bearded worker is staring at a holographic map of City J which shows two separate dots with one being Genos and the other being the deep sea king. While Genos is moving as fast as he can, he's still miles away from the Deep Sea King who is quickly making his way towards the evacuation shelter. While relieved to hear that Puri Puri prisoner is alright, Deku bites his lip to avoid cursing. Thousands of civilians would have fled to the evacuation shelter once they heard the city-wide alert. If the Deep Sea King manages to get there, it would become a slaughter. With thousands of lives on the line, Deku can't risk being held up any longer. Hopefully, Genos can distract the Seafolk monster long enough for him to arrive. As much as he knows that Genos is powerful, the Deep Sea King has proven to be a powerful demon level threat by defeating three A-class heroes and a class S hero. Genos might have a hard time fighting such a monster. I'll make my way there as fast as I can he said before hanging up the phone. With no time to waste, Deku looks at the monster who is still trying to stab him with his sharp needles. Without a word, Deku tightens his grip around the monster's neck and in a near instant, hears and feels the monster's neck snap, killing him quickly and painlessly. Dropping the monster, Deku leaps into the air and flies his way towards City J, praying that he makes in time. City J, the situation with the Deep Sea King hasn't gotten any better. Actually, it has only gotten worse. After defeating Puri Puri Prisoner, the Deep Sea King then battled against Speedo Sound Sonic and unlike the Sea Folk's fight with the Class S hero, Sonic proved to be no push Sonic lacked the strength to deal any actual damage to the Deep Sea King. He was much faster than the monster, proving to be much too fast for the King of the Sea Folk to land a hit. Then the Deep Sea King transformed into his true appearance which led to him becoming even more powerful and faster than before. However, even with his increase in power, Sonic was still too fast for the monster to hit. Although Sonic had to retreat in order to retrieve his weaponry, since he couldn't actually deal any damage to the monster without them. After Sonic fled, there was nobody else for the Deep Sea King to fight so he traveled towards the location where he could sense a large gathering of humans which so happened to be the evacuation shelter. With no more heroes slowing the monster down, the monster smashed through the ceiling of the evacuation shelter, much to the horror of the thousands of civilians who were taking cover in the building. Even when the C-Class hero, Allback Man offered to surrender in order to try and have the monster spare the lives of everyone, the Deep Sea King refused, revealing that he plans to kill each and every one of the humans, no matter if they're man, woman or child, since the demon-level monster was fully intent on killing them. The heroes who were among the civilians all came forward to fight the Deep Sea King in order to protect the civilians. Said heroes included All Back Man, C Class Rank 331, Bun Bun Man, B Class Rank 50, Jet Nice Guy and A Class Rank 38, Snack. Unfortunately, the heroes barely lasted a few seconds against the Deep Sea King who easily defeated them all. Just before the Deep Sea King could slaughter the thousands of humans before him, Genos arrived and clashed with the demon-level monster. The fight between the Seafolk and Cyborg proved to be quite a spectacle with Genos managing to fight the Deep Sea King in an even match, even after losing an arm. However, when the monster spat a ball of acid at a fleeing little girl, Genos blocked it with his own body. This saved the life of the little girl. But the acid melted through Genos's mechanical body, destroying his other arm and most of his body. Genos was incapable of protecting himself from the Deep Sea King who threw the heavily damaged Cyborg into a wall before punching him through said wall. Miraculously, Genos is still alive, although in great pain and unable to even stand. The cyborg can only breathe heavily as the heavy rain pelts down on his crippled body. If you'd focused on me, you could have easily dodged my little ball of acid told Deep Sea King, jumping out of the hole he made in the wall of the evacuation shelter. The king of the sea folk then walks towards the crippled cyborg. Instead, you chose to sacrifice yourself to save a runt. You're a fool, but I give you credit for giving me a few scratches he said, admitting that the cyborg gave him the best fight out of all the heroes he fought before him. Of course, they've already healed chuckled the king of the seafolk while patting a finger against his cheek, showing that all the damage that Genos managed to deal on him has already healed. 
The deep sea king now stands over the crippled cyborg with a sadistic smirk on his face. Now, die. Just before the deep sea king can finish off Genos, he hears someone shout something behind him. Just as Crash, exclaimed C-Class Rank 1 Hero, Mumin Rider who jumps off his bicycle and tosses it into the back of the Deep Sea King. The surprise attack might have hurt a regular civilian, but to the Deep Sea King, the bike simply bounces off his muscular back, doing as much damage as a mosquito bite. Annoyed, the Deep Sea King turns around to see the fool who just interrupted him. Mumin Rider is a young man of average height. He wears an armored suit with brown armor covering his torso and shoulders. He has a black leather suit under the armor and matching black gauntlets and knee pads. He also adorns a green bicycle helmet and dark shaded goggles. All in all, his appearance is fairly average, even among C-class heroes who usually lack unique costumes or features that make them stick out like the heroes in higher classes. The cyclist for justice, Mumin Rider is here, announced Mumin Rider while panting, having cycled all across City J just to find the demon-level monster. Even with his body heavily damaged, Genos manages the strength to look over his shoulder so he can see the C-class rank 1 hero square off against the demon-level monster who has already defeated 3 A-class heroes and 2 S-class. No, do not murmur Genos, attempting to tell Mumin Rider to run away as the Deep Sea King is incredibly out of his league. But the cyborg no longer has the strength to speak. Even the civilians who are watching from the hole in the evacuation shelter know that Mumin Rider stands no chance against the Deep Sea King who they just witnessed defeat the S-Class Rank 16 hero, Genos. With a battle cry, Mumin Rider charges at the Deep Sea King, reeling his arm back to punch the monster with all his strength. As the C-Class hero attacks, the Deep Sea King stares down as Mumin Rider with as much contempt as a human staring at an insect. I'm bored already said the king of the seafolk who lazily catches Mumin Rider's punch. The monster then lazily lifts the hero up and down, beating Mumin Rider off the ground repeatedly. As the monster lifts the human up to hit him off the ground again, the fabric around the arm that the deep sea king is holding onto suddenly ripped, freeing the hero's arm from the monster's hold. But Mumin Rider is still thrown in the air by the momentum before hitting the pavement at a distance from behind the deep sea king. HM, hummed the deep sea king. Turning to look at the pitifully weak human bounce off the ground before he focuses his attention back on Genos. Oh, apologies. I nearly forgot to kill you apologized the Deep Sea King, ready to finish what he started with the cyborg. Just as tackle, even after the beating he suffered at the hands of the demon-level monster, Mumin Rider gets back up on his feet and tackles the Deep Sea King even though he's in great pain and has blood spilling down his head and out of his nose. Even as Mumin Rider puts his entire weight into his tackle, he fails to so much as budge the muscular monster. The Deep Sea King glares down at Mumin Rider who still has his arms wrapped around the monster's torso, trying in vain to push back the monster, but all it does is make it look like the hero is giving the monster a hug. As the Deep Sea King has been standing in the rain for quite some time now, he begins transforming into his hydrated form which makes him even larger and more imposing. He develops a dorsal fin running down the length of his muscular back and grows fins on his forearms and shoulders while the fins on the side of his face grow larger. His light akin turns aquamarine and his humanoid appearance becomes larger and more monstrous. Even though he's obviously much weaker than the Deep Sea King, Mumin Rider keeps pushing through gritted teeth. No one expects much. The Deep Sea King casually slaps the C-Class hero away, interrupting him and launching him in the air where he bounces off the road twice before sliding on his back. Not from me continued Mumin Rider. They think a class C hero won't be much help. The hero pushes through the pain and tries to lift himself back to his feet, but falls back down. I know that better than anyone, he exclaimed, ignoring the blood dripping down his face and the taste of copper on his tongue. I'm too weak for class B I'm not good enough. I know that much admitted the hero, somehow finding the strength to stand back up, even though his body is screaming at him to stay down. I'm aware that I stand no chance at beating you. No one has to tell me anything like that shouted Mumin Rider through heavy breaths, back facing the monstrous sea folk. What are babbling on and on about? Begging for your life? Asked Deep Sea King who hasn't been paying attention to the human's speech. Unlike the king of the sea folk, the civilians watching from the evacuation shelter are all listening to Mumin Rider's words. Mumin Rider continues speaking, even if every breath he takes hurts. And yet, I must try. It isn't about winning or losing. It's about me, taking you on, right here and right now shouted Mumin Rider with a passion that reaches the hearts of everyone listening. Standing on the edge of a rooftop across from the evacuation shelter, a figure smiles while watching the scene play out before him. Enough of your rambling. Time to finish you off said the Deep Sea King who stops playing around with the weak human. Mumin Rider grits his teeth, knowing that he is going to die, but accepting that if it means he can stall the monster long enough for a S-class hero to arrive, you can do it. Mumin Rider is surprised when he hears someone shout from the hole in the evacuation shelter. The person who shouted happens to be a child who's being held by his mother. 
You're the cyclist for justice, stated the child with tears in his eyes. You can beat him. I believe in you. He cried with all his heart. The child's words sparked something among the thousands of civilians who all began shouting words of encouragement of their own to Muman Rider. Beat him. You can do it, Muman Rider. You can do it. Muman Rider would be lying if he said that the words didn't touch him. With the words of encouragement pushing him, Muman Rider lets out a large battle cry and with every ounce of his strength, he charges the Deep Sea King and throws a punch at the monster. The Deep Sea King gasps in agony as a fist drives into his chest before the force throws him backwards a fair distance before he slides on his back, struggling to breathe with his chest now completely caved in. With his right arm still outstretched, Muman Rider looks up at the Deep Sea King who he sees is lying on his back in agony, coughing up blood. Did I do that? wondered Muman Rider in confusion, since he never felt his fist touch the monster. That was a fine good speech, Muman Rider. Nearly jumping out of his shoes, Muman Rider looks over his shoulder and from under his goggles, the C-class hero widens his eyes in shock. The reason is because standing right over him with his arm outstretched in the same punching pose as Muman Rider is the number one hero, Deku. So it was Deku who had punched the monster, not him. Deku, muttered Muman Rider, surprised, but greatly relieved to see him. Deku pulls back his outstretched arm and looks down at Muman Rider with a smile that seems to be wider than usual, if that is somehow possible. Muman Rider, the cyclist for justice. You are an incredible hero told Deku. Muman Rider eyes widen and he's thankful for the goggles he's wearing so they can hide his tears. The physical and emotional exhaustion of today has been draining Muman Rider, but Deku's words makes it all worthwhile. To be given such accolade by the world's strongest hero fills Muman Rider with an emotional warmth, but he isn't sure what that warmth is. Why you surprised me? Human said the deep sea king who gets back up to his feet after his body regenerates from the damage done by the new human's punch. I'll admit, you pack quite a punch for a dirty ape. Even more than the slab of meat I defeated earlier admitted the monster, referring to Puri Puri Prisoner. You might just give me a challenge. Muman Rider, you can rest up now. Leave this to me said Deku. Just before the massive form of the Deep Sea King appears behind him in a burst of speed and throws a devastating punch, Newman Rider doesn't even notice. But Deku has already turned around and swung his leg upwards into the monster's chin. GRRK choked the Deep Sea King as Deku's boot sinks into the bottom of his chin, forcing the monster's large mouth to shut close and for his teeth to shatter against each other. The kick then launches the Deep Sea King into the sky, going so high that everyone on the ground can't even see him. The wind pressure from Deku's kick is so powerful that the water on the ground is sucked back upwards into the sky, leaving the surrounding area completely dry from what used to be heavy rainfall. Just before he hits the troposphere, the Deep Sea King's momentum begins to slow down until it gets to the point where he is floating above the clouds for a split second before gravity attempts to bring him back down to the surface. However, gravity proves to be too slow as Deku is already hovering above the floating king of the sea folk with his right arm pulled back for a punch. At that moment, the Deep Sea King widens his eyes as an overwhelming sense of dread fills his body. The Deep Sea King's survival instinct is only just now telling the monster that he needs to run away from the muscular hero before him. But seeing as how he's thousands of feet in the air and still recovering from the human's strong kick, he has no way of escaping. I heard that you like combos. How do you like this combo then? Deku throws a punch down on the Deep Sea King. Even though there's 20 feet of space between them so his fist shouldn't be able to hit the monster. That hasn't stopped him before though. Full cowl, spark barrage. Time nearly seems to slow down for the monster because when Deku does throw his punch, it's not the one singular punch like what the Deep Sea King was expecting. In front of the monster's very own eyes, 100 massive fists made up of some sort of energy appears and are flying towards him faster than he could ever hope to react to. Somehow, the human had thrown a hundred punches and did so in such speed that it looks like he only threw one. The fact he did so with only one hand further adds to the incredibility of what the human just did. The hundred punches phases through the monster and for a second, the Deep Sea King suspects that the hundred glowing fists were all just an illusion, similar to the naked human who somehow made an illusion that made it look like he had angel wings. One second later, the Deep Sea King figures out that the hundred fists weren't an illusion. At first, the monster's left foot explodes into nothing before his right foot does the same which is then followed by the monster's hands exploding into dust. Piece by piece, the once powerful king of the sea folk begins losing more parts of his body, courtesy of Deku's punches. Each devastating punch blows another piece off the king of the sea folk and within half a second, the demon-level monster is nothing more than a head with pieces of flesh which was once his torso. In complete agony, the deep sea king can only stare up at the floating visage of the human who defeated him. As he stares up at the human's muscular body which is shrouded in an emerald glow, due of the emerald lightning and flames that covers him, the Deep Sea King realizes that the green-haired man is no mere human. 
No dirty ape could possibly possess such incredible power, nor have the overwhelming presence like this one has. The only possible answer is that the man floating above him is no mere mortal, but a god, for only a god could be so powerful. Only then does the last few punches take effect and as the monster's head and torso explode into specks in the wind, Death welcomes the deep sea king with open arms. Not long after, Deku floats back down to the surface and much to the relief of the civilians watching. The deep sea king doesn't fall back down either, although that isn't much of a surprise. No monster can stand up to the world's strongest man and live to tell the tale. Once Izuku's feet touch the ground, the civilians begin cheering and celebrating the fact that they survived their encounter with a demon-level monster. Izuku ignores the cheering civilians and walks over to Geno's to make sure he's alright. Geno's, we've gotta stop meeting up like this. Maybe one of these days, we can talk when you're not missing a limb. He joked to ease the tension. However, he will obviously need to up Geno's's training to try and prevent the cyborg from being in such a condition again. Are you okay? No need to worry, sensei. While I may be heavily damaged, my life is not in danger at the moment. I have already sent a message to Dr. Cusino who should be sending drones to transport me back to the lab for repairs answered Gino's, smiling a little in relief that Deku managed to arrive in time to save them all. He also makes a note to thank Mumin Rider, since if it wasn't for him stalling the Deep Sea King long enough for Deku to arrive, then Gino's would surely be dead right now. Izuku nods his head in satisfaction. Good, I'll be expecting you back up on your feet by tomorrow. Obviously, we need to further improve your training. Yes sir. If Genos had any of his arms, he would have saluted. Now that the adrenaline from fighting a demon-level monster is starting to wear off, Mumin Rider can feel his body's exhaustion, as well as the injuries he attained from the Deep Sea King begin to take effect. Taking a step towards his bike, Mumin Rider's vision suddenly turns blurry and he begins to lose strength in his legs. The C-Class hero would have fallen, if not for a hand suddenly grabbing his shoulder, keeping him steady. You all right there, Mumin Rider? Asked S-Class Rank 1 hero, Deku, who helps Mumin Rider stay on his feet. Ashamed that the world's strongest man has to help to keep him standing, Mumin Rider tries to wave off Deku's worries. It's nothing that a good night's sleep can't fix said Mumin Rider and he might have sounded sincere, if not for him suddenly coughing and spitting blood. Maybe a few nights in the hospital would be preferable chuckled Deku. But first, I want to ask you something important. While embarrassed that Deku caught him in his lie, Mumin Rider looks up at the towering body of muscle that is the number one hero, feeling more than a little curious over what Deku might be wanting to ask of him. W what is it? He asked, feeling nervous all of a sudden. Will you be my student? Deku asked with a big grin that shows off his pearly whites. Then and there, Mumin Rider faints, but nobody can confirm if it's because of his injuries or because of shock. City J Hero Association Hospital a couple of days have passed since the invasion of the Seafolk and everything has finally started to calm down. The Seafolk have all been eradicated. The injured heroes were taken to the Hero Association Hospital for treatment and the reconstruction of the damaged buildings and roads have just begun. The Hero Association has even sent a few more heroes to patrol in City J, just to make the civilians feel safer as they return to their normal lives. Sharing a room in the hospital are the A-Class heroes, Lightning Max and Stinger who are both still recovering from the injuries they suffered at the hands of the Deep Sea King. Akemachi had shared the room with them as well, but the swordsman had recovered from his injuries yesterday and left after being picked up by Ion, the A-Class Rank 2 hero. Both Stinger and Lightning Max are sitting up on their beds and reading a newspaper which specifically covers two stories. The first story is about Deku and how he defeated the Deep Sea King who wrecked havoc across City J. The story is just two pages of constant compliments for the S-Class Rank 1 hero and much to their annoyance. It doesn't even mention any of the effort made by the other heroes who fought the Sea Folk. However, the second story so happens to be the most important of the two and for obvious reasons. Deku defeating demon-level mysterious beings is nothing new. But it's not every day that the number one hero personally asks someone to be his student. Especially someone who's only in class C Genos being Deku's student is understandable, seeing as how the cyborg is already strong enough to be in class S. But Deku taking Mumin Rider as a student boggles the minds of literal billion. Even after several days, it's still the main headline on several newspaper agencies and news shows across the world and it's likely to be big news for another week or so. Both Lightning Max and Stinger stare at their newspapers in both frustration and jealousy. Frustration because there's nothing in the newspaper about the roles they played in fighting the Seafolk and jealousy over the C-Class hero. Mumin Rider for being taken in as a student to the world's strongest hero, Deku. After spending nearly a whole minute glaring at the newspapers, both heroes let out loud sighs and drops their newspapers. While unhappy, there's no point of them losing their cool since it wouldn't change anything. 
However, the two heroes soon lose their cool over something else. Why the sour pusses, kittens? To the horror of Lightning Max and Stinger, the curtain surrounding their beds is pulled aside, showing the smiling face of Puri Puri prisoner who is dressed in another prison jumpsuit. The S-Class hero has wrappings around his head and a bandage over the bridge of his nose, showing that he's still recovering from his bout with the Deep Sea King, although he has recovered from most of his injuries already, boasting an impressive healing factor. It doesn't show off those cute faces said Puri Puri prisoner winking at both of the class of heroes. It's you, cried Stinger, pushing himself as far back on the bed as he can. The class of rank 11 hero knows all about Puri Puri prisoner's reputation and knows he has a right to be afraid. No way, I thought you were supposed to be in prison, exclaimed a shaky lightning Max who remembers hearing about Puri Puri prisoner being sent back to Smelly Lid prison to recover in their infirmary. Puri Puri prisoner lifts a leg through the gap in the curtain, showing the ball and chain that's wrapped around his ankle. I escaped. Just to see you too he admitted in a flirty tone before brandishing a syringe that's filled with an unknown liquid. Now, time for your angle shots. Even though they're still recovering, Lightning Max and Stinger find the strength to jump out of their beds and run out of the room, fleeing Piri Piri prisoner and his so-called angel shots. Come back, you guys. You need your injections, shouted Piri Piri prisoner who moves to chase after them. But the newspaper falls off Lightning Max's bed and lands on the S-class hero's foot, distracting him. Puri Puri Prisoner looks down at the newspaper which is open on a page that has an article about himself. Puri Puri Prisoner looks at the headline of the article and frowns while clenching his fists. For a moment, Puri Puri Prisoner is left alone in the hospital room to stew over his thoughts. Kahaha, I just saw Stinger and Lightning Max run down a hallway as if they were being chased by a god-level monster. I take it that was your doing. Puri Puri Prisoner laughed Izuku, walking around the corner after dodging Lightning Max and Stinger who ran away in fear. Izuku stops when he notices his fellow Class S hero glaring at a newspaper on the ground, not even noticing his arrival. Puri, you alright? Izuku asked, now a bit concerned. Puri Puri prisoner shakes out of his stupor, only now realizing that Deku is in the room with him. Oh, sorry about that. Was lost in my own thoughts. That's all. What are you doing here? Izuku answers, even if it's obvious that Puri Puri prisoner is just trying to change the subject. I came by to see and personally thank everyone who took part in fighting the Sifo. I'll have to give my thanks to Stinger and Lightning Max later whenever they come out of their hiding hole told Izuku who steps up to Puri Puri prisoner before he looks down at the newspaper on the floor. Almost immediately, Izuku sees the article which shows an image of Puri Puri prisoner, and he frowns when he reads the title of the article, A Class S Failure. Izuku doesn't need to read the rest of the article to know that it's all about how Puri Puri prisoner lost to the Deep Sea King. It's obvious by the insulting title that the article is nothing but defamation towards Puri Puri Prisoner. And by the quotation marks around the words, Class S, the publisher is also questioning Puri Puri Prisoner's rank as a Class S hero. Puri, don't worry about it. It's not like some slander will bring me down remarked Puri Puri Prisoner in his usual flamboyant and playful tone. But Izuku can tell that it's forced. Izuku places a hand on Puri Puri Prisoner's shoulder to offer some comfort. Don't take what the media says too seriously, Puri. They get paid to slander heroes every day. You aren't the first hero it happens to and I can promise that you won't be the last. Puri Puri Prisoner's flamboyant and playful personality fades, leaving a man whose pride as a hero is hurt. But they're not wrong, are they? I didn't stand a chance against the Deep Sea King he stated with a frown, recalling his fight with the Sea Folk. Then you learn what you did wrong and get better. In my professional opinion, I believe that you could have defeated the Deep Sea King if you had gone all out. Puri Puri prisoner looks into Deku's eyes, looking confused, but also a little angry. I did go all out and I still lost. My angel rush didn't so much as leave a scratch on that monster. Izuku decides to just rip off the band-aid. No offense, Puri, but I notice that when you do fight, you never fight with the intent to kill your opponent. Either you realize it or not, by not fighting with the intent to kill your opponent you are unconsciously holding yourself back told Deku, getting a bitter chuckle from Puri Puri Prisoner. It's funny, the Deep Sea King told me the exact same thing said Puri Puri Prisoner who lifts up his clenched fist to look at it. Thanks for telling me, though. It's something for me to think about. With a smile and a thankful nod, Puri Puri Prisoner leaves so he can be alone to think over what he just learned. Izuku watches Puri Puri Prisoner leave and he can't help but feel a little worried for him. Unlike most of the other S-class heroes, Puri Puri Prisoner wears his emotions on his sleeves. For some, that can be a good thing, but it also means that he has a thin skin when it comes to insults, especially from the media. He just hopes that Puri Puri Prisoner can learn from his fight with the Deep Sea King and maybe start to fight with the intent to kill. Since he already offered his thanks to Snack, Jet Nice Guy and Bun Bun Man, Izuku moves on to the hospital room which is currently occupied by the C-class hero, 
All back man. Since the door is already open, Izuku enters, but not without knocking on the door to announce his presence. Good day, all back man. I hope I'm not intruding. The reason he asks is because there's a young woman sitting beside all back man's bed while the bandaged class C hero stares out the window. All back man's iconic jacket is lying over the back of the chair that's occupied by the woman. All back man turns away from the window and stares at Deku in surprise for obvious reasons. It's not every day that the number one hero visits you in the hospital. All back man is a young man with light blonde hair that's brushed backwards and his sideburns along with a defined jawline. Deku said the woman who's just as equally surprised as all back man. By the lack of facial similarities with all back man, Izuku guesses that she must be his girlfriend or wife. What are you doing here? I've come to give my thanks to each and every hero who played a part in defeating the seafolk answered Izuku with a grin. Then don't bother. I didn't do squat to stop them said all back man, turning back to the window so his girlfriend and the world's strongest man can't see the tears threatening to leave his eyes. An awkward silence passes by for a moment before Izuku turns to the young woman in the room. Miss, could you please give us a moment to speak alone? While curious about what Deku might have to say to her boyfriend, the woman offers a slow nod and after sending a concerned look to all back man, she leaves the room. Once alone, Deku walks over to the front of all back man's bed. Is there something troubling you, all back man? All back man turns to stare at Deku who's surprised to see the man on the verge of tears. Of course there's something troubling me. I couldn't do shit against that monster. Hell, I was so scared that I pissed my pants. What kind of hero pisses their pants? Exclaimed all back man in shame, recalling how useless he was against the deep sea king. That's why I'm going to quit being a hero. It's obviously not right for me. If every hero just gave up because they lost a fight, there wouldn't be a single hero left in the world remarked Deku with a smile. Don't let a single loss put you down. You get stronger every time you learn from your mistakes. I only just told that to Puri Puri Prisoner a few minutes ago. That's easy to say for you and Puri Puri Prisoner. You guys are S-class and you've never lost a fight all back man answered in a bitter tone. What, you think I was always this strong? Asked Deku, waving a hand in front of his muscular frame. Tell me, have you ever wondered why my hero name is Deku? What a stupid question. Of course he has wondered why and so has most of the people on the planet. Other S-class heroes have cool badass names like Tornado of Terror, Silver Fang and Atomic Samurai. So why did Izuku Midoriya make his hero name something as simple and insulting as Deku? During interviews, many have asked him why he picked the name, Deku. But the green-haired hero always found a way to divert the question so he didn't have to answer. Ever since I was a child, I always wanted to be a hero. To save lives and do so with a smile on my face, just like someone I used to look up to. Unfortunately, nobody believed in my dreams, because I wasn't born with a special gift like everyone else. Children being cruel then gave me the nickname, Deku, as in, good for nothing. For a while, I believed that I really was good for nothing. Deku's smile which dipped the more he went through memory lane suddenly widens. But then I met someone who told me that Deku didn't have to mean, good for nothing. Deku could instead mean, to be capable of. That person helped me believe that anyone can be a hero. It's honestly been a while since Izuku thought of his old classmates, especially Achako Yuraka who was the one who encouraged him like no other. I bet she became an incredible hero he thought with a smile. All back man widens his eyes while coming to grips with everything Deku just told him. The thought that anyone would think Deku couldn't become a hero, even as a child, just seems crazy to him. But everything Deku told him about the origins of his hero name is both incredible and inspiring. To think that the world's strongest man was once called Deku as an insult. But now, he made it where everyone wants to be just like Deku, name and all. Izuku Midoriya wears the name, Deku, as a badge of honor and the revelation fills all back man with the energy to try and make his own hero name iconic. To no longer be some unknown C-class hero, but to actually be noteworthy. Izuku doesn't need to ask if all back man is gonna stay as a hero or not. The fire that he can see burning in the blonde man's eyes shows that there's no way all back man is going to quit being a hero now. After asking all back man to think about his decision, Deku leaves the hospital room and smiles to himself, knowing that he saved another good hero from quitting. Any hero, C-class or not, who can confront the deep sea king to save the lives of thousands is a hero he doesn't want to see gone. Speaking of good heroes, there's a certain cyclist in the hospital who Deku still needs to meet to discuss their future training arrangement. City Z Bangs Dojo. Point 126, 127, 128 counted a sweaty Mumin rider performing push-ups in the middle of Bangs Dojo while shirtless. Since he isn't wearing his hero costume, it's revealed that he has short brown hair and wears oval-shaped glasses that obscures his eyes. I must admit, it's good to see a fresh new face training in my dojo chuckled Bang while he takes a sip of his tea. 
The martial arts master is sitting on his knees while watching the newest student of Deku perform his daily exercises. If you want, I could always. Not a chance. You've got your own students so don't you try stealing one of mine interrupted Izuku Midoriya who is sitting on the floor beside Bang with his legs folded. Genos is sitting on the other side of Izuku while leaning back and watching his fellow student, Mumin Rider, perform his push-ups. Perhaps a trade. Izuku deadpans at Bang and casts a glance at Bang's longest remaining student, Chiranko. Chiranko is a young man in his early 20s who has messy light-colored hair and wears a white karate gi. Said student is currently sitting on his knees a distance away, dozing off and trying to make it look like he isn't. I don't think so. Bang grumbles, but accepts it. Ever since the incident, Bang had lost most of his students with only Chiranko deciding to stay. Thankfully, teaching martial arts to the students in Hero Academy has led to several joining his dojo for further training. Although at the moment, most are currently working on their homework assignments, hence why they aren't training in the dojo right now. Probably for the better anyway, since he doubts that the students would get much training done while Deku and Genos are present. By the way, I've been meaning to ask you something, Midoriya said Bang, placing his cup of tea on the floor. Word around the grapevine says that you recently asked Child Emperor to build you something quite big and expensive. Izuku shakes his head and points at his newest student who's nearing his push-up quota, although he appears to be struggling. Not for me, for my newest student over there. Bang nods his head in understanding. Ah, oh, I see. You appear to be putting in a lot of effort on training Mumin Rider. I'm curious, what is it about that man that has caught your interest? He asked, although he has an idea. Gently, Izuku smiles over at Mumin Rider and for a moment. He instead sees himself from 10 years ago struggling to do the push-ups. I see a hero who can look into the face of evil itself and not flinch, powerful or not. Mumin Rider will stand up to any threat so he can protect the lives of the innocent, even at the risk of his own life. He has the heart and soul of a true hero and I plan to nurture that. Bang smiles as well, having thought that to be the reason. Genos is much the same, but the cyborg has the strength and firepower to match his heroic status. Newman Rider is just a C-class hero who's more known for helping civilians with simple tasks that other heroes would often ignore, like saving cats from trees. However, those simple but kind acts has kept Newman Rider as the top-ranked class C hero for nearly eight months now, which is actually pretty impressive. I'll admit, there's another reason I decided to take him on as my student said Izuku, being honest with Bang. Though, Dutel asked Bang, more than a little curious. He didn't think there was another reason for Midoriya taking on Muman Rider as his disciple. Genos who has mostly been watching Muman Rider perform his exercises perks up, looking just as curious as Bang. I believe Muman Rider possesses indomitable will. Bang's eyes widen in surprise and for good reason. Are you certain? Izuku nods while watching Muman Rider fight through the pain from his push-ups. You should have saw his fight with the Deep Sea King. True, the monster was only playing with him, but even a lazy blow from the king of the sea folk would have knocked out or killed most C-class and even some B-class heroes. Yet, Mumin Rider just kept getting back up. Bang turns to Mumin Rider and this time, focuses his complete attention on the C-class hero. Just watching him perform push-ups has Bang realized that Izuku is telling the truth. Mumin Rider is sweating very heavily and is obviously in a lot of pain, but he is still continuing his push-ups, refusing to give up. If that's not a sign of him having indomitable will, then nothing will. It also explains why Midoriya has been training Mumin Rider so hard for the past two weeks. My word, you're right, Sensei. What is this indomitable will you speak of? Asked Genos, having been listening in on the discussion between the two S-class heroes, but not understanding the importance of this indomitable will that Mumin Rider supposedly possesses. Indomitable will is a unique ability that only a few in the world possess. It's when someone has an unnaturally strong willpower that enables them to endure great physical pain and psychological trauma, allowing them to fight for longer than they should be capable of. For some, it even allows them to remove their limiter, making them even stronger than before. However, the limit to how much a person can take depends on the strength of the user. The stronger the user, the stronger they become through their indomitable will and the longer they can fight explained Izuku to his first student. Indomitable will can be a truly terrifying ability when in the right hands. Metal Bat is another user of indomitable will and I can say from experience that he is a very dangerous individual because of its stated bang, remembering the time he had sparred with Metal Bat just a year ago. In their spar, Bang never once got hit by Metal Bat who he had pummeled to the ground several times. However, every time he did, Metal Bat always got back up to his feet to continue the spar, no matter how bloody and bruised his body got. In the end, Bang's decades of fighting experience and martial arts mastery led to him defeating Metal Bat. Genos looks dumbfounded by what he was just told and then turns to Muman Rider, amazed that the C-class hero possesses such a unique ability. He's also surprised to hear that the S-class rank 15 hero. 
Metal Bat has the same ability as well and by Silver Fang's words, it makes him very dangerous. I meant to ask this earlier. But have you told Tatsumaki about this new student of yours? Asked Bang and by the nervous expression on Midoriya's face, it's obvious that he hadn't. Tatsu was called upon by the Hero Association to deal with a mysterious being who is rumored to be a dragon-level threat. From what I've been told, the mysterious being has been slumbering in ice for millions of years and recent scans have shown signs of it waking up soon. The association decided to keep Tatsu on standby just in case the mysterious being becomes violent once it awakens. Hence, why she hasn't been around for nearly a month explained Izuku who isn't looking forward to when Tatsumaki returns. It's not that he doesn't enjoy her company, but she has always thought highly of him like she does herself. In her mind, she has them both standing on pedestals that look down on the other heroes, class S heroes included. When she found out that Genos became his student, she wasn't happy and still isn't, even though Genos is now a S-class hero. As class or not, Tatsumaki doesn't believe Genos is worthy to be trained by Izuku, although he suspects that nobody will ever be worthy in her eyes. However, he can't imagine how she'll react when she finds out he took on Mumin Rider as a student. Like most S-class heroes, she's very proud of her rank and she often looks down on heroes below her, including fellow S-class heroes. Izuku has tried many times to dull that powerful pride of hers, but that's a fight not even he can win. When she does return, he will need to keep Mumin Rider close, just in case. He doesn't think she'd actually kill the C-class hero, but he wouldn't put it past her to try and hurt him. Point 198, 199, 200. Grunted Mumin Rider, completing his 200 push-ups before collapsing onto the floor, finding the cold wooden floor to be comfortable against his sweaty chest. Not once in his life did Mumin Rider think he would be given the honor to train under a high-ranking hero, let alone the S-class rank 1 hero. After all, he is only class C, but it isn't like he's complaining. In these past two weeks, Mumin Rider has learned more about heroics and fighting than he did in all his life. All the fighting knowledge he knew before all came from watching videos online and martial arts movies, but training under Deku has shown him what true fighting really is like. The first week of training made the entirety of Mumin Rider's body ache in pain. Now they're on the second week of training and his bones are crying out to him. Good man, now that your muscles are all warmed up. We can start your martial arts training said Izuku, pushing himself up to his feet. My muscles aren't warmed up. They're on fire, thought the sweaty Mumin Rider who somehow manages to push himself up to his feet. While grateful for the training, Mumin Rider doesn't much like martial arts training, because it usually starts off with him sparring against Deku, which obviously leads to him getting his ass beaten before Deku explains what he did wrong. Perhaps Mumin Rider would learn more by watching a spar as a spectator. What do you say, Midoriya, willing to spar with this old man? Recommended Bang who pushes himself to his feet before he walks over to Izuku with a slight hunch in his back. By Bang's appearance alone, most people would be horrified over the prospect of someone starting a fight with the elderly man. Being over 80 years old, Bang has spiky white hair, thick white eyebrows and a thick mustache. For clothing, Bang adorns a long-sleeved black martial arts jumpsuit, light-colored pants and tai chi slippers. By the looks of him, Bang should be in a nursing home, not leading a dojo. However, Izuku knows more than anyone that appearances can be deceiving. True, Bang is an elderly old man, but he is also known as the greatest treasure of martial arts. Izuku considers himself to be a master of his own fighting style, the Deku style. But in comparison to Bang's own mastery of the water stream rock smashing fist style, Izuku is nothing but an amateur. Ten years of creating a fighting style of his own means nothing to Bang's lifetime of martial arts training. If not for Izuku having mastered one for all, he honestly wouldn't stand a chance against Bang in a close combat fight. That sounds like a wonderful idea. Human Rider, I want you to pay close attention. You as well. Genos told Izuku who begins to stretch his arms and legs. He isn't gonna fight Silver Fang without loosening up his muscles as that could nearly prove fatal. Bang follows Izuku's example and begins stretching, although he winces when he stretches his left shoulder. Shoulder feels stiff. Guess I'm getting rusty thought Bang, but ignores it for now. You ready? He asked, going into his water stream rock smashing style stance. As Bang moves his hands into position, a dangerous blue aura shrouds them. Izuku answers by activating full cowl at 40% power as emerald lightning arcs across his muscular body while an ethereal shroud of green energy covers him from head to toe. Izuku's messy hair slightly spikes up as emerald lightning bounces off each strand and his green eyes glow with power. Ready as I'll ever be he answered bringing his right foot behind him and keeping his clenched left fist in front of him while his right fist hangs by his hip, ready to be used for a punch whenever possible. Newman Rider nervously gulps as he watches Deku and Silver Fang square up against each other. 
The tension is getting so thick that it's starting to get hard to breathe in here he thought. But the C-class hero refuses to take his eyes off the two S-class heroes, even when he hears the obvious sound of Cherenko collapsing to the floor in unconsciousness. Obviously, the intense energy between Deku and Silver Fang was too much for Cherenko to handle. Beside Muman Rider, Genos watches with his arms folded and a serious expression on his face, although even he is starting to feel weary. Even though I'm not the one fighting, I can feel the tension in the air. It's nearly suffocating. So, this is what it's like for two top S-class heroes to spar against each other, thought Genos who makes sure to record every little detail. The winner will be determined by the first move. For nearly a minute, neither Deku or Silverfang make any moves against one another, studying the other for the slightest twitch. Then all of a sudden, both Deku and Silverfang move at the exact same time, surprising the viewers by their sudden movement and matching speed. Both S-class heroes throw an attack at the other in blinding speeds and Genos widens his eyes when he realizes that their attacks are moving so fast that he can barely follow them. Mr. Silverfang Silverfang's fist stops just before it can hit his opponent's face while Deku stops his roundhouse kick just before it can connect to Bang's temple. The sudden stop of both attacks causes a burst of wind to blow across the dojo, causing Muman Rider to struggle to remain standing while Gino stands unaffected by the winds, pulling back their respective limbs. Both Izuku and Bang turn towards the entrance of the dojo where there is a very sweaty man in a black suit, looking like he's about to pass out at any second. Obviously, the man had been in a rush to run up the mountain to reach Bang's dojo which sits at the very top. I was sent by the association panted the man. An emergency summons has been issued to all Class S heroes. Please come to association headquarters now. The hero association employee only then notices that Silver Fang isn't the only S class hero in the dojo. You're out here as well, Mr. Genos and is that Mr. Deku too? What perfect timing. Has a threat reached to level Dragon? Asked Genos, seriously. At the moment, only the higher-ups of the association know the reason for the summons answered the man. Please come along now. We must hurry. Here we go side Bang who walks towards the door. Izuku frowns in worry. A summons for all S-class heroes. Did the association discover a threat so great that they needed all of Class S to come? He wondered, hoping that to not be the case. But then again, he can't think of any other reason as to why they would request a summons for the strongest heroes in the world. Either there's an extremely powerful dragon-level threat which requires the combined might of S-class to deal with it or there's something even worse than a dragon-level threat. God-level. For once in his life, Izuku wishes that the threat is dragon-level. City A Hero Association Headquarters After a long drive from City Z to City A, the heroes enter the Hero Association Headquarters and the association employee who brought them informs them that most of the Class S heroes have already arrived. Newman Ryder gulps as he walks alongside Genos, Silver Fang and Deku down a hallway towards the meeting room. Obviously, the Class C hero didn't need to be here, seeing as the meeting is only for Class S heroes, but Deku was insistent that he come with them to the meeting as a learning experience. A group of four stop before a large metal door which slides open to reveal another hallway while also showing another S-Class hero who had just arrived before them. Ah, hey there, Silver Fang greeted the S-Class rank 4 hero, Atomic Samurai. Atomic Samurai is a middle-aged man with long black hair tied in a ponytail, dark eyes, small goatee and a defined jawline. His attire consists of a hooded red cloak with an atom symbol on the back draped over his open black haori. Beneath his haori is a traditional loose-fitting white robe tied with a white sash and two haori. Strapped to his left side are Atomic Samurai's katana and wakizashi while in his mouth is a blade of grass. Atomic Samurai, it's been too long Silver Fang greeted back with a smile. I figured you'd be here today said Atomic Samurai before looking up at the towering mass of muscle that is Deku. And I didn't doubt for a second you'd miss this exciting little meeting, Deku. Hero Association calls a summons for all Class S heroes. How could I possibly resist? Chuckled Deku, making Atomic Samurai laugh in response. Very true chuckled Atomic Samurai who then turns to Genos who has been quietly studying him. And this must be the cyborg. Genos he said, looking the newest member of Class S up and down, inwardly nodding in approval. He then turns to the other hero among the group, and, wait a minute, who are you? You look familiar he said, looking over Muman Rider. This is my newest student. Muman Rider answered Deku while patting a hand on Muman Rider's shoulder, making sure to hold back his strength so to not injure him. Muman Rider winces, showing that Izuku still needs to hold back more of his strength. Ah, so this is the guy who has been causing such a ruckus? Huh, remarked Atomic Samurai, having heard about the C-class hero who was handpicked by Deku himself to become his disciple. Gotta admit, I'm not seeing what all the fuss is about he admitted, looking Muman Rider up and down. Don't you worry about that. Soon enough, Muman Rider here will be up to challenging your own students smiled Deku and while his smile comes off as playful, a competitive spark erupts between him and Atomic Samurai. 
Is that right? Well then, I'll be looking forward to the day that happens answered Atomic Samurai, glaring up at Deku who stares back with a smile. At the same time, Mumin Rider is heavily sweating from being in such close proximity of a glaring contest between two S-class heroes who are known for defeating dragon-level monsters by themselves. What's this I hear about Deku taking on some class C nobody as a student? Gailed a feminine voice from down the hallway. I see Tatsumaki has returned. I should probably head for the meeting room. Don't want to keep everyone waiting. Acting as if he isn't fleeing from the irate spur. And leaving Deku to his faith, Bang walks down the hallway while dragging a reluctant Genos with him. Atomic Samurai follows after them while waving at Deku with a grin on his face. It was nice knowing you he exclaimed, just as a green blur flies overhead and heads towards Deku. Instinctively, Deku jumps in front of Mumin Rider who becomes paralyzed over the sight of an angry tornado of terror charging at him with violent intent. However, Deku acts as a wall of solid muscle to protect him and thankfully, it does manage to stop the world's most powerful Asper. Tatsumaki stops just in front of Deku and glares at him, floating at eye level so she can look at him from equal height and not have to do it while looking up. Move it or lose it. She commanded, covered in a green glow, due to her psychic powers. Hey, Tatsu, I take it that the assignment went well, asked Izuku, acting coy, although he is also covered in a green glow which is a result of him activating full cowl, just in case. Don't you try to change the subject. I leave for a few weeks and you take in some weeks stray off the side of the road. What are you even thinking? exclaimed Tatsumaki, throwing her arms over her head to emphasize how much she disagrees with his decision. Don't be like that, Tatsu. Mumin Rider has potential to be great. Here, let me introduce you to him said Deku, grabbing Mumin Rider from behind him and shoving him in Tatsumaki's face. Tatsu, meet Mumin Rider. Mumin Rider, this lovely lady is Tatsu introduced Deku with cheer. Pretending that Tatsumaki isn't on the verge of tearing apart the Hero Association headquarters in her rage, while being held up in the air by Deku's powerful hands is a bit uncomfortable. That's nothing compared to having the world's strongest woman glaring down at him like as if he's a bug that she found in her food. Honestly, if not for Deku being here, he might actually think that she might try to hurt him. Call me Tatsu and you die. Yup, she definitely does not like him. Now that everyone's best friends, we should head to the meeting. Everyone must be waiting for us said Deku, suddenly placing Mumin Rider on the floor before he guides him around Tatsumaki. Hey, don't you think you can get away that easily? And why is the Class C weakling coming to the meeting anyway? Don't you ignore me. Chuckling awkwardly, Deku leads Mumin Rider to a door which slides open, revealing the meeting room which consists of a large holographic table that acts as the only source of light to the dark room. Situated around the holographic table are 17 chairs, although 14 are currently occupied. Ah, so he lives to fight another day. A shame smirked Atomic Samurai, chuckling as Izuku points a warning finger at him. Oh, did you come back from fighting a powerful monster, number one? Asked Super Alloy Darkshine who has his powerful arms folded across his muscular chest. I guess you could say that deadpan bang. Chuckling in amusement as Tatsumaki flies into the room with a grumpy expression on her face, the Asper flies over and takes a seat on her chair beside Bang. Newman Rider who has been sticking to Deku's side is quick to notice a good few of the S-class heroes suddenly sitting up straight once in the presence of the world's strongest man. The class S heroes really do respect Deku. Looking around the room, Izuku sees that practically every S-class hero has arrived, all except for Metal Knight which isn't much of a surprise to Deku. Metal Knight tends to keep to himself and a summons from the Hero Association wouldn't change that. At best, he would send one of his robots to attend the meeting while he watches through its camera. At worst, he doesn't show up at all and Izuku guesses that to be the most likely, other than the missing Metal Knight. Every other S-class hero are sitting in seats which are assigned to them by rank. Thus, Genos is sitting in between Puri Puri Prisoner and Metal Bat while Bang is in between Atomic Samurai and Tatsumaki. While everyone else's chairs are on either sides of the length of the table, Izuku's chair is the only one situated at one of the short ends of the table, situated in between Puri Puri Prisoner and Tatsumaki. Izuku walks over to the edge of the table and drags Metal Knight's empty chair with him when he passes by it. Once at his own chair, he places Metal Knight's chair beside his own and signals Mumina Rider to sit on it while he sits on his own. Many curious eyes look over at Mumin Rider, but no one says anything about the C-class hero being at attendance to a S-class meeting. Although Tatsumaki who has her arms folded turns away from him in a huff, Mumin Rider takes the seat beside Izuku, which has him nearly rubbing shoulders with Puri Puri Prisoner who winks at him. It's a good thing he did sit down, because Mumin Rider fears that he might start to hyperventilate if he doesn't calm down. I'm in a room with nearly every S-class hero in the Hero Association, the strongest individuals in the entire world. He thought in both fear and excitement as he looks over each hero, starting with the lowest ranked, as class rank 17, Puri Puri Prisoner. 
Puri Puri prisoner is resting his chin on the back of his hands while glancing over at Genos who's sitting on the other side of him. Maybe this will be my chance to get closer to Genos. S class rank 16, Genos. Genos is calmly studying the faces of every class S hero in the room, similar to what Muman Rider is doing. It must be serious. Almost all of class S is here. S class rank 15, Metal Bat. Demon or dragon, whatever. Bring it on said a confident Metal Bat who has his legs kicked up on the table. Metal Bat is a young man with black hair that's styled in a pompadour and his dark eyes that show off his hot temper. He adorns black button pants and a black school uniform which he usually drapes over his red long-sleeved turtleneck sweater, but at the moment, he has it hanging on the back of his chair. In his left hand is his iconic indestructible metal bat in which he gets his hero name from. As class rank 14, Tank Top Master, the leader of the Tank Topper army glances over at Deku. I need to remember to thank Deku for putting Tiger's head on straight. Tank Top Master is a tall and very muscular man with short dark blonde hair and brown eyes. He wears a black tank top. Long pants and a belt around his waist with his initials and a tank top engraved on the buckle. As class rank 13, Flashy Flash. Flashy Flash stares ahead and quietly waits for the meeting to start. Flashy Flash is a lean, but muscular young man who has an androgynous appearance. He has sharp blue eyes and long ice blonde hair with bangs brushed to the right side of his face. He is wearing a dark blue bodysuit with metallic bracers over his arms and upper chest armor with a long white cape over it. He adorns himself with two eight-pointed stars on either side of his head and on his cape. He also has a chain strapped around his waist which holds his sheathed sword in place. S class rank 12, Watchdog Man. With a blank expression on his face, Watchdog Man sniffs the air. Pretty sure someone farted. S class rank 11, Super Alloy Darkshine. On the other side of Watchdog Man is Super Alloy Darkshine who is a very tall and extremely muscular man. His skin has a dark complexion and gives off a lustrous shine. He's bald and has full lips, dark eyes and thick eyebrows. He also happens to be the most nude of everyone as his attire is only a black speedo. They're all checking out my guns. Boom. Hell yeah. He thought, believing that everyone is checking out his large muscles. S class rank 10. Pig God. Pig God is a large obese man with short black hair and big lips. He is wearing a long-sleeved green shirt, blue jeans and white sneakers. As everyone else quietly waits for the meeting to start, Pig God is loudly eating the burgers he brought with him in a large bag. As class rank 9, Drive Knight. Drive Knight is a cyborg who has long black hair and wears a white mask which has a long horizontal slit so his single red shining eye can see out of it. The mask also has three vertical slits for where his mouth should be. Drive Knight's attire consists of a simplistic-looking suit of armor that is similar to a medieval knight's armor. The cyborg's red eye looks left and right to gauge the faces of everyone else. As class rank 8, Zombaman. Zombaman has scruffy short black hair, red eyes and pale skin. He wears a worn-out gray trench coat and over a black singlet, tan-stitched pants and a thick brown belt. He has belts wrapped around himself under his coat and wears tanker boots. No one looks particularly enthusiastic. And does that pig ever stop eating? He thought, glaring at Pig God in annoyance, because of his loud chewing. S class rank 7, King. King has a serious expression on his face and has his arms folded. Newman Rider can hear what sounds like a heartbeat coming from the man who's said to be a rival to Deku himself. Newman Rider recalls that the noise comes from the King engine and that people can only hear it if he's ready for battle or is generally serious. S class rank 6, Metal Knight. Metal Knight is the only S-Class hero who hasn't shown up to the meeting yet. But Muman Rider has heard that the man is a brilliant scientist who makes all sorts of deadly robots and powerful explosives which he uses to completely eradicate mysterious beings. S-Class Rank 5, Child Emperor Child Emperor definitely stands out amongst all the other Class S heroes, particularly because he is the youngest hero at only 10 years old. Child Emperor is a pre-adolescent boy who has short brown hair that has a cowlick and large amber eyes. He is wearing a light blue polo shirt with dark cobalt shorts and orange sneakers with white rims. Additionally, he wears a black backpack that holds all of his gadgets. At the moment, he is licking on a pink lollipop. I should probably talk to Rank 1 about the thing he asked me to make for him. As Class Rank 4, Atomic Samurai. I still don't get it. What's so special about that Class C hero that intrigues Deku so much? He thought, discreetly looking at Muman Rider who doesn't notice. As Class Rank 3, Silver Fang. So, why have we all been gathered here? Asked Bang, deciding to be the one to ask, since nobody seems willing to do so. As class rank 2, Tornado of Terror. Who really cares anyway? I had to drop everything I was doing and was then kept waiting for over two hours said Tatsumaki, both annoyed at that and with her conversation with Deku earlier. As class rank 1, Deku. The association wouldn't just call all of us here for no reason. Something big must be happening if they need all of us stated Deku. 
getting nods of understanding from some of the heroes. Luckily, the doors to the meeting room open and the Minister Officer of Justice, Sitch, enters with bespectacled worker to his right and bearded worker to his left. My apologies. I was delayed apologize Sitch who stands on the other short end of the holographic table, opposite to Deku who sits on the other side. We do not know the whereabouts of Metal Knight, nor can we reach him at this time. No sense in waiting any longer. So let's begin this emergency meeting said Sitch, making sure he has the full attention of every hero in the room. Okay sadly the chapter is over. And if you enjoyed the video just leave a like and subscribe with post notification. So when the next chapter is ready, you will be notified. Okay see you in the next video. Bye.